our pleasure to welcome you to the Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024, an initiative brought to you by Zetwork and CNBC TV 18. Please put your hands together for your host, Swati Shahi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the second day of the Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024, a mega summit committed to recognizing the manufacturing excellence in India's innovation landscape. To recap day one, we had panels throughout the day featuring stalwarts and rising stars of India Inc. about technologies of the future, disruptions that spell success, and green practices for sustainable growth. Today, we are delving into more discussions with industry leaders to dive deeper into the transformative journey towards manufacturing excellence and the determination to overcome challenges for a brighter future. So get ready for another exciting day ahead. And well, what better way to begin the second day with a fireside chat on 10 years of Make in India with Rajesh K. Singh, Secretary, DPIIT, moderated by Shireen Bhan, Managing Editor, CNBC TV 18. Let's please welcome them with a huge round of applause. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you once again for joining us here for day two of the Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024 in association with CNBC TV 18. Uh, those of you who were with us yesterday and, of course, were watching the proceedings of the Manufacturing Summit live on television and online, uh, you've got clarity in terms of where things currently stand. Uh, from a Make in India perspective, it's very, very clear uh, that uh, uh, there is confidence about the fact that this could perhaps be the inflection point as far as India's manufacturing ambition and manufacturing uh, prowess is concerned. Uh, there is momentum that needs to be built on. There are, of course, impediments still in the way that need to be addressed. And who better uh, to understand what the road ahead looks like as far as uh, policy interventions and policy initiatives to truly ensure that we do make in India for India and make in India for the world than the DPI. The Secretary, Mr. Singh, always a pleasure. Many thanks Thanks for joining us here uh, on CNBC TV 18. Let me start by asking you for your own assessment of the performance of the Make in India program over the past 10 years. How would you rate it? So uh, you will recall that when we launched it in 2014, uh, the focus was really on a campaign to, uh, you know, a kind of vocal for local Make in India uh, to create an enabling, facilitative environment for business. So there were initiatives like the ease of doing business rankings for states. There were, uh, you know, the, there was a, a huge focus on logistics, on improving our physical infrastructure. Over time, it also spilled over into our digital infrastructure. We also tried to further liberalize our FDI policy, and that process continues with the recent uh, cabinet announcement on liberalization of the FDI policy for space uh, sector, which also DPIIT piloted. So those were the sort of enabling factors. And thereafter, you could say that uh, the government further walked the talk when it came to Make in India by launching the uh, missions like the production-linked incentive scheme for 14 sectors of the economy and a separate uh, semicon mission for uh, the semiconductor side. All of these are meant to ensure that our uh, fairly abysmal, uh, uh, you know, contribution of our manufacturing sector to the GVA of the economy, mm. which in the recent interim budgets uh, economic review is shown at about 17.4 percent. That's not very far from the contribution of agriculture. We d that's how we can really bump it up. But the good news is that there is some sustained growth happening in this sector, particularly in the last few years, and we hope to take it further. Well, speaking about taking it further, let me unpack some of those issues that you uh, raised, and let's talk about the PLI schemes. 14 PLI schemes that have been rolled out, of course, at different stages through the COVID period specifically. Uh, you know, which are the schemes that you believe have delivered on the promise and the potential? Which are the schemes that you believe more work needs to be done? In our last conversation, you also said that there were two or three schemes that would require some tweaks. If you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Okay, so uh, let me start by saying that uh, the scheme uh, so far has uh, 
got subscriptions for, from about 746 uh, industrial applicants across these 14 sectors. Uh, it has led to commitments and on the investment side of about one, uh, no, sorry, about three lakh crores. It has led to exports of one lakh crores. It has led to uh, sales of about 8.7 lakh crores. And so far we've disbursed uh, at the last count about 5,000 crores as incentive. Uh, in terms of which, se which sectors have uh, done the, you know, the most well, I would say uh, electronics and mobile manufacturing, uh, food processing, white goods, pharma, including bulk drugs and mm -hmm. medical devices. Uh, all of these sectors have, uh, even though some of them are in the gestation period, but the investment commitments and the projections on things like employment, etc., are as per what was committed when these, uh, these were taken to, uh, you know, before the uh, government for approval. A few sectors like textiles, steel, uh, are uh, where there is some uh, need for perhaps greater flexibility in terms of product lines, etc., which we are working on. But these, I would say, are slightly lagging behind the original targets. But with the increased flexibility that we intend to bring into these schemes, in the, which are now pending approval, we hope these will also start taking off. Okay, so, uh, you know, two sectors identified uh, specifically steel as well as textiles where you believe that perhaps more needs to be done to give the PLI scheme a, a boost. But there are demands already coming in, uh, sir, saying that extend the PLI scheme further. Of course, it is a five-year period that the government has rolled out the PLI schemes for uh, according to their date of notification. Is that a legitimate ask at this point in time? Do you believe that uh, perhaps a longer window needs to be provided? So uh, where a longer window is required, that of course could be looked at. Uh, in terms of new PLIs, so, you know, uh, whenever we have um, discussions with industry, some segment or the other does, does ask for a new PLI. At the moment, I would say we are not looking at that. We are looking at improving the, uh, the implementation of the existing ones. And in the future, of course, uh, you know, no, nothing is off the table. But as of now, we are looking at completing these, uh, these uh, ongoing schemes uh, well. Okay, so could, could extend the time period as well as bring more sectors under PLI schemes? I would imagine that that is now going to be something post the elections, if at all. I would imagine so, yes. Uh, let, me, let me ask you about FDI because that's another important aspect that you brought up. And, of course, uh, the last few years through COVID, etc., we did see a uh, very sharp surge as far as FDI inflows are concerned. But in the last year, 2023, we've seen a decline. And I know that when we spoke previously, you, you said that you believe that this decline is temporary. Uh, what would you attribute the decline to? And are you now starting to see any visibility on a, a pickup and renewal? So it's good to look at FDI in terms of longer term trends rather than the yearly, you know, yearly ups and downs because sometimes one or two big deals can uh, you know, lead to an uh, upside which may be temporary. If you see uh, it as a percentage of our GDP, you'll find that uh, in 2014 we were at about 25 percent of the GDP. In the next five years it became about 35 Now it is close to 4 mm. There is a slight dip in the current year, which we feel is due to a combination of geopolitical factors, hardening of interest rates abroad, due to the sticky inflation uh, conditions in some of the uh, developed countries. So uh, there is a slight dip this year. The dip is far less uh, in India as compared to many of the other competing uh, destinations. But uh, from the government of India's point of view, the real issue is that in terms of overall FDI flows, we are eighth in the world. We should be going up. Uh, most of the seven on t you know, who are ahead of us are developed countries, but there are one or two de developing countries in that list. Our intention is to sort of really move up there because this is the time when the world is looking at India. Mm -hmm. By all accounts, we provide a fairly sort of uh, uh, clear case for investment uh, in terms of the, uh, both the po uh, policy stability and continuity as well as the uh, political stability and the macroeconomic numbers that... Uh, India has. So it's a compelling case for FDI, and we are very confident that the trend I mentioned yeah. of an increasing portion of our GDP being, uh, being coming, coming in as uh, FDI 
will uh, continue. You know, you talked about uh, being at number eight at this point in time in the aspiration, I would imagine, is to break into the top five at least. You also spoke about the fact that there is a dominance as far as the developed economies are concerned, but there are other developing economies that are part of that top ten list as well. Uh, if you were to do an assessment of what needs to be changed in order for us to be able to continue to draw in FDI versus, for instance, some of these other developing economies that we are competing against, uh, outside of logistics costs, which has, of course, been raised as one of the key concerns, one of the key challenges, what are the other things that can be fixed? What are the fixable items at this point in time that the government should address and is addressing? So, I mean, uh, the things like the ease of doing business is a sort of ongoing process. It never sort of, uh, you can uh, never say that it's done. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, in our country, the very fact that we have rankings across states and the fact that there are differential uh, sort of uh, FDI and concentrated in some of our southern and western states and not in others, that itself shows that the uh, business environment and climate uh, varies across states. So, first of all, we need to improve uh, this environment across the country, particularly in the eastern and the northeastern parts of uh, our country. Besides that, as I mentioned, uh, government needs to continue to focus on the things that it is already doing, mm -hmm. whether it is ease of doing business, whether it is further liberalizing our FDI policy, whether it is in terms of ensuring that uh, where compliances are, uh, are required by the regulators, that compliance is ensured through a facilitated compliance which means that if uh, somebody does end up with a violation of a regulation, we don't necessarily treat him as a, you know, as a, we don't necessarily have to start punishing him. Hmm. There could be a case where we flag it first, then we facilitate him in ensuring that the compliance is achieved. And I'm mentioning this particularly because we've just had a recent uh, uh, issue, and I'm going to mention this before you, you raise it, which is, uh, you know, in the fintech sector, yeah. for which uh, the Honorable Finance Minister sort of proactively took a meeting with the startups and the fint other fintechs in that space, where we tried to essentially tell them and reassure them that uh, in, a, in addition to uh, sort of ensuring that they get better sensitization of the regulation through a mechanism where the RBI will be meeting them mm. every month, but also in terms of, uh, as I said, a facilitated compliance where uh, you could flag uh, cases where there are minor sort of technical variations or uh, violations of uh, regulations, and we help them achieve those compliances rather than necessarily penalize them. Uh, you know, since you raised the issue of the Paytm Payments Bank uh, and uh, there was an outreach that was done by the Finance Ministry and, of course, you were part of that meeting as well with fintechs, I, I want to understand from you, you know, you said that uh, the effort on the part of the government or the regulator is not to penalize, but in this case specifically, the regulator said enough and more opportunities were given for compliance and the action was taken because there was perpetual non-compliance. Uh, uh, so what was the feedback that you got? I, I mean, is it, is it uh, because of the complexity of, of uh, the kind of rules that are in place that fintechs seem to find it challenging to comply, or is it a lack of understanding, or is it uh, uh, you know, a, a lack of appreciation of what the regulator expects in terms of good compliance? So, I mean, uh, when it comes to startups, of course, these are... Uh, people who uh, often move very fast, whose business has expanded suddenly, and sometimes the compliance uh, portion of it is uh, perhaps not taken as seriously in some cases. The specific case that you mentioned, I don't want to spend time on that so much because I really don't know the details of that particular mm -hmm. issue, but I understand that uh, they were given adequate opportunities. The, uh, the, gen the general sort of... Uh, uh, impression that we got from the fintech companies who attended that meeting was that they would like to understand the regulations better, which, of course, uh, we created a, me a mechanism for that purpose on the spot by the Honorable Finance Minister for a monthly meeting to, you know, update them and sensitize them about regulations. There were also uh, suggestions about, uh, you know, uh, technical violations not being penalized and, you know, helping them to achieve mm -hmm. compliance. That also, we decided that, for example, you have a sectoral cap or an FDI of 49%, and you go up and down because of, uh, you know, market trends or investments, investment trends. Yeah. There again, we could create, we've been asked to sort of work with RBI to create a mechanism where we flag those and 
help them achieve a, a, a kind of a facilitated compliance over time so as not to disrupt things further. So I think government is listening and we would like to sort of ensure that this very dynamic uh, startup ecosystem is not sort of uh, burdened either by too much of compliance or by a lack of knowledge about what the compliance burden is. And uh, th that particular meeting I thought went off very well in the sense that there was a tremendous sense of reassurance that uh, the, the FinTech community got as a result of that meeting. So if I may just ask you a last question on this. On the back of the conversations that happened, is, is there a feeling that perhaps regulation uh, is stifling innovation or there needs to be less regulation or less uh, sort of, uh, you know, complexity as far as compliance is concerned? The latter, I think. Uh, the, there could be always be some uh, areas of compliance which could be simplified or which could be digitized. And I remember there was one specific sort of case that came up in that meeting, which was about KYC compliances mm -hmm. and whether that should be digitized. And it was a little surprising, frankly, that it's not digitized for in the banking space, whereas uh, when we take a mobile connection, for example, we, we, do, we do go through some kind of a KYC process, which is largely digital. So yeah, I mean, that is, those are some of the areas where we could uh, simplify forms, we could digitize the processes, and of course, we could make people understand better what the regulations are. And I think uh, the sense of that meeting and the instructions given by the Honorable FM was that we should work on, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, combination of simplification and digitization in areas that perhaps have still uh, remained untouched uh, in some areas, but not in others. As a whole, I would say India has done a great job in digitization and creating a digital mm -hmm. in public infrastructure, which is really... Uh, where the first mover is actually the government and the private sector thereafter comes in and uses that uh, uh, infrastructure to uh, develop use cases and benefit from it. But there could be areas or segments where, uh, you know, that online servicing, digitization will still need to be done. Uh, let's talk about one of the, the new sectors that the government has decided to prioritize, and that is uh, developing the manufacturing of semiconductors in the country. Uh, DPIIT has been working with the IT uh, ministry to ensure that that takes off. Uh, we've uh, already got investments uh, uh, being cleared as far as uh, manufacturing is concerned, and the expectation is that more applications are likely to be cleared. In fact, there's the speculation that perhaps today uh, within the cabinet meeting we could see uh, more applications being cleared. On the semicon side, as we build out this ecosystem, and it will require an ecosystem approach, a network approach as well, uh, where do things currently stand? How satisfied are you with the progress? And give us an indication of what the road ahead looks like. So, uh, announcements will come when they will come. I, don't, I, cannot, I can't make that announcement because in any case, that's not uh, my domain. But I uh, would say that uh, in addition to uh, Micron, which has already come in, and, they, and there is still, uh, you know, an, un, uh, an unsubscribed element of incentive out of that 10 billion which is available, and we are expecting that more are coming in. Uh, DPIT, uh, along with uh, um, the Ministry of uh, Electronics and IT, did undertake a visit to Taiwan a couple of months back. Mm. We talked to most of the the top three uh, semiconductor manufacturers there. So there, is, uh, there are talks going on with the private sector, but these are uh, you know, business uh, uh, confidentiality issues where I would prefer that the announcements be made by the businesses themselves. But I would just say that we are very hopeful that more announcements are coming, and perhaps this full amount will not remain unsubscribed for very long. Well, uh, you know, we are, we are uh, eagerly awaiting those announcements as well, and I understand the sensitivity that you brought up, so I won't, I won't press you uh, any further on that. But let's talk about the sector that you said uh, you're most satisfied with in terms of how the PLI has worked out, and that is electronic mobile manufacturing, etc. cetera. Uh, many changes have been brought in to ensure that that happens, including the most recent one where the tariff was brought down. Uh, the announcement came in just ahead of the interim budget. But there are demands that perhaps a little bit more needs to be done to ensure that we don't lose out to the likes of Vietnam, etc. What's your own assessment on that front? What more do you believe needs to be done? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that uh, Vietnam has done uh, a little faster than us is it has tied up FTAs all around the world in a very pragmatic way. But uh, India is, not, is now trying to catch up. We are sort of negotiating FTAs with several countries. 
some are fairly advanced. So not just electronics, more broadly I would say that uh, Indian industry has to look at manufacturing for India and for the world, mm. focus on exports, and perhaps learn to live with a lower tariff regime rather than the very high uh, uh, tariff walls that we continue to have in some sectors of the economy. Over time, these will come down, and these perhaps will be good for industry because it will make them compete better and access the global markets better, including getting access to components at lower rates, as, as you mentioned, in electronics and in a few other sectors. Mm -hmm. DPIT has come across cases where the duty structures are inverted, where components are coming in at higher rates than the finished product is. It's not, it doesn't serve us, uh, it doesn't do us any good to have such structures. We've pointed some of them out to finance, and in some cases, those have been remedied. But over time, I would say that the trend is going to be towards lowering of tariff walls, through, uh, both through the uh, FTA process, and perhaps more generally to ensure that our uh, industry is able to sort of start competing and, act, and creating greater exports. Uh, from its manufacturing ecosystem. Uh, on exports, and uh, part of the Make in India campaign, of course, is the idea of making in India for the world, and we're seeing that play out across different sectors. Uh, I, I'll just bring up the example of a conversation that I had with the global CEO of IKEA just yesterday, and of course they are procuring and have been procuring from India as part of their export strategy for the world, but uh, they believe that perhaps that number could be significantly higher if, for instance, there was a harmonization as far as quality control issues are concerned. Uh, you know, a comment on that across different sectors on where you believe harmonization is the way forward so that we can truly encourage greater exports. Yeah, so uh, India has not been using quality control uh, norms much over the years. It's only in the last couple of years that we really started issuing quality control orders uh, across the board with the uh, conviction that our consumers deserve to be uh, provided quality products, whether by local manufacturers or from uh, imports. That process is a painful one for many businesses who are not used to uh, sort of uh, in going through a BIS inspection of ensuring that their processes and their products meet the quality control norms that are given. I think over time, uh, we have to ensure that we, uh, we become a quality conscious industry and society. We cannot uh, sort of continue to fob off uh, substandard goods on our consumers, including uh, from the point of view of consumer safety. So uh, all I will say is that uh, DPIT and government in general is going to increasingly use quality control uh, orders. The intention is also to prevent dumping of unsafe and substandard products from other countries uh, and including one of our largest competitors. That process has helped us in some areas like toys, for example, where the combination of uh, uh, QCOs and some tariffs actually led to a resurgence of the domestic industry. We will uh, probably be using quality control orders even more vigorously in the future. On the issue of uh, IKEA and the harmonization with global uh, standards, that is a genuine request, and we'll ensure that BIS looks at that to ensure that we are not creating standards which are out of line or out of sync with global standards. You know, you, you, you talked about our competitor uh, and our neighbor as well, as well as uh, the, the move that we are seeing towards de-risking supply chains globally in a post-COVID era and how geopolitics is also playing a part in that. Uh, there was a view uh, that, you know, we should, we should uh, keep all investments off the table from that particular jurisdiction. There has been a review of that uh, and a pragmatic review of that in order for us to actually facilitate making in India. Do you believe that perhaps a review, a further review is required on that front as well uh, so that we don't again end up losing out uh, to uh, other developing economies? Okay, so uh, there's never been a blanket ban on investment from uh, our land border countries. It includes the country that you mentioned. There's only been a case-to-case -case approval, uh, a scrutiny process involving our uh, various agencies to ensure that if they are, uh, if they're coming in, they, if they do come in, they come in in areas which are of interest to us, which actually help us uh, improve our manufacturing capacities. Uh, whether that requires, uh, because it is case by case, in any case, the interministerial mm -hmm. consultation that we do does try to sort of nuance this out to ensure that there's no blanket ban and in areas where we need 
uh, such uh, inputs from their side, we do allow it. Uh, whether we can nuance it further is something that we'll uh, sort of, we'll be looking at in a continuous uh, manner. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, besides the FDI policy, there are issues about uh, global supply chains in terms of industry facing issues when it comes to, uh, you know, getting machinery from China and thereafter yeah. getting it installed through uh, Chinese technicians, those kind of issues. Wherever uh, the private sector wants to access uh, capital goods from China and thereafter it needs some help from in terms of getting them installed, mm. including issuing of visas for technicians, all of those DPIT is willing to look at and is recommending with an open mind uh, to our uh, agencies to ensure that Wherever Chinese uh, uh, manpower is required in critical areas to build up our manufacturing capacities, that need not be necessarily be stopped. There are other areas in terms of FDI, or in terms of control, hmm. uh, on, including management control, where we'll be much more conservative and we'll need to look at in a, on a case-to-case -case basis. But in other areas, we'll, uh, we are willing to look at it in a much more nuanced manner. You know, speaking of uh, a nuanced manner of uh, policy in interventions and policy initiatives, let me ask you this in the context of what's happening on the electric vehicle side, and we are still awaiting clarity from the government on a new EV policy, uh, which creates a level playing field, and of course it will not be uh, on a case-by-case -case basis is what we're given to understand as well. But the demand from a lot of the global manufacturers, or in particular one global manufacturer, is uh, that, look, don't mandate to start start with domestic uh, manufacturing, uh, bring down tariffs, let us import at a lower duty, and then get demand visibility before we actually set up domestic manufacturing. What's the DPIIT view on this? Uh, actually, it's not a single manufacturer anymore. Now there are two of them, and I, I won't mention who those two are, but yeah. We know is, one. <laughs> yeah, so you can you know, try and guess, guess the other one. So, uh, uh, those, uh, th as I said, there are a couple of requests in those, on those lines. It's a very contested sort of policy space because we have a strong op domestic automobile sector, which also has investment plans in this area. So I would only say at this stage that the government has not taken a final view on this as to how to do it, how to sort of, you know, do this trade-off where, uh, which will have some disruptive uh, impact, but which also has some, you know, it's, there are benefits and costs uh, in going down that route. And the government really hasn't taken a final call on this as yet. Uh, you, you know, you said that on this particular matter, the government has not taken a final call. But as part of the liberalization of FDI across different sectors, for instance, retail, uh, for instance, as far as the uh, defense, uh, uh, you know, sector is concerned, there are obligations in terms of offsets, even on the retail side, there is a 30 percent mandatory local procurement requirement and so on and so forth. Do you believe that that uh, is the approach to be taken to try and encourage more and more domestic manufacturing? It could be. I mean, it's not that, that uh, only the PLI scheme, which involves uh, giving incentives and then linking it to manufacturing, uh, uh, you know, performance uh, in terms of investments and uh, domestic value addition and incremental sales. That need not be the only way. It, uh, tariff policy can be used in certain cases. In fact, we've actually used it in uh, one or two small cases where uh, there, there are two leading uh, foreign tire manufacturers who had a couple of product lines that were on the restricted category. And we basically negotiated and told them that we'll uh, uh, remove those restrictions for a certain number of years if you start uh, manufacturing those product lines in India. And let me say that in both those cases, those companies have already started making those investments on the basis of that uh, promise. So yeah, tariff policy can be used to create performance requirements for investment and local manufacturing. It's something that obviously by its very nature has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. But mm. yes, it can't be ruled out. And in some cases, it is better from the government in the sense that there's no budgetary outplay involved at all. Yeah. You know, uh, let's talk about the unfinished agenda now as far as the manufacturing sector is concerned. And of course, ease of doing business continues to be a work in progress. And between the center and the state governments, because the licensing and approvals are really at the state level, uh, this will continue to be something that uh, will, will have to be looked at. Uh, but you know, from a central government's perspective, uh, any big ticket items that you believe are on the unfinished agenda list that you would like the government to prioritize, uh, perhaps post the elections? Okay. Uh, 
So if you see our ease of doing business rankings and how it sort of improved drastically, uh, almost uh, 70 odd positions in 2019, from 120 odd to about 63. Uh, the areas where we really moved uh, up the rankings were in things like uh, quickly registering a company, mm. providing online building permits, uh, those kind of things. Uh, there are other areas where we, frankly, are still way, be up, uh, way behind in the global rankings, and those are in areas like contract compliances, mm. where which is really attribute, attributable to uh, the fact that our judicial uh, system is prone to delays, and uh, uh, also areas like property title and certification and uh, uh, online uh, mutation, etc., where again, uh, the the land reform the land title system is uh, has been improved only in a few states mm. let me say it is quite uh, uh, it, it is still our property title still involves uh, uh, it, it's not a sort of guaranteed title at all it involves a bunch of documents to in order to establish title which is too difficult for businesses and for for that matter for mm. the individual as well so those are the two sort of reform areas where we really want to work on, and that's one we'll, which are both, uh, the, the latter is primarily with the states, um, and many states are working on digitizing their land records and yeah. linking it with the registration and mutation process. The, uh, the judicial delay issue is a much bigger issue, but uh, there the, one of the things that government should do, and that is my personal view, is that we have to improve the number of uh, judges yeah. Uh, per uh, you know thousand of uh, per million population in India, it's way too low. Many st because a lot of it is funded by the states, uh, mm -hmm. there is a reluctance to uh, you know sanction those posts. But we'll have to do it because that is the only way our uh, you know some of our the pendency in our courts will uh, which affects the business uh, and it affects ease of living for the common public that can be removed. Oh, that, that, that is a, a genuine issue and has been a perennial problem as well that we have been dealing with. But, uh, you know, the DPIIT also looks after the startup ecosystem and the startup space in India. Uh, you've also been registering uh, startups in India for the last few years now. Uh, given what is happening today in terms of global trends as well as the decline that we've seen, uh, you know, people are sitting on a lot of dry powder, not necessarily investing it just yet. And of course, the problems that we've seen within some of the large Indian startups. Uh, what, what's your assessment? What's your sense of where things currently are? What, what are you mindful of? And what would you like startups to be mindful of as well? So uh, the, our startup ecosystem is, of course, very dynamic, very innovative. It's moving really fast. Uh, we started with 300 odd in 2016. Now it's about 117,000 registered. The number is an absolute underestimate because yeah. a lot of uh, startups simply graduate out of our eligibility criteria, which is, you know, a certain number of years and a certain turnover. I think it's only 100 crores. Yeah. So if you're successful, in any case, you'll be out of that list. So the number is probably much higher than the that number and of 1,17,000. And uh, it's already the third largest in the world. We'd like to take it to number one because it, I think it is within reach. The, for the startup ecosystem, I'd say that in some cases we've uh, sort of uh, moved very fast, expanded quickly, and sometimes uh, oversold ourselves in terms of uh, the, the actual business value that we are generating. And that leads to some bad uh, stories which does uh, deter uh, uh, in the pipeline of investment. So, I mean, the, the, what I've been telling the startup ecosystem generally is that uh, one should be very uh, adventurous, very innovative on the other areas, but in terms of uh, finance, they have to be prudent, and in terms of compliance, they have to be, you know, they have to sort of ensure that the compliance side is not lost sight of. So the, the business process, the innovation is good, but on the other side, uh, one has to be prudent when it comes to compliances and, and when it comes to other people's money and handling that as well. You know, so I, that's the perfect segue for me to end this conversation on, Mr. Singh. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, policy, what, what, what do you believe you could be adventurous with? What are the kinds of risks that you believe the government can take to ensure that we build on, on the current momentum? And, and uh, what could some of those bold ideas be that the government chooses to focus on? Well, I mean, I can't prejudge for the whole of government, uh, 
but generally you will find that uh, in uh, elections or after elections the first one or two years are the areas other years when the maximum reform happens yeah. so my wish list would be to really you know uh, do much more in areas like fdi um, liberalization uh, you know making it 100% automatic practically in all sectors of the economy is what i would uh, wish for similarly in ease of doing business i mentioned the two areas that i really uh, you know am concerned about one particular area the land titling and property certification system that is entirely with uh, with uh, at the official level it can it should be done at the official level there is no politician who is preventing us from doing this it's something that needs to be done at the official level across states we'll press hard on that and in general in terms of ease of doing business maybe we can uh, you know incentivize uh, industry further in a few more sectors not necessarily only through plis but in other ways these are three four of the issues that we really like to focus on you know more of what we've been doing but in a bigger way with scale and uh, you know speed well continue to your policy uh, with more scale and speed uh, that is the outlook for uh, policy as far as make in india is concerned and perhaps we will see uh, after the, the the elections the first full budget that the government will present uh, some of these decisions being taken forward mr singh always a pleasure many many thanks for giving us very comprehensive but a very clear road map on what we can expect the government to focus on going forward ladies and gentlemen a big round of applause for the dpit secretary thank you very much you. for your time stay back for a small token of appreciation that we'd like to give you Thank you once again, sir, for those uh, insights. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our first panel of the day, which is titled Sustainable Manufacturing Pathways to a $5 trillion Economy. As India charts its course towards achieving a $5 trillion economy, sustainable manufacturing emerges as a cornerstone of its strategy for global competitiveness. This entails leveraging connectivity and data-driven insights and solutions to enhance efficiency while also prioritizing waste reduction and reducing circular economy principles. And to moderate the session, I'd like to invite on stage Parikshit Lutra, Bureau Chief, CNBC TV 18. And joining him in this panel are, please welcome everyone with a round of applause, Vinod Agarwal, President CM and MD and CEO, Volvo Eichel Commercial Vehicles, Vivek Vikram Singh, CEO, Sona Comstar, and Pulkit Bhandari, CFO, Zetwork. Can we please have everyone on stage, please? Can we please have Parikshit Lutra on stage, please, to moderate the session? A round of applause for him, please, as he walks on stage. Over to you, Parikshit. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, over the last 24 to 48 hours, we've been discussing the future pathways to growth, how to grow sustainability, sustainably, how to have smart manufacturing across our factories as well. And we've got a stellar panel with us today. We've got uh, Mr. Vinod Agarwal, uh, a veteran of the automobile industry, and I guess somebody who has seen the automobile industry closely for four decades now, sir? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, the MD and CEO of Volvo Aisha Commercial Vehicles. Uh, we also have with us Vivek Vikram Singh, CEO of Sona Comstar, uh, a major automo automotive component supplier, not just for India, but across the world as well. 
Uh, we also have the CFO of Zetwork, Pulkit Bhandari, with us. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, let me begin by asking you, what does the term smart manufacturing really mean to you right now? You've seen the industry over the last four decades. Uh, we were assembling a lot. We are now manufacturing a lot locally. A lot of things have are being done by robots in the industry. There's more use of AI, IoT now. But in today's day and age, what does smart manufacturing mean to you? Fundamentally, uh, smart manufacturing is that when you use less natural resources, when you have much, much more non-fossil fuel-based energy, and uh, when you do it with the least cost, when you have the least waste, uh, when you are careful about the, uh, the materials that you use, and when you do a lot of uh, recirculation or uh, have focus on waste, safety practices. So the entire ecosystem, I would say, of manufacturing, when you do it efficiently, then it means it's smart manufacturing. Right. Uh, thank you for putting that uh, so well, sir. What about you, Vivek? When it comes to Sona Comstar, today you are investing heavily in terms of electric vehicle manufacturing. When it comes to implementing principles of smart manufacturing, drawing your energy from renewable sources, reducing emissions across your value chain, how are you trying to do that? Yeah, so I'd like to add to what sir has already said. Uh, I think smart manufacturing or sustainable manufacturing is not just about doing less of what is bad and harmful. It is also about doing more of what is good. So, of course, there are the easy ones. Use less, uh, you know, thermal energy. Use less emitting, less waste, all of that. But can we also enable more of what is good? So, for example, electrification. So, one of our goals is that 45% of our revenue in calendar year 26 would come from sales to battery electric vehicles. So, that is where we say it is smarter than not just reducing the carbon footprint. Of course, the easy ones, like changing your energy mix, even though if it's more expensive, uh, ensuring that your logistics footprint is smaller, you use recyclable pack packaging, even if your customers don't pay for it. Sometimes you have to bear that cost. So there is a lot more, and as Sir already alluded, because our industry is very competitive and uh, very ruthless in some aspects. You don't just have to make a better product, you have to make a better and cheaper product all the time. So you can't grow in areas which add cost without value addition. So repeatable tasks that you put unskilled or semi-skilled workers on as much as you can reduce and upgrade them to higher skilled tasks, that is going to be better. For example, we've grown more than about eight times in the last eight years in terms of turnover, but our manpower has only increased by four times. It has come by intelligent automation. It has come by reduction in a lot of manufacturing process. Almost all good engineering, be it product or process, is about reduction of complexity and steps. So again, going back to that point, that can we do more of what is good while giving the customer a better and more cheaper solution how do you decrease your footprint and use of resources? That's, that's what we're about. All right. Uh, uh, Pulkit, I'd like to ask you, today we are working towards a $5 trillion economy, and that dream is very achievable. We are going to reach there very fast. We'll probably reach there in 2025. Uh, what are some of the opportunities that you see for the industry when we speak about smart manufacturing, efficient manufacturing, sustainable manufacturing, how does that fit in with our larger $5 trillion economy goal? I think when we talk about $5 trillion, right, so uh, it may sound like a big number. To some, it may sound like a very achievable average number. But if you look back, uh, 10 years back, we were much smaller economy. Today, we are from number eight, we have jumped to number five, right? And just to give you a sense, and terms of what this five trillion can do, the number five rank will jump to number three. We are going to be bigger than Japan and Germany. So we are talking about India being the third largest economy in the world. We're talking about uh, a country which will have the highest population. 
uh, with the highest uh, consumer demand right so it's a it's a very different scale very different sense of relevance in the in the global stage now if you were to kind of break down india advantages of course smart manufacturing is one part of it but what will lead to it is something that we need to decipher and think through so some of the things that happened over last 10 years have basically got us where we are today right whether it's gst whether it's rera whether it's banking laws whether it's basically government's focus on infrastructure so just to give you some data points there we added 146000 kilometers in terms of roads we added 26 kilometers 26 route kilometers in terms of railways 11% of our total gdp goes into infrastructure development right so these are massive numbers which are going to lead to a lot of other elements when it comes to meeting that 5 trillion target uh, when you look at corporate tax rates today right india is the lowest corporate tax rate regime in the world we have a 22% tax rate for matured companies we we are talking about 15% corporate tax rate for new manufacturing divisions which actually means that we'll have more money to reinvest in the business right when we talk about fdi which is again going to lead into the sustainable manufacturing today india only accounts for 4% of global fdi which is coming through right so that if this four is to become eight which is just double i think that 5 trillion number will look small mm -hmm. right uh, when you look at the balance sheet structures today probably india is one of the few countries which has the best banking balance sheets and corporate balance sheets we we are trending at the 15 year low of debt equity which again means more more resources to invest to achieve that sustainable manufacturing uh, element because what happens in sustainable manufacturing is that sometimes you have to invest for future you may not get the pricing benefit today uh, and and the cons consumer may not be ready for that even the export markets may not ready for, for that today but i think that transition is happening and we are going to see, see that shift as we move towards this 5 trillion benchmark all right thanks for those remarks uh, pulkit uh, mr agarwal coming to you when it comes to a company like volvo aisha commercial vehicles uh, and when it comes to the aisha group in general you're into heavy trucks you're into uh, making buses motorcycles what are some of the sustainable practices you're implementing across your businesses what about uh, in principles of circular economy have you started using a certain percentage of your own recycled components recycled trucks as material in your uh, in your supply chain how are you trying to make sure that you are able to reduce emissions fundamentally uh, if you categorize the actions in three areas uh, i think it's climate uh, then it's resources and then people mm. uh, as far as the climate is concerned uh, i think the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that's the biggest threat to the planet so therefore uh, at all our levels we have to make efforts to move from uh, fossil phase based fuels to uh, renewables so therefore in our factories we are make, making fundamental efforts that we have to use more and more solar energy more and more wind energy we have to reduce our dependence on thermal power and uh, as per the commit norms Uh, we can go only maximum up to 75% of the uh, energy from renewables because if we have taken connection from uh, the government uh, the power connections you have to use 25% minimum 25% power from the grid so therefore uh, first is at the climate level we have to ensure that we have to contribute towards lesser and less co2 emissions and that is the biggest focus which is not only uh, at our level but globally also i think if you ask the company like for example if volvo group has to uh, buy a lot of parts or components from india mm -hmm. now they are doing specific audits of all the suppliers mm -hmm. that what is their status on co2 uh, emissions mm -hmm. what is their how much uh, co2 neutral neutrality they are creating uh, how much recirculatory they are doing so they are doing complete audit of the uh, suppliers and if they qualify within their criteria only then you can export from india mm -hmm. so that is at the climate level 
then at the resources level, uh, then you have to, for example, water is again a natural resource. So you have to ensure that whatever water you draw from the uh, Mother Earth, mm -hmm. you have to put more back into it. So therefore, there should be zero water discharge to the uh, drains or to the land. Mm -hmm. So entire thing should be treated back mm -hmm. and uh, it should be reused. Mm -hmm. uh, today, but we are ensuring that our sewage, uh, you know, waste or our uh, effluent waste, mm -hmm. uh, the entire thing is treated and that is put back. Uh, into our reuse, either it is used for gardening or it is used in toilets. Now the processes are coming where it can be used for, uh, it, it could be converted into drinkable water also. There are processes. So, and then of course there you have to do the water harvesting. So that whatever you draw from the earth, you should put more back into the earth. So that you should become net positive on water. And uh, then the second uh, thing is that the waste that you generate, uh, there should be zero landfill. You should not fill any, anything into the land. Uh, it should be, uh, you know, converted into usable. For example, uh, there is a lot of sludge which gets generated in the paint shop. Now that sludge, uh, earlier people were filling in the land. They were just disposing it off and putting it in the fields or open lands. Now there are processes where which that sludge is now used as um, as you can say, the for uh, in their in the furnaces in cement plants. So we give that sludge, we sell that sludge to them, and they use it in their uh, furnaces. Similarly, uh, like for example, uh, in our plants, paint shop is the biggest consumer of uh, energy. Uh, in paint shop, a uh, lot of uh, hot air from the ovens used to get released in the atmosphere. Now we have made a process by which that hot air is brought back into the oven. We have recirculated that hot air back into the oven so that we can use that for heating the ovens. Uh, earlier the cold air was going in and we were, we were using energy to heat up the air. So now we are recirculating the hot air uh, by which you can reduce energy consumption by 20-25%. So like that there are a lot of processes by which you have to use the lesser, lesser resources. You have to conserve, conserve energy. Now, of course, recircularity. Recircularity, there are a lot of regulations also are coming from government. Like, for example, extended producer responsibility. Mm -hmm. Government has already notified the draft rules, mm -hmm. end of the vehicle uh, draft rules, or uh, waste management rules for plastic, or for steel, or for rubber, or for uh, batteries. I think all these items, now more and more regulation is going to come where the responsibility is going to be on the manufacturer mm. to make sure that we have to certify that how much recircularity we have created, how right. much uh, material we have reused. Mm. And similarly on people uh, waste, uh, you have to, like whenever the Volvo people now are importing, they are checking those practices, uh, human ri rights uh, compliances or gender diversity or are you exploiting the labor mm -hmm. or are you paying overtime if you are using people for more time. So all those audits are being done now mm -hmm. so that you are become creating, uh, following more and more sustainable practices. Uh, very good to hear that, sir. And uh, when we have a target of becoming more export competitive, increasing our exports in a sustained manner, one thing which we will have to see is we comply with global regulations. We've got the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States the uh, CBAM when it comes to Europe as well. So there will be a greater focus uh, when it comes to making sure that the products being imported to these countries are meeting all the environmental regulations of those countries. Uh, Pulkit, uh, coming to you, when it comes to the export opportunities, where does India stand as of now versus other emerging economies? We face a lot of competition from Vietnam, Indonesia, when it comes to environmental compliances, uh, how are we right now when you compare it to these other jurisdictions? Sure. So let's talk about basically first uh, what is our edge versus other exporting countries and then basically the sustainability part of it. So if I were to just look at where we are today, I think we are where China was 23 years back and where US was nearly 40 years back, right, in terms of gross capital formation in terms of investments, in terms of uh, entire infrastructure and logistics. 
Today, from a manufacturing perspective, when you benchmark us versus any other exporting countries like Mexico, Southeast Asia, uh, India has close to 19% of world's working population. The sheer size and scale that we have uh, is significantly more than any other country in the world. Right? When you look at three capitals, which is people capital, and when I say people capital, it also basically leads to domestic consumption. Financial capital, which is a deep capital market, uh, both on equity and debt side. I think India today leads from, from the front there. There is no other country, exporting country, which is even close to where we are. When you look at uh, political capital, I think the political goodwill that we have created is again, a, is again a big, big edge that India has created over any other exporting countries. Today, the goodwill and the, and the relevance that we have with the Western world, with Middle East, with Australia, Japan, is significant, right? So that actually kind of gives us an edge when it comes to evaluating our manufacturing practices versus others. Now, coming on to the sustainability part of it, uh, I think uh, the best way to solve it and best way to basically take a lead is via software. So as you rightly said, we have to first measure, then basically comes the correction and then comes the improvement. Right? And the best way to basically measure scope one, scope two, scope three is via software because humanly you can only get to a particular point and then you'll realize that basically you're missing. Right? So, so at least in our systems and processes at ZWork, we are trying to use as much software as possible to, to evaluate scope, scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope three is most relevant for us and most complex as well because that's kind of going into your supply chain and that leads and needs a behavioral change which happens over a time. Uh, I think uh, with, with software, you may be able to kind of develop that edge versus any other exporting countries. Yeah. yeah. Basically, you can also set benchmarks for your own suppliers yeah. as well and make sure that they're on board with the same system. Uh, Vivek, if I were to ask you, how challenging is this when it comes to large companies like VECB uh, or at uh, Sona Comstar, you can establish those processes, but when it comes to your ground level suppliers, tier one, tier two, tier three, how challenging does it become uh, very often when you're sourcing small, small components from remote corners of the country to make sure that's happening sustainably, making sure that workers' rights are being respected. Do you find that challenging? And how are you trying to make sure that they're all in sync with Sona Comstar's larger vision on sustainability? Sure. So it is challenging. I mean, uh, to say it's not would be uh, false. But we began early. One of the reasons is we were always exporting far more than we make for the Indian market. Uh, even today, I think 71% of what we make is sold in North America, Europe, etc. So we were complying to far more stringent norms far ahead of the industry, which meant that while we were growing, we chose our supply chain partners with that lens. So it, because you start early and when at that scale you start doing those checks, etc., it becomes slightly easier and like Pulkit said, uh, scope one, scope two is frankly not that hard. Like 2030 will be net zero is fairly simple. It's scope three where the challenge really starts. And pulling up the Indian supply chain where it's still tier three level is very unstructured. Uh, a lot of the rights, collective bargaining It's not very organized either. It is not. It is very promoter driven. Uh, if you have the ability to organize capital and labor, you have a business. Uh, it is going, but it's going away much slower than we would have liked for it. So what we have done is a lot of these things, and I, I know it's not ideal for everyone, and you have to have deep pockets to do it. We have brought in a lot of it in-house, actually. Mm -hmm. So we vertically integrated downwards for anything we thought is going to be a problem. We just said, let's just do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, because you cannot afford to miss those goals. So while we are saying sustainability and talking as if it's the... It's a good thing to do or a policy thing. It's also very, very smart. Uh, and that's where I think that smart and smart manufacturing comes from. Our margins have increased by 3 to 4% just by doing these right things. Because like Sir said, energy. Energy after raw material and labor is our third highest cost. If I ensure that per gram of steel processed or per 
you know, whatever, per square inch of electronics boards produced, my energy used is less, I save money. For waste, the less waste, if you go from 3% scrap rate to 1%, that 2% goes straight to your bottom line. So we have also actually, we have made a very high return on investment by investing actually in sustainability. Mm. So all of it has come back, added to the bottom line, given us that extra capital to reinvest that in better machines, in more highly trained people, and a lot of, I would say, well, I know AI is the buzzword today, but more machine learning based AI, sir, that you take out people who are doing end stage quality control, mm. and you actually let cameras do that job, mm. because that was a repetitive task. The guy was picking up parts and putting them back. You take those people out, and put them in better jobs. Right. So a lot of it has been taken in-house, and a lot of this used to be outsourced, actually. Mm. You know, uh, one, uh, you spoke about North America, and I have to say this. Uh, you know, Sona Comstar is among those top four, five suppliers in the country which supply to Tesla in uh, North America, and they've been doing it for, for quite a few years now. We won't go into that, but give us a sense. When you're exporting to some of the big companies, uh, in Europe, in North America, what are some of the regulations or what is the la big difference in uh, environmental regulations, sustainability regulations, uh, ESG regulations that you need to comply with? See, uh, I cannot confirm or deny involvement with any customer, so for the record. Uh, I would say Europe's far more stringent, uh, specifically when you come to policies. I mean, even your labor policies, a lot of us would not have built into our policies things like collective bargaining rights. You have to have those things. North America is a little less stringent, actually. Uh, the landfill thing that Sir said, it is the only objective you should be following. Nothing should be going into a landfill. America is not that stringent. So I would say Europe is what you need to follow, especially if you're working with German uh, OEMs. That's the highest standard, and then you work your way down. But again, uh, in manufacturing, like in life, whatever is the highest standard you ascribe to, mm -hmm. that becomes your standard. The day you allow the standards to fall, mm -hmm. that new thing that you have fallen to is the new standard. So you have to hold to the high one and not say, I will choose horses for courses. You say, whatever is the highest standard, now I'll apply to all. For example, customer confidentiality. Uh, if a couple of customers have it, we have applied to all. So we don't talk about any customers now. Mm. Same approach, I would say, in manufacturing and environmental norms. Mm. Just apply the highest standard. Don't second guess uh, regulation. They will only get tougher. So that's, that's how we are looking. No, no, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, and a question similar to Pulkit as well. When it comes to our exports from India, so if I were to ask you, and if I were to ask you to wear your Siam hat right now as the president of society between automobile manufacturers, how do you see our automobile exports increasing? Because this is a focus for the government. And even when it comes to importing from China, the, the component imports from China have not shown any significant decline. Do you see some of that uh, challenge existing, a challenge which we've not been able to come do you think we need a longer horizon to overcome those challenges? First, if you look at the exports, uh, fundamental is the quality and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at uh, today, we are able to export a lot of parts or components. What is the reason of that? Uh, the reason of that is uh, that a lot of, uh, you can say, the latest technology vehicles have come into India. Then uh, Indian companies, OEMs, they have indigenized all those technologies here. Mm -hmm. And they have produced the same quality with the same uh, technology uh, with the local suppliers. And local suppliers have uh, come up to the challenge very fast. And they have made the investment in technology. They have come out with the same standards. Like, for example, uh, when Maruti came in, there were no supplier community, was very less component suppliers. So then the indigenization started happening. A lot of indigenization happened. Now, when we indigenized it, we indigenized it at a lower cost because India had a lot of inherent advantages in cost because the labor was 
cheaper or the other resources were cheaper. But then we were supposed to produce the same quality because we were replacing the overseas supplier of those parts. Uh, when we produced that part at a lower price and the same technology, then it became exportable. Then the same OEM who was supplying us the kits with the imported parts, they said, Ki, why not we buy these parts from you? Because we can buy the same technology, we can buy the same uh, quality and uh, at a lesser cost. That is how the uh, parts export started growing. And today it has grown to $20 billion. It will grow to $100 billion in the next few years. So therefore, similarly, the vehicles. Now, vehicles, uh, the quality again uh, is becoming better and better. Today, uh, the vehicles that we produce in VCB, we are able to compete with Japanese because we are producing the same, same quality vehicles. We have incorporated a lot of good technology into our vehicles, and we are able to uh, produce the good technology vehicles. We can compete with Japanese vehicles. Today, we are exporting engines to Volvo Group. Euro 6 engines right from 2013. Now, these engines are used in Volvo trucks or Renault trucks or Judy trucks worldwide in 43 countries. Engines produced here. Now, how we are able to do it? Because we are producing the same quality, same technology, but at a lesser cost. So I think if you keep on producing at a lesser cost, I'm sure uh, you will be able to export more and more. But at the same time, right now, uh, we are not able to export these vehicles to, say, Europe or U.S. or developed countries much more. We are uh, exporting more and more to the uh, either our neighboring countries or Middle East or, or African or Latin American. But I think <coughs> still uh, there are some difference in uh, emission norms or some standards. Uh, I'm sure we will catch up with those and we will be able to export to those uh, developed countries as well. At least no, US coming, and UK, yeah. we might have FTAs yeah. with them very soon. Yeah. Uh, it's Sorry, not the UK question and of, Europe. It's not the question of FTAs. Right. It's the question of producing the same, uh, you know, if there are some standards which are applicable there, hmm. or if the engines can uh, take on those minus uh, temperatures hmm. in the uh, you know, severe winter. Your vehicles have to be fit to take care of those. Right. Now, you have to produce those technologies. Hmm. So, and then, of course, we have to produce those high horsepower uh, engines mm. uh, which, which have to run, run on those roads. Absolutely. So I think we have, we have to match those standards. I think there, I think still it will take some catching up. Uh, now coming to the uh, imports, uh, I think still there are a lot of uh, electronic, electronic parts mm. or uh, st still some of those parts which we are not able to produce here. Mm. Because like microprocessors or chips, now, for that, there is large dependence on China. Mm. Now, suppose we are not able to get those parts in China, the auto industry will come to a grinding halt. Mm. Now, those parts, we, are not, we don't have the manufacturing facilities here. Mm. Now, of course, a lot of talks are going on, mm. as the uh, uh, Secretary Sub was saying that they are talking to Taiwan and other countries yeah. to get those microprocessors or mm. those things here. But those are large, large investments you need huge volume of scale right. uh, because th there are factories who are catering to the world. Yeah. There are factories in China who are catering to the world. Now, if you have to produce that here for the Indian requirement, that is not sufficient. Right. You have to set up that capacity. So that will probably take a longer gestation it will take, period. It will take some time. There is a lot of focus uh, from Siam side. We are focusing a lot that uh, how do we reduce our imports? Mm. There is a lot of focus from Ministry of Commerce, a yeah. lot of focus from SIAM uh, that we have to reduce. Now, there are two categories of imports. One is that there may be opportunistic where um, our people are saving some cost by mm. importing. But there are some compuls compulsion. You know, if because you don't have that technology, then you, you have no choice. But especially, to especially high end electronics, yes. uh, so maybe that, ECUs as well. Uh, sir, I'll get in Pulkit also at this point. Uh, Pulkit, looking at some of the challenges we have, and the government has tried to deploy public capital when it comes to schemes like Semicon, uh, schemes like uh, PLI as well. But do you really see the private capex cycle being encouraged by what the government is doing in budget, outside the budget, through the reform push? Is that private capex cycle really taking off? One, there is an environment of global uncertainty. Uh, there is a slowdown in exports globally right now. 
is there is there an appetite a stomach to deploy more capex right now yeah absolutely i think uh, so before i go into that i'll just uh, supplement what you said uh, when it comes to exports uh, moving away from automobiles to basically iphones if you look at uh, in 2017 india was producing less than 1% of iphones today we are doing 10% of total volume so which basically talks about our ability to manufacture in india high quality electronics uh, when you look at uh, landed cost benefit uh, if you were to basically benchmark us as 100 uh, mexico would be somewhere at 84 china would be 190 going to 120 with the duties western europe is not competitive eastern europe is not competitive japan is at 100 brazil is at 95 india is at 84 so there is a natural advantage just to supplement your point sir in terms of how we'll be able to export and frankly there is no choice right for the world uh from a from a option perspective and in terms of geographies which have been tapped and which have not been tapped i think us while china has declined over the last 5 years in terms of their export share india has doubled more than doubled their export share okay uh one geography that we've not been able to crack as much as we should have is europe so which also basically means the massive opportunity which 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 is out there now coming back to your uh question in terms of uh, sorry capex deployed capex yeah so i think uh, private capex was somewhat understated for last 5 6 years but when you look at the listed universe in india uh today there is a commitment of 8.1 trillion rupees that's basically out there which will happen over next 3 to 4 years which which is sort of committed and with the kind of balance sheets that some of the private sector companies in india have uh, which as i called out earlier is at the 15 year low debt to equity so they are going to re leverage to invest right uh the state capex again has become very relevant uh, we'll be clocking in somewhere close to 7 trillion rupees in terms of state capex and central government has been like a massive massive boost with 10 million 10 trillion rupees which is coming in as capex right uh, another data point which is amazing is that uh, the entire manufacturing landscape today is operating at a 75 to 80 percent utilization which basically means that in next year or two there is no other option but to basically reignite that capex cycle right So, so so far we have benefited from the government capex and i think next 5 years is when we are going to benefit from the from the private capex and uh, on 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 that particular point the capital formation that the country is doing today is equal to what china was doing uh, when it was kind of pushing boundaries and crossing borders to basically export so i think we are right up there thanks to your point right uh what what i also feel is that uh, we are going to also see a lot of encouragement in sunrise sectors especially anything to do with uh, helping the environment reducing emissions uh, renewable technologies i think those are sectors that institutions like the world bank right. are very invested in in collaborating with the indian private sector as well uh, let me get in vivek uh, once again vivek as you've been speaking about your export strategy and you said that when it when it comes to the component space uh, you were one of the few automobile companies in india who realized the potential of exports very early on in india's manufacturing journey how do you see your exports increasing uh, what is the strategy that you're going to be working towards about specific jurisdiction and if i were to ask you about the component sector overall how do you expect expect the exports to increase year on year over the next 5 years see component sector in general has been growing faster than the automotive sector although sir where's the cm hat uh, from the acma hat acma has been growing faster than cm it's because we are taking uh, ensuring that we capitalize on the india growth but taking a lot of share and Pulkit rightly said, North America is the easiest for us to compete in, because it is a free country in that sense. If you have a better and cheaper product, you will get in. Europe slightly slower, a uh, lot of relationships and investments in China, so it's slightly slower moving to get in there. Uh, but yeah, our our growth will be led by exports. Is what is uh, going to happen. it is not because of 
intent it is because see in our industry you already know next three four years order book is already in hand you already so have you that kind picture. of know where the growth is coming from and a lot of growth is coming from north america and europe because the components we make we make powertrain parts so they're mission critical and their value increases with the value of the vehicle mm -hmm. as sir said higher horsepower higher torque uh, more temperature ranges, you get paid more because you're doing far more complex solutions. Mm. Higher the value addition, the higher the price. Mm. So it is a natural fit for us because we are on the higher edge of uh, whatever is produced. So sir talked about engines. Actually, most of our engine starting products go to North Europe, North China, and Northern uh, America because that's where we do well. Mm. Those niches, if you can find, mm. you tend to do well. And to your point on CapEx, you're right. I've been a company, we are not one of the largest companies in India, but 12 billion in the next three years in rupees is our mm. spend. So 1.2 trillion, 1% 1 is just a company like ours. There'll right. be many more. I don't think private capex will be an issue. There are a lot of growth opportunities. Yes, there is global uncertainty. But I think this global uncertainty is the perfect pivot for a country like India. Mm. For companies who can harness this chaos, we right. can use it as a ladder. And I think geopolitically, uh, intellectually, engineering capability-wise, India is the best place to do that. You know, uh, absolutely. And when you, when you speak about uh, increasing manufacturing as a portion of GDP, it's not just important economically, it's a massive creator of jobs. And job creation is a focus and concern area for the government. Let me take a final set of questions with all our panelists. We'll keep this brief as closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, if I can begin with you. Globally now, we're seeing a slowdown in electric vehicle sales, especially in areas where subsidies have been pulled back or cut down or stopped, like countries like Germany. What is the lesson for India? We are focusing heavily on an energy transition, on, an elect on a vehicle transition by 2030. How do we get the regulation absolutely right? How do we make sure that the legislation does not get ahead of technology? I think uh, electric vehicles will happen. Uh, however, it has to be a step-by-step -step approach. It is not going to happen by quantum jumps. It will happen slowly and steadily. Some sectors it will happen faster, like for example, two-wheelers, it will happen faster. Buses, it will happen faster. Uh, Three-wheelers, passenger cars, it will happen faster. It will be the slowest in, uh, in trucks or uh, in a few other vehicles. So therefore, it is going to happen. In Europe also, is going through the same challenges. Mm -hmm. Even though Europe, Europe has declared very strong intentions that they will go fully electric by 2035. Uh, but if you look at the current progress, uh, it is not uh, to that extent. They are still at maybe 1% or 2% of the total vehicles. And what electric. also shows that the fundamental problems, like lack so of charging infrastructure, lack remains of, the same around Lack the of world. charging or other economic uh, considerations, considerations or the... Uh, cost of the vehicle, yeah, cost, cost of, of the vehicle. I think all those factors are there. Right. So, But it, it will happen. Much. It will happen, but uh, they, these are some of the challenges that we need to keep in mind for the future. Uh, Pulkit, what are some of the risks that you see in India's manufacturing growth over the next 10 years. Today we've discussed a lot about 10 years of Make in India, but some of the risks that you see and the role that capital markets could play in terms of boosting the manufacturing sector. Yeah, so let's, let me call out the risks first. So I think uh, we need to create more employment. That's the single biggest uh, driver that we should basically have in mind. And when I say employment, uh, when you look at the unemployment rate in India, it's 4.1%, which is not that bad. When you, when you see it in a silo. Uh, the moment you basically look at the concept of underemployment, right? that's where the challenge is, which we need to kind of bridge. So today, 40% of our workforce is in agri. Mm -hmm. If you look at China, it's 25%. If you look at any matured economy, it's less than 5%. So I think this shift has to happen mm -hmm. uh, towards basically more manufacturing-led growth. That's one. Second, uh, I would call out any geopolitical scenario which we mm. haven't envisaged. Mm. Uh, and when I say geopolitical, I think India today has become super relevant mm. in the scheme of things. Mm. And when you become super relevant, you may have to basically take sides, you may mm. have to take positions. Mm. I think how, what happens, what we do, 
can have repercussions in terms of the entire manufacturing theme. So that's the second risk. Mm. And third, I would say, I think we should not be complacent, mm. right? So I think uh, we have a lot of tailwind with us and it's time to basically just focus on execution and get it through. Right. To the second part of capital markets, I think uh, that's again a massive tide that we have. Today, uh, when you look at sheer numbers, we're talking about $50 billion of inflow in the capital markets. Mm. We're talking about $2 billion of SIP, which happens every month. Mm. We're talking about uh, India being the fifth largest capital markets in the world mm. with only a 1.6 person share in the global indices. So just imagine mm. the kind of FII flow that can come. Mm. So I think a lot that we are building, mm. there's a lot of capital which is out there, mm. which can be tapped in. Uh, and we just need to stay put mm. and focus on execution. All right. Uh, uh, Vivek, my final question to you, in terms of policy making, one ask from the government, when we have to meet our Paris goals, when we have to meet our climate action goals, how do you support the industry in a just energy transition over the next 10 years? One ask from the government. So, uh, I don't have many asks from the government in general. I think what we have been able to get from the government in terms of support has been far greater than our expectations. I grew up in an India where you didn't expect much from the government. Although I've only spent four decades on the planet, sir spent four decades on in the industry. He can answer more. But yeah, renewable energy policies, one, they have to be uniform in each state. I mean, just getting, investing in SPVs for solar farm, etc., was such a nightmare to do earlier that now we are at least seeing it in a couple of states doing that. This transition to cleaner energy, there has to be more support. Second, I would rather, and I would incur the wrath of my people in the industry, they need to get far more stringent on pollution control and emissions, and usage of diesel gensets, etc., should just be banned. A lot of industries which emit more than a particular number, only then would the change come. So, yeah, I want the government to provide some carrot for the good people, but also have a stick for the people who are not so good. No, you're absolutely right. And we're already seeing that in the industrial belt around Gurgaon, Manisar, a huge shift to uh, gas, using gas for uh, manufacturing, moving away from diesel gensets also. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Mr. Agarwal, uh, Vivek, and Pulkit for joining us on this panel discussion, giving your uh, view on uh, smart innovation, sustainability, and pathways for manufacturing for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll just ask you to stay back on stage for a short uh, photo session. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, Parishwet, I'd request you to please stay back on stage for our next conversation. Well, next up, we have an interesting fireside chat on how we can boost the innovation in the manufacturing sector. And well, to moderate this session, we have with us Parikshit. And joining him on the stage is Niranjan Gupta, CEO, Hero Motor Corp. Please welcome him with a round of applause. Thank you very much, Niranjan, for joining us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, over the last two days, we're not just looking at solutions for smart manufacturing, solutions for sustainability. We're also celebrating the old and the new. These are companies. We've had uh, Anish Shah, the MD and CEO of uh, the Mahindra Group. Today, we have the CEO of Hero Motor Corp, uh, Niranjan Gupta. This evening, we will have uh, R.C. Bhargav, the executive chairman of uh, Maruti Suzuki. Now, these are companies which are literally historically linked with the Indian manufacturing story. And here we have startups like Zetwork, which are also charting a new course in Indian manufacturing. And both these legacy companies and new age companies have to work together. And a very interesting topic for discussion at this juncture. We're talking about revving up innovation and what smart 
manufacturing really means to a company like Hero Motor Corp, which has been, which has spent decades when it comes to manufacturing in India. It has been manufacturing for the masses. It has been uh, the number one choice for commuters across the country. So clearly, Niranjan will have a lot to share with us, a lot of experience to share with the startups in the audience as well. Niranjan, uh, thank you very much. It's, it's great to have you here. Let me begin by asking you, what does smart manufacturing really begin to you or mean to you? Thanks, uh, Parikshit, for having me here. Uh, I'll have a, a bit of a wider take on smart manufacturing. Uh, the way we look at it for future, uh, and I would break it down a bit, S would mean safe and sustainable. M would mean make in India, because that's where the efficiencies, the scale, the future lies. And it's not just because the government is talking about it, because it makes economic sense. A would be AI and digitally enabled. R, of course, is resilient and responsive supply chain. Mm -hmm given all that's happening around the globe, and that the customer's mindset, the trends are changing so fast, you need a responsive and resilient manufacturing and supply chain. And T, I would call is TCO, which is total cost of operation, not just the cost the way we calculate. And I think here the finance uh, fraternity has got some work to do, because how do you calculate the cost of complexity, the cost of employee morale, the motivation? Everything has to be included. So that would be the definition of smart. Safe, sustainable, make in India, AI digital enabled, responsive, resilient, and TCO focused. So that would be the formula to win as a smart manufacturer. Right. Uh, Niranjan, you took over in March last year. Uh, you had spoken about the changing gears or shifting gears strategy. When it comes to moving sustainably or reducing the cost of operations, how much of your daily time is spent on that? How soon, how fast can you cut uh, emissions, how fast can you cut down the cost of manufacturing, bring more efficiency uh, in your manufacturing setup. Now, you've got a very vast manufacturing setup across the yeah. country. How much, of a, how much of time of you, uh, for you does it uh, really consume? So let me, uh, let me talk about you know, what we are doing on this. Uh, firstly, I feel it's not about just my time. It's about having a dedicated team, which is looking after sustainability in every which way. So for instance, the five targets that we have uh, is about getting to 100% carbon neutral operations by 2030, 100% green dealership by 2030, 100% product recyclability by 2030, 500% water uh, you know, by FY25, and actually 100% waste neutral by fiscal year 25. We've already achieved waste neutral target ahead one year ahead of the timeline. There's a full dedicated team working towards it, uh, Parikshit, right. to make sure, and, and you can see, the focus mm. is not just on manufacturing. Mm. Uh, it's about sustainability across the entire operation. As far as emission is concerned, so that's one on the manufacturing and the chain. As far as emission is concerned, you know that as part of the BS6 transition, mm. the SOX, NOX, a lot of parameters by the industry, uh, and we were part of that, were cut down by almost 90%. The other part is how do you reduce the fuel consumption? Mm. And therefore, which is where Hero products are known for mileage efficiency, mm. because the more efficient you are, it makes sense from cost and a value perspective. Yeah. It's also more sustainable because you are consuming less fuel. Mm. And of course, we continue to work on that. We are also working on the flex fuel, on the EV part of it. So a lot of work is going around this. In fact, uh, every leadership team meeting, which is monthly, one of the agenda, continuous agenda, is to talk about what is our progress on that. At the board level, we have a sustainability committee where every quarter we present the progress against the targets. So it's receiving huge focus. And there are three members of leadership team who are co-opted, apart from their usual stuff that they do, who actually champion as a steer co. So a very huge focus on across the board as to how do you do ensure that uh, you move on the sustainability goals. Right. Uh, now, speaking about AI and innovation, yeah. uh, how are you investing in this? We're looking at regulations come around globally. India is also on the cusp of developing its regulations on artificial intelligence. We're seeing what's happening in Europe, yeah. US, UK, for that example. Uh, 
uh, how much are you investing in AI? Uh, how much are you going to be investing in getting a workforce which can support your AI push? Absolutely. So again, on uh, when we talk about uh, AI uh, and uh, and digital, let's put both together uh, in terms of uh, spends. We have a, a function called uh, DIT, which is Digital and Information Technology, which drives. And a simple example is that if you compare two years back versus our next year's plan, which is just a period of three years, the whole capex and opex on the entire digital and AI field is actually doubling. So it's doubling from what used to be around a 250 crores budget to almost 500 crores budget. So. Because we are, uh, Parikshit, as I spoke to you earlier as well, uh, the key focus on, on our allocation of spends is more and more towards premium, towards EV, and towards digital and AI. Those are three areas of focus where actually disproportionate uh, portion of the spends, CapEx, OpEx, manpower, everything is going into that. Just to pick an example, uh, you know, on the manufacturing side, of course, there are lots of use cases that we are doing. Uh, like all the smart sensors across the line where you can uh, monitor it actually live instead of those weekly reports or monthly reports, that's all going to go away. But the journey on the AI, I would say as an industry, is probably into three stages. One is uh, where you have descriptive and diagnostic, and the second, uh, when you actually move to uh, more in terms of, and then you move to actually prescriptive in the third stage, where the AI itself starts giving you solution, that this is the solution moving forward. So I think that's the journey that the industry we are traveling, we are very excited about that. Of course, we've done a lot of work at the front end. Mm. Uh, like we are going to Parikshit, we are working on something which is right now the POC stage, is actually a Gen AI enabled sales pitch at mm. our stores. Mm. So that means that that's going to democratize the excellence. Mm. Yeah, so every salesperson will be as good as every other salesperson, right? Mm. So it's, it's an ambitious project. How much of AI do you use on a daily basis? Well, me. I use, for instance, uh, I've started using the chat GPT. I've started using when I draft uh, something to look at uh, that how do you redraft and they suggest on, on, on that part of it. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, on using the cloud part of it, for instance, I don't use my hard disk at all. By the way, my, my cabin, if you come across and you, you can, you're happy to anybody walk in, you won't find a single paper. So I don't have single file in my cabin. I don't have a single paper. It's all on my tab and on my phone, everything on that, even my meeting notes, even our board meetings that we do, by the way, usually board meetings mean thick papers to be circulated. Uh, there are no papers circulating the board meetings. Mm -hmm. So it's all on the tab, all on, on, on cloud. So I think from that perspective, uh, the whole mindset in the organization uh, is shifting. And, and you asked the right question. Mm -hmm. uh, when I don't use a paper, then people are very scared to bring a paper to me for signature. So okay. they have to then go on to the cloud and get that doing. So All right. So, so that's interesting. So you're trying to inculcate this habit all the way uh, from the top. Now, when it comes to smart manufacturing, there is also a need for agility. Yes. What we are seeing now globally when it comes to manufacturing, first of all, I'd like to ask you, this trend of uh, slowdown in electric vehicle sales, especially in cars, uh, is that something of worry that you have for two-wheelers as well? But I should see, uh, and I have said this before, uh, even my few interviews back, that this is a new category. This category will go through its stumbling blocks. Yeah? And we have seen that in every country because the category has been stimulated or catalyzed by subsidies mm -hmm. and the government, uh, you know, PLI, FAME, uh, the taxes, all that, because the, the total cost of operation, the TCO for ICE to EV, you still uh, are a few couple of years away mm -hmm. at least from making it economical. So therefore, it moves through ups and downs. There are customers who have to get habituated to a range which is, let's say, 100 kilometers, at, which means charging every second day, maybe, as compared to a fuel, mm. which you will do weekly basis. So I think there are different things. This category will go through its ups and downs. Mm. I'm not worried. Mm. I think on a secular basis, 
the trend will keep moving upwards. You will have few quarters up, few quarters down. Uh, but yeah, the, all the players, industry, government, will have to keep working hand in hand to move forwards. And I told you earlier, what we see from two-wheeler perspective is more and more EV in scooters as we look at next five, seven, ten years. In motorcycles, uh, it will be far away simply because motorcycle requires two or three times the battery capacity that you need in scooters. That means heavier and that means more costlier. Very, very simple way. And you've not ruled out three wheelers and four wheelers for the future as well. Well, uh, we are not averse to adding more wheels, yeah. uh, which is what I have said. Yeah. And therefore, we continue to evaluate our options. Yeah, we did showcase our path-breaking innovation. It's actually first in the world, which is a two-wheeler and three-wheeler combo we showcased in the hero world. And you're going to see that on ground, uh, this calendar year itself. Right. Good to know that. Uh, you know, I would also like to ask you about uh, the huge amount of manufacturing capacity that we have in the system for the ICE engines. And it's not just for Hero Motocop, it's across uh, the industry. Yeah. Going forward, are we going to be needing so much capacity when we uh, move towards electric vehicles? Uh, or you feel that we will have to be more agile, look at more consolidation in terms of our own manufacturing facilities that we have? Uh, what is your view on the current capacities that Hero Motor Corp has across the country? I'll tell you, uh, Parikshit, and I'll, I'll take it a bit broader, not just manufacturing capacity. Uh, it's about uh, R&D as well, the platforms that you are going to build on ICE moving forward. And what we are doing is we are looking at that from here on, at least let's say scooters, because that's the space for the next 7 to 10 years. Whatever platform that we are building in our R&D, we are looking at what are the areas where the commonization can happen with the EV platforms. Mm -hmm. Because EV is not just battery motor, right? I mean, it's, it's, there's a chassis there, there's a brake, there's XYZ. So how do you ensure that a synergy, which is what we are talking about, can be derived from the same platform to the extent possible? Mm -hmm. So that at the time of building a new model in scooter, we have now thinking what parts of that can be usable as a design, as a development part into EV in future. Mm -hmm. So that thinking is getting ingrained at the beginning. So that ensures your efficiency or in the transition that you are well prepared. As far as manufacturing capacity is concerned, Parikshit, again, Indian market is 65% motorcycles mm -hmm. and 35% scooter. From a hero perspective, it is 90% motorcycle and probably less than 10% scooter on the I side of it. Uh, India will always be a story of many Indias, and I think energy forms will be multiple forms of energy. So you will have the ice part of it, you will have the flex fuel part of it, you will have the EV part of it. So I think we're going to need these capacities moving forward. If you look at motorcycles growth, at least even if 6 7% over the next five, seven, ten years, and very small portion will be EV, even if you look at any of the reports, you will need those capacities. The third angle is that even on the capacity part of it, like we have done in Tirupati, now you have a plant, yeah, which was an ice plant, but a lot of stuff in manufacturing, which is utilities, which is a land space, which is a building, which can be used on EV. So we've actually again synergized there. So I think the synergies exist, and it's not that the ice part of motorcycle is going to go away, but one has to be like what you're saying, moving forward cognizant of the trend and then build agility and flexibility in the manufacturing. And that would be another element of smart part of it moving forward. Then how do you bring and build that agility? Now, we initially when we spoke, we have drawn a, a comparison about the role of startups in our ecosystem of yeah. legacy companies like Hero Motor Corp, uh, Bajaj, TBS, Royal Enfield. Now, what are we seeing today? Now, you've got a big pie in uh, Ether. You've got a big pie in, uh, with, with, a, with a strategic partnership with Gogoro as well. Is there pressure to innovate faster? How will you achieve cost parity with ICE in the next two years? The reason why I'm asking you this because we've had two views over the last few days. We had the MORT at Secretary yesterday when we asked him about subsidies. He said, in his view, there should be no subsidies. The other view coming from the Ministry of Heavy Industries, they've got a proposal ready, which is pending with the Ministry of Finance, is to have a 12,500 crore PLI scheme 
only for a period of two more years. The government is not in a mood to indefinitely have subsidies. They want to stop it now, at least for certain segments. When you have a zero subsidy scenario, and if you have to work to bring cost parity in the next two years, can this be achieved? How difficult is this? How are you trying to do that? All right. So firstly, uh, I would change the definition. I personally don't like legacy uh, versus startup. I think opposite of startup is matured. Right? So, so therefore, matured players versus startups, that would be the right way to put it across. Uh, the second point I would say is that, look, eventually, any business model has to be less dependent on subsidies and more viable on its own, eventually. Now, the pace of acceleration that we would like to have in a scenario where the cost economics are not that viable for manufacturers, which is where the you know, gap fill uh, subsidies kick in. Mm. And I think, therefore, that's the regime that you know, we need to be prepared for. In terms of the cost economics, I would actually argue that two parts that you talked about, cost and innovation. I would say innovation, yes. Yeah? Startups can put more pressure of innovation on the incumbents mm -hmm. or the matured players because there is a cycle of innovation which is around four years of a product development. Now, clearly, the way things are moving forward, even from the customer perspective, we need to crash that down by 50%. I think products cannot take now four years from conceptualization to launch. That cycle has to be brought down by 50%. And I think it's good that the startups put that pressure on in terms of to the incumbents or the matured players. Equally, I think the startups need to be careful about the safety of the biker, of the rider, because these are, these are not something which a washing machine or a fridge or whatever it is at home, if it blows up, it's fine. If it blows up on the road, it's a rider safety. So I think cutting down on processes of testing too much is not the answer. But building AI and digital and CAD and simulation in the testing to accelerate that cycle, innovation cycle, that's the answer. But yes, in short, innovation, it's good that the speed of innovation or how do you launch the product that's going to uh, be faster and faster. On the cost side, actually, the matured players have an advantage. Mm. And it's very simple because you ride on the current scale. And you, you can, it's very easy to look at. Mm. Manufacturing, you got land, you got building, you got utilities, you got a capex. Like for EVs or three wheels, you don't need to put absolutely, in additional capacity. Uh, absolutely. You can modify uh, your existing Logistics, lines. yeah. I can put 10 vehicles on the same truck that's carrying 30 vehicles, mm. yeah? So I don't need an economic viable logistics to service, right? So logistics cost comes down. Distribution, because the dealer is selling already ICE vehicles, is already viable. So on top the, of that, the mindset of a startup and the scale of a mature manufacturer can help. Absolutely, absolutely. So on cost side, I would say that scale brings cost efficiency to the matured players. Innovation brings cost efficiency to the startups. Right. So how do you bring that in? So, you know, I, you've been a CFO for many years. You've had an interesting journey uh, since the time you began. I would like to ask you, today you've got a large number of startups which are maturing and going for IPOs. And this is, this is rough weather. Now, as we look at the manufacturing ecosystem change, the challenges that we have around sustainability, what are some of the things that you feel that capital markets are looking at before they put their money in, uh, in startups right now? So I think that's for the capital markets to speak. But whatever, uh, you know, uh, from, like you said, my earlier CFO role, and of course, even now the interaction with the investors, I think two or three things have happened. One, uh, three, four years back, yeah, there was all this euphoria about SPAC. U.S. SPAC, and, and anybody could just show a, a, a vision and then say that I need money and money will come in, yeah? And I remember conversations with some of the eminent um, uh, big investment bankers, and they said, Niranjan, that, you know, gone are the days of DCF and EBITDA and the margins, yeah? It's all about multiple of future revenues. And I said, finally, it's going to translate into cash. I said, no, 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 you guys are thinking old. Good thing is, now with all the turmoil, all the traditional ways of looking at it coming back, what are the investors looking at, as I understand? They're now looking at faster break-even. So gone are the days where you could say that, I don't know when I'll be profitable. You won't be able to sell your stock. So what's your path to profitability? 
not just in, in, in theory, but actually unit economics. And, and you can't say that I will grow five times, therefore I'll become profitable. No. What are your costs which are variable and fixed? And therefore, the path to profitability and faster break-even, maybe 18 to 24 months is the appetite, not more than that. The second that they're looking at, where a lot of startups have failed in the past, especially in EV sector globally, is the ability to execute on scale. Mm. And the execution, uh, the degree of ability, and that's where when a player, when a startup is backed by a strategic investor like Hero, I think people take a lot of confidence that the execution will get sorted out because many people failed on the unit cost economics. If I were to pick up just two things, it was unit cost economics and the second was ability to execute. And the third, I would say, is focus. Hmm. So if you defocus too much as a founder and then go into 10 things, then that's something what investors are not liking today. Right. Uh, is that, has that been your advice to uh, Aether as well? Because, of course, it, it's been widely speculated that they'll uh, probably go in for an IPO or a DRHP very soon, sometime this year. So that's for Aether to speak. But yes, we are on board of Aether, and we continue to share uh, whatever we uh, understand about the auto industry. Because, see, finally what? The EV customer is not coming from a different planet. It's coming from customers who are buying two-wheelers as a replacement demand, as an upgrade. So the understanding that the ICE industry has is still hugely, hugely beneficial mm -hmm. for any startup. So that extent, we are learning from Aether. They are learning from us. We are on the board. Mm -hmm. So obviously, finally, it's for the Aether board to take the call. You know, coming back to the issue of sustainability, all of these pillars, like you said at the beginning, have to go together. When it comes to reducing emissions or drawing energy from renewable sources, what are you doing across your plants and some of the changes that are in offering at Hero Motor Corp plants across the country? Oh, absolutely. So we are uh, on the energy consumption at the manufacturing. There are two things we are doing. First, we are ensuring that every year there's a target to improve the efficiency of energy consumption by 5 to 10 percent. So that means less energy consumed per vehicle. And those are the continuous programs that run. The second is get more and more renewable power as a source. Now, obviously, putting up a solar plant inside the premises may not be that economical. So it is through a wheeling uh, that you do, that the solar power. And in some states, the government policy is favorable. In some states, it's still getting formulated. In fact, our urge to the government would be that uh, make this wheeling of solar power or renewable power completely flexible and agile and seamless and deregulate so that the industry can use that. Our target moving forward continuously is to, like today, we may be around 15% of renewable energy source that we use. We want to get to more than 50% in the next three years' time. And in fact, Parikshit, I would just say that you would have noticed we have announced um, our, our investment in, in Global Power Center, uh, 600 crores. Uh, which will take up the capacity of our parts, uh, accessories, merchandise to 10,000 crores for, because that business has grown very fast over the last three, four years. The GPC2 that we are going to build in, our intention is to have that operation as 100% carbon neutral operation from day one. So that's what we are trying to make that. So that's a lot focused on how we are driving. Right. Now, when we speak about de-risking supply chains, it is also de-risking your demand patterns as well. One aspect is to focus on the domestic economy. Now, as we've seen in the domestic economy, there is a somewhat stagnation when it comes to entry-level vehicles across the board. It's not just in two-wheelers. It's there for cars as well. There is more demand for premium segments. Uh, do you feel that it is very important for companies like Hero Motor Corp to de-risk and make sure you're able to generate demand for your products uh, globally? That has been a sort of a, a pain point for some auto companies. How are you going to do that in the next five years? Do you have a 10-year roadmap on so increasing me, exports? No, absolutely, uh, Parishit. Not just exports. Let me talk about you know, how the portfolio shape is changing, which is what you're referring to as overall de-risking. Yes, our portfolio was uh, entirely the uh, commuter-based, largely up to 125 cc. You've seen we have done four new model launches in the premium segment. So we're going to build the premium segment rapidly for us. We talked about Extreme, we have uh, X-Pulse, we have Charisma, Harley-Davidson X440, we've launched Maverick 440, and more will follow. So that's one part where the portfolio inherently, we are building the premium which we were almost absent. 
The second part, of course, is international, where we are present in 50 plus countries. We have decided that, and I talked about that I'm, I'm a big fan of focus. So we are saying that out of those 10 markets you've selected, where 80% of our resources will go behind those 10 markets. And therefore, that will provide the renewed energy to scale up aggressively. Coming back to the entry segment, one should not give up on the entry segment, simply because the last two, three years have been bad because of the inflation and the COVID. That segment has still got huge demand, which is lying to be tapped. I think what is very important is the finance penetration. One is the government's CapEx program, which over the last three years, and if I add the next year, will probably be 30 lakh crores. Now, that's a huge sum. It's got a gestation period for income to be generated at the bottom of pyramid. But we are seeing the green shoots. But the inherent demand is there in terms of penetration. You look at the homes that have cycles and don't have motorcycles. And that's simply cycle to motorcycle. You will see what the demand is. So apart from the income part of it, the second is how do you ensure that your upfront payment reduces? And which is where the fintech companies, the NBFCs, and we are working with them to increase the accessibility and affordability of finance. And that over the next two, three years, you will see a, a lot of effort behind that because that will tap the latent demand which is there into bringing forward where they can buy. So we should not give up on that. So these are the, we are very excited about the entire portfolio. You know, when we speak about revving uh, innovation, one thought that always comes to my mind, and I was talking to somebody earlier, every five to 10 years, an automobile company comes out with this one product which can somehow take it to the next decade. Uh, when the partnership, when you moved on, when the when Hero Motor Corp moved on from its partnership with Honda, there were motorcycles like Splendor in your portfolio, uh, like Passion. Similarly, the Maruti 800 for Maruti, the Scorpio for the Mahindra, that really took the company or yeah. drove the growth of these companies for 10 to 15 years. What has been the lesson from this and what probably are some of the factors that we could implement for the future from the, uh, fr from, the, from the role that these products have played in the country. Absolutely, Parishit, you are right. I think where it's, there, are, there are learnings from that, that a product needs to be reliable, safe, uh, you know, and, and fit for purpose. So if you're launching at the entry segment, it should be value for money. If you're launching at the premium segment, it should be more performance packed. There's a lot of learnings. But as you move forward, you can see already in the last 12 months or 18 months, the powerful launches that we have done, these are going to set the pace for future. On scooters, we've launched Zoom 110cc. We're going to come up with 125, 160cc. So that's a Zoom brand as a portfolio. On the premium I talked about, Extreme, X-Pulse, and Harley-Davidson X440, Charisma, and Maverick. We haven't had so many launches in such a short period of time ever in our history. So these are all paving the path for the next 10 years. That's the model part of it. Parishit, what we're also doing is not just focusing on launching models. We are saying activate 360 degree. So we are upgrading our stores, like Hero 2.0 stores. For the first time in 10 years, we have upgraded our stores where now 350 stores in 350 days. Now that's the upgrade premium stores that we are launching, brand association, renewed marketing, digital focus I talked about, AI-enabled sales pitch, the multiple things that we are doing in order to uh, make sure that we are addressing the future customer in terms of more digital journey powered and backed by the model. So a lot of innovation across the space where in the earlier era, the innovation would get restricted only to the model. Now I think innovation is more on business models as well as the entire digital space. Right, and it's interesting because today Hero Motor Corp is in different spaces. You've got, a, you've got your own electric brand of scooters, the Vida. Uh, you've got a tie-up with Aether where you own about 38 or 39%. Yes. Uh, you've got a tie-up with Gogoro for battery swapping. You want to set up your own charging infrastructure in the country. And uh, you've got a premium set of motorcycles. And very recently, uh, at, the, at the Jaipur CIT Center, you showcase at least nine or ten models for the future. So clearly, premiumization and fast-changing customer demand uh, is probably the key for the future. We've completely run out of time, uh, uh, Niranjan. But any final thought that you'd like to leave us with, uh, any kind of one policy area where the government could work on, which the industry needs to keep in mind uh, for the future. I'd like to leave it to you. Give us final thoughts. Well, thanks, uh, Parikshit. Uh, I would say the government is already laying down uh, a lot of policies in that space. Uh, what industry wants is stability and continuity 
of policies, uh, stability, predictability, and continuity. I think any policy should have these three features. As long as it's three is there, industry can chart out their roadmap. So I won't list out uh, any demand, and I would just go back to the definition of smart, which is safe, sustainable, make in India, AI, digital enabled, resilient, responsive, and TCO focused. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Niranjan. It was fantastic talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, Parikshit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Niranjan, and thank you so much, Parikshit. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our next session is a very special one because it shows us how far we've come. It shows us the evolving face of leadership with more and more women taking charge. With automation reshaping the sector, emphasizing skills over strength, Industry 4.0 presenting new opportunities for women and so much more. As automation and AI redefine manufacturing, physically demanding roles give way to knowledge-based ones, highlighting the very important of leveraging women's talent and shaping the industry's future. Well, while the scales may not be evenly tipped yet, we are delighted to say that it isn't unusual for us to now see extraordinary women like these at the helm. And to moderate our very special session on breaking barriers and forging success with women leaders of Industry 4.0, can we please have on stage Mridu Bhandari, who's the editor for Special Projects, and joining her is our eminent panel of industry leaders, Naina Lal Kidwai, Chairman, Board Member and Chairperson, ISC, Seema Chopra, ED and Global Technical Leader, Boeing India, Kavita Kaushik, Director, Head Quality and Six Sigma, Comes India, Superna Handa, MD, Sarita Handa Exports and Vaishali Nigam Sinha, Co-Founder and Chairperson, Sustainability Renew. A round of applause for a powerful panel. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to share the stage with so many incredible women from Industry 4.0. Uh, well, global research suggests that closing the gender gap in the workforce can actually boost the global GDP by 26%, adding about $28 trillion to the economy. In India, even though women make up for about half of our population of 1.4 billion people, they actually comprise less than one-fourth of our workforce. Manufacturing still remains a legacy sector with low female participation at about 20%, a share that has actually not moved at all in the last two decades or so. Today, we are seeing some change. Evolved manufacturers are trying to change the scenario with different initiatives. For instance, a handful of manufacturing companies have set up all women's assembly lines um, and of course, we'll hear more stories from the women on the panel, but clearly a lot more needs to be done. And to talk about all of this, we have five incredible women here with us who have been breaking barriers for a long time and forging success. Uh, so thank you, ladies, for joining us here today. And uh, maybe if I can start with the aerospace and defense sector, and Seema, I'll come to you first. Give us a sense of where we are today as far as women in the workforce are concerned uh, at Boeing what does the workforce ratio look like? And uh, what have you all been doing to bring more women back into your workforce? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so um, women are always underrepresented in manufacturing industry. And uh, in aerospace, uh, in, in Boeing, we have around 24% women. Uh, but making sure that they are at every stage, uh, every uh, level of uh, like, you know, executives, managers, uh, or at the factory floor. And uh, we have been uh, taking multiple, uh, you know, uh, efforts, for example, return to office, making sure that, you know, uh, uh, the women who take a break and they can come back and, you know, uh, uh, work after a break. Making sure that, you know, when they come after a break and we give them, you know, comfort zone that not a very heavy work uh, just after they come. 
And other than that, we do have uh, flexible uh, work hours, like, you know, you can uh, work uh, flexibility, like, you know, or telecommuting, those type of things, where you will be able to work from home the day you really need to work from home. Uh, we, are, we have been, uh, I mean, I think all the companies, thanks to COVID, after that, they are working in the hybrid mode. I think which, is, which was very useful, which was very helpful for the women when they were going through this COVID phase, which was not a good phase, but you know, it was helping uh, women to manage their uh, you know, work-life balance. So these are the few factors we have considered and, uh, you know, and also we are focused on the equal opportunities uh, on the, like, you know, making sure that promoting the diversity and inclusion in our workforce and uh, breaking the stereotypes and making sure that we have equal opportunities at the uh, floor. Good, good to hear that. And uh, Nena, if I can bring you into the conversation. Uh, of course, you have incredible experience in the financial services space. You're also on the board of many companies. First, tell us about some of the barriers that you faced. I'm sure it wasn't easy in those times. It's still not easy, but it was perhaps a tad more difficult when you were at the top. What did it take to get to the top? And uh, today, when you look at younger women entering the workforce in the banking financial services space. What is it that they are doing differently or can do differently to follow in your footsteps? So I'm not going to delve back into history. It was way back in the 80s. Things were very different. But rather share with you what I think are some of the issues we still have today. And I was interested in seeing the statistic, and you correctly described the workforce statistic on gender diversity. But the figures for white collar look a little better in that it's 35%, so maybe not as bad as 20, and likely to go up to 38% in 2024. So in two years, slow progress, but in the right direction. And really, I'm just talking to the panel uh, panelists today, I take heart from some of the statistics that you all are sharing in terms of the companies and where you have reached in your companies. I was struck by a survey i just seen which is global, and it tells me what we still need to resolve. And the first is that 70% of men will say they're ready for the change when there is a leadership change happening versus 50% women. So the issue still remains that women do not feel they're ready even though they are as ready, if not more ready, than the male colleague. So we have to solve for this in our companies, knowing this, in terms of goading them to put their hand up for those changes and compensate for what seems to be an issue across the board. And the so second, it, yeah. Is that due to underconfidence or, you know, why is it that women shy away from, from roles? So I think I, I firmly believe that as women, we have created our own glass ceilings. And if there's one experience I can really draw on over my years is how often I questioned whether I was ready. And if I didn't have a husband, a partner who came from the corporate world and pushed me to say, but you are, and made me go back and say, well, I'm ready, I don't think I would have put my hand up. And it, I think those career changes are sometimes some of the most important in terms of change. Because the second statistic I saw is that, and you could put it down to women appearing to be more loyal, that 60% of men will change the job uh, in terms of when there's an opportunity, so, you know, headhunter approaches you, et cetera, versus 49% women. So are women more loyal? Or what's more interesting is the reasons for which they will move. Both said career advancement, but the second reason given was that men move for more pay, women when they moved, the 49% that moved typically gave the second most imp important reason was the culture of the organization. So there are differences, and I think it should tell us as companies what we might need to address. If the culture is not right, that is why you're losing your senior women. Yeah. Uh, the men may be moving for pay, and it might be easier to solve for culture than always keep promising more money. Right, absolutely. And talking of culture, um, I want to come to the culture that Cummins India has. And, uh, you know, you've been able to double women's workforce participation over the last decade. How have you created that culture? What have you done differently? Yeah, uh, thanks for that uh, question. And uh, I, 
any culture, I think, gets developed over a time. And there has to be a start of the culture, and the culture always happens top down. Okay, and it similarly happened for Cummins. Ten years back, uh, we were around maybe 15% women on the shop floor. Today, we are more than 30%. Okay, and I think the most important piece, many of you all know, Cummins is in the heavy manufacturing industries. You know, we have engines which are as big as a 60-liter engine and huge gensets and many of those, um, you know, hardcore, as we said, heavy work which has been done on the shop floor. I think the most important piece which first came to us is how we can make it a general neutral, you know, workstations. That was the starting point, how we can improve more ergonomics, okay? The second thing was how do we bring women and girls to come to work? Because we have facilities which are in remote places, in Fulton, in Jamshedpur, in Devas, more apart from Pune. So they are in remote places. So how do we ensure that the families are ready to allow their girls and their um, uh, you know, women to come and work. So we really started how we change the culture, bring the, even the men from their families to come and visit the shop floor to see how they are working, okay, and how safe they are in terms of it. Cummins was the first industry to start women working in second shifts, okay? So all the nuances and the um, you know, regulations need to be followed. Okay, but it's not that it was all hunky-dory last 10 years has been a good challenging where we also saw that as women grew, somewhere when they came into their mid-management leadership there, there were gaps where they didn't want to pursue further because of many family priorities. Okay, so then what can Cummins really do? Give them sabbatical, give them, uh, you know, where they can take extended leaves, even during the, uh, their maternity leaves, give them opportunities that they can come back after a certain period of time and ensure reskilling. Right. I think that was also a major thing which we really started that, hey, you can have a second innings. Mm. We have a Cummins Powers Women and there we have a second innings, okay, where they can come right. and again reskill. And before even coming back to work, there is a period where they are given that opportunity to reskill themselves. So That's I think wonderful. these are the things which really help. But yes, it was a top driven. It was at a time where, uh, you know, most of the time we were said, okay, if Cummins is coming to engineering colleges, that means they will be only employing women. Okay, but that's <laughs> that, so... That's a, that's a good uh, yeah, statistic to yeah. have. <laughs> and, and that really helped. And um, I think that's what made us where we are today. It's wonderful. a long, uh, long journey for us still. Mm. We have that we want to uh, become 50-50 by 2030. It's going to be a, it's a happy task. Yes. Good. And good to hear that, you know, there are quantifiable goals that you're trying to reach with respect to diversity. Um, Vaishali, coming to you, you know, the renewable energy sector, uh, again, a sector where there are women, but not enough women yet. So, uh, you know, energy security and women's role in the workforce seem like two very disparate and, and disconnected topics. But are they really? And uh, what are some of the clear benefits that the renewable energy sector can draw from employing more women in the sector? Sure. First of all, thank you. Thank you for including this session um, today. Um, you know, before I answer your question, I just wanted to, uh, you know, echo what uh, Nena just mentioned. I think this kind of self-doubt and the lack of confidence which is there, I think this whole conversation around getting more women engaged, having parity at the workplace, actually stems from how we are brought up, the culture and families. Like Nena mentioned, her husband nudged her to move forward. In many families where women have done well, it's been often their fathers. Um, I've seen that when I've had uh, very senior, you know, uh, members um, in the management or in the board who are men and who've had daughters, they have a, they have a more, um, I would say, encouraging uh, uh, approach towards women. So that makes a lot of difference. Uh, I think as far as our sector is concerned, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a fact is that 80% of women uh, get displaced by climate-related issues. So what that does is that women know a lot about this sector, but they're not engaged as much. So if you look at policy making, etc., we don't have many women. Even if you look at even in the villages, you know, a lot of the displacement happens in the remotest areas. I think women know the kind of causes and the pro uh, solutions, etc., but they're not engaged. Uh, in our sector, 
Um, unfortunately, we employ about one third of the global average in terms of the number of women in this sector. So we have about 11% diversity. The world average is 33%. So India has a long way to go. Um, however, our sector, again, there is a bit of a bias that is an infra kind of a space. We work in the remotest parts of the country, and so therefore it's not as easy, it's not as safe for women to work there. Um, part of it is correct, so that's where organizations like us have to step it up and make the work environment enabling. So, for example, Renew has two women-led um, uh, sites um, out of many, but it's at least two, it's a good start. And we are replicating this model. These were pilots. And uh, we are showing, I guess, to our employees and to the sector and the industry that it's possible to have women uh, uh, manage sites remotely. You have to invest, as I said, in infrastructure, in safety, security, and all of that. We have an all-women security force in, on our sites as well. So these are small ways in which you can make statements about why it is inviting for us. Uh, now when I look at your topic, which is for fourth industrial revolution and smart workplaces at Renew, we have a woman-led digital lab. And um, so uh, does a woman do better than a male at the workplace? I feel we, I've always had the mindset that when you go to the workplace, when you go to a classroom, we are students. And uh, the best student does well. Often they are women, that's a different story. <laughs> and so to, I'm sure most of the men here agree as well. And when you go to the workplace, we are professionals. And I think women will do as well as they can, and that's the way it should be. Right. Now, um, what can we do to ensure that women don't dip and drop out of the workforce? I think that's an important uh, point. And I always talk about the fact that we, will not, we must not focus on just ensuring that women stay out of the workforce by giving them benefits, if mm. you know what I mean. So yeah. all of these things like long maternity leave, etc., is really not necessarily it's helpful, but not super helpful for women's career and retention at the workplace. Uh, it has to be about paternity. It's high time we talked about men taking on more at the workplace and uh, women taking on a little less at home so that they can then work at home and at work together. The burden is I think that's 50, going 50 to. And, at and, and at, uh, in the renewable energy space, there are lots of opportunities coming up, whether it is R&D. So now, you know, the perception is these are easier areas for women to work. And so be it. Right. But un enormous opportunities in R&D, in the fourth industrial revolution, in, um, you, know, um, you know, even on the sites, O&M, et cetera. I right. don't think there is a finance strategy. All of those areas remain because mm -hmm. companies are growing at an uh, incredible rate. We are going to be setting up 500 gigawatts of clean energy in our country. Right. So far, we've set, one, uh, set up 180 odd gig gigawatts which means what we've done till now, we're going to do three times that much more in the next seven years, perhaps a third Correct. of the time. Correct. So humongous number of opportunities, 10, 10 million jobs. You can, I mean, it is, it is an amazing opportunity for women to get engaged in and make a difference. At Renew, we have 40% women on our board. Wonderful to hear and that. And that really, I guess, is a, a way to kind of uh, lead the way. Uh, we employ about, so we have a diversity of about 17, 18%, which I'm working to get to about 30% by 2030. Okay. So small ways in which we are trying to do our bit. Yes, and small ways go a long way to, uh, to change things. Suparna, coming to you. Um, now you're you know, leading a company, a family business. You're the one that builds the culture. Give us a sense of what the journey has been like over the last two, three decades. Um, and of course, I must mention that textile is still a sector that employs a lot of women in India, especially as far as handwork is concerned, tailoring, sewing is concerned. Uh, you know, what are some of the challenges that women in the textile and apparel space face? And as a company, what are some of the initiatives you've taken to ensure that they stay in the workforce, they join the workforce, they don't drop out when life changes happen to them? Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, like, uh, you said thank you for including uh, all of us and me. Um, I think where the barriers are concerned, I'm going to stand uh, away and say that I haven't faced any barriers. 
And unlike my, uh, my father was very supported, uh, supportive, he was from the army, but I think mom really paved the way. She started the business and we weren't from a business family. Um, her biggest challenge was how do you raise funds? Um, and I think, Nena, what you said, I didn't see any glass ceilings. Growing up or being in the business, you know, you're growing the business, you're kind of first generation, even though I'm second generation. Uh, so I didn't really see any barriers. And it's interesting, my husband actually reports in to me, and I think it takes a very secure man, and this is for the men in the, the audience, I think men has, uh, have as much a part to play in this journey as women do. Um, with regard to the culture, I think what you really can do, and the only thing you can do is create a safe culture. And uh, all our factories are based out of Haryana. Now, Haryana is, still is where it is. So I think, you know, how do you take care of the women? How do you make sure that when they're going back, I never worry about the men when they're going back late. I always worry about the women. And I think as the head of the organization, and as you said, I think it is a top-down approach. So, you know, how do you create that culture and just keep it going as you grow? I think that's what organizations can do and must do. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's also talk a little bit about, you know, how you are all using emerging technologies. And um, at Boeing, of course, uh, Seema, we know that uh, a lot of integration of data is happening. A lot of artificial intelligence is being explored. Give us a sense of what's happening on the smart manufacturing ecosystem side and what is the role that women will play in taking this forward in the next decade? Yeah, before I get into that question, I just want to uh, support. So I, I'm grown up uh, in Haryana and Punjab. So one of the things I faced during my childhood is, hey, get into banking, get into teaching. And uh, then, you know, that is a safe job for women. Uh, but I was very clear. I want to get into engineering. And what I learned over that time frame is that if you're clear what you want, 50% of the job is done. Then you have to just convince people. And my parents and my husband was very supportive at every stage. Uh, for me today. Now coming to your question on the emerging technology of the AI machine learning, that's my core area. That's where I work in. And uh, I am confident this will, uh, these technologies like uh, Internet of Things, data analytics, AI machine learning will change the manufacturing world into a smart manufacturing. It will be, uh, the, you will see a lot of digitization, digitization happening. Uh, these days you are hearing about the digital transformation or automation happening. So how it will help uh, in this world is, first is the enhancing the efficiency. We will be able to enhance the efficiency by automating the manufacturing operations or engineering operations. And second is about uh, how can we improve the quality, for example. So AI machine learning algorithms can run, uh, you know, understand the patterns, understand the anomalies, and we'll be able to identify where the defects is. So it will be able to improve the quality. Or the predictive maintenance, like where uh, on the shop floor, uh, where you see that, you know, there is an uh, unplanned shutdown can happen. So we will be able to predict that well in advance. Or you think of the supplier uh, quality, right, supplier, where how you will be able to understand that, you know, there is a inventory needs or demand uh, forecasting. So, and now the question comes is how women can play a role. So one of my interesting thing is, uh, what is AI? AI is artificial intelligence. And from where this intelligence comes? From all of you, the natural intelligence, right? And when this comes from the natural in intelligence, so the models which should not be biased, you should have a diverse background against that. So that's where women brings a diverse knowledge and will be able to help the manufacturing sector. One, as a, uh, you know, you as a technical expert like me, you can develop solutions, you can build models. And second, at a leadership level, you will be, you would like, uh, you know, to build the policies uh, that, you know, th there is an adoption of smart manufacturing, for example. Or, you know, build the policies in terms of, like, these technologies are ethical in nature. So, in summary, women as well as AI machine learning will change the manufacturing world. Right, absolutely. Uh, Nena, you want to comment on that? We're talking about policy interventions. Of course, policies with respect to AI will take some time around the world to get developed because it's an evolving technology. Ethics is one area. Uh, Cybersecurity threats are another area. We have actually seen uh, crimes against women, even in the metaverse, now that we are exploring Web3 and new technologies. Uh, women's safety, even in the online spaces, is something that 
maybe not everyone in the industry is thinking about in as mainstream a manner as they should be. Um, so, you know, your thoughts on that and what can be done by industry as well as policymakers to ensure that even the online spaces in the new digital world, in the world of smart factories, are extremely safe and very, very inclusive for women. So, Mridu, this is such a raging issue, and I'm no expert on saying what needs to change, but I can certainly say it is an area which we, at every country level, are engaged in figuring out uh, what works, what doesn't, uh, privacy rules as they exist, and yes, absolutely, on how AI can help us track uh, what is bad, because the danger otherwise is countries begin to shut down things which are important. Uh, the social interaction which internet, uh, for example, enables is a big positive. Uh, the knowledge that you can use it for is a big positive. But to shut it down because there are concerns in terms of misuse is, would be the wrong thing to do. But AI could certainly help us make it a much more muscular offering and prevent against misuse and be able to provide that. I'd also say that just sitting on boards at a board level, uh, boards are struggling with how to use this. So the answers have to come in a much more bottoms up way. But what I'm pretty sure that we can use AI for in terms of at a board level, when we look at this, uh, safety and you know, I think uh, Seema certainly mentioned as well that we look at what is not working in a manufacturing setup, you can look at worker safety too in terms of what isn't happening and use AI to ensure that safety standards keep improving. And we can do it right through right now as we have to go to scope two, scope three, scope four. And the logistics chain that we establish, whether it is on the supply chain of raw material on the one hand or on the way we transport our goods, the learning that comes from the AI streaming, where you can, on the one hand, for sustainability, even today, through sensors, establish from where which tree or rayon is coming. And companies like Brilla have done this, all the way to the apparel that it manufactures. And it's branded. It's branded as a product which is safe in terms of sustainability, or you do it in the logistics chain in terms of the trucks, particularly in the kind of chains that we have in our country, which are not organized large logistics chains, lots of small truck suppliers. How does that safety norm work? I think are two very simple uh, solutions today. Right, right. And, um, you know, Kavita, if you want to add to that, we are, of course, uh, over yesterday and today, we are talking about smart manufacturing, Indian manufacturing moving towards uh, industrial IoT, connectivity, using data analytics in a big way. But as we envision these factories of the future, you know, what is it that we should be thinking about when it comes to gender? Uh, you know, the social infrastructure or the physical infrastructure that we are talking about, say, 10 years from now, how should a factory look uh, so that it empowers women in the workforce and enables them to participate as well as any other colleague? Yeah, so uh, I think the answer to it is not really very, um, uh, you know, easy. Okay, because we are just at a pace where uh, we are faced with so many different solutions whether it's from an IoT or ML, AI, there are many, many things which are available today, okay? And each industry is figuring out what's best for them, okay? We are still in that messy middle to really think because what is best for our business, for a certain kind of business may not be the one which is the fit for another business, okay? So in this conditions or in this kind of a thing, for uh, women, okay, to be, um, um, maybe I would say that for their uh, factories or for their business. How do we skill the women the way we skill the men? By giving equal opportunity. That is the most important piece right now. Okay, because both of them ha have that, um, uh, you know, background to take it ahead. I think that's the most important piece which we should do right now. And then it becomes very, very easy. 
you know, both using the techniques and both using the different kind of solutions in the same way, you know, to the advantage of business. Because finally, we are in the, uh, you know, we always say business about business is business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we are coming to work, it's that we are coming to make the business successful. Correct. Okay, so by giving an equal opportunity to both the gender in terms of skilling them in this newer technologies, which is best for the business, will take, in, take that next step. Right. And talking about skilling, um, Suparna, where are you in your digitalization journey as far as Sarita Handa Exports is concerned? Uh, and of course, you know, family businesses tend to take a little longer to get onto the bandwagon as far as new age technologies are concerned. Uh, you know, give us a sense of where you are in that journey and on the skilling front, uh, you know, what more should be done for women in the textile and apparel space to ensure that uh, they are able to really reach the top of the ladder. So, you know, it's interesting. It's a battle that I constantly have because on one side we talk about technology and on the other side what makes India what India is, is the hand of the artisan. And I see these fancy computer embroidery machines now that can emulate, you know, Zardozi and can emulate the uh, handwork. And it's far cheaper in some sense. So I'm always, and our goal 2025 is X percentage of our revenue has to come from the hand of the artisan. So it is a balance. The places where we are using technology a lot is, of course, in processes. It's in inventory management. It is even in design. Uh, you know, how do you use more CAD, um, uh, basically more aided design. Those are the areas that we are pushing technology. But otherwise, it is a battle that I struggle with because at one sense, textiles is the largest employer uh, of the, you know, other than agriculture. So it is a fine balance. And I think in our organization, we are finding that balance. Um, but does it worry you that there will be a large scale displacement of artisans? Because, you know, with AI coming in, we've all been talking a lot about loss of jobs, etc., uh, in different sectors and different segments of manufacturing. But uh, again, like you said, India is famous for its handwork, its zardozi, its kantha, its chicken curry, and various other, you know, textile-related uh, arts. Uh, what, on, on the ground, what are you seeing? Are you seeing artisans getting displaced by these new age technologies, which are cheaper than handwork? So I do. I am seeing it. And it's interesting. I talk a lot to our workforce. And it's interesting to see that their children don't want to come into this industry. So it is a balance. And I think it's organizations like ourselves and others. I think the apparel industry, I, I have to give credit to the wedding industry in India. You know, it does keep it alive. And I'm hoping that as Indians and what makes India, India and what makes our manufacturing what it makes it, uh, that's one of the reasons we're still a player against China. It is a lot to do with what we uh, bring in terms of our techniques and, you know, just the handwork. So um, I would say that organizations need to find their balance. So for ourselves, we are exploring it. I would be lying if I said it's not, technology is not something we're looking at. But then in everything that we use tech, we try to use an element of the hand. Uh, so I think uh, companies have a large responsibility towards that. Right, absolutely. Uh, well, Vaishali, coming to you, you know, how are you harnessing data as far as your company is concerned? What sort of, you know, dashboards, data dashboards do you have as a C-suite leader guiding you forward? Uh, a number of companies are now using diversity dashboards to ensure that the company grows in a more holistic manner. Uh, is that something you all are considering? And uh, what's the next goalpost as far as tech is concerned, uh, harnessing tech is yeah. concerned? No, I, mean, I think uh, we are at a stage where I think fourth industrial revolution is, uh, you know, kind of uh, taking over and we are uh, very engaged and uh, have adopted, uh, we have a digital lab, our own digital lab, which we started about four or five years ago in anticipation of uh, the need to um, shift to this. And as uh, some of the co-panelists mentioned that it's not only um, you know, um, increases efficiency. It is good for even us from um, the point of view of operating from a sustainability uh, point of view. It helps save, uh, save uh, waste. So we've saved 40% of our waste by monitoring and utilizing, uh, you know, um, our digital lab services. We've increased our 
uh, efficiency in our generation by uh, about 2%. We have decreased our cost by 17%. So with all these metrics, it's a no-brainer. So we started small, but now we are scaling up. We are already like four or five times of where we were earlier. Uh, we've uh, been recognized by the World Economic Forum as a lighthouse. Um, and it was very interesting the first time. So for us, uh, I guess it renews always a little bit about doing things a little bit in a pioneering way, taking the risk, etc. cetera. So, um, um, you know, um, there was no format for a lighthouse for renewable energy players because we don't operate in a factory situation. We operate in sites which are far away with, you know, turbines, etc., all spread out. So we worked with the World Economic Forum during COVID to identify a model to, um, to recognize uh, lighthouses in our sector. And so, and, and we won it twice now, the only renewable energy company to win it twice. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer for us. It is uh, basically, you know, we can manage, predict our problems better, which saves us millions of dollars. Um, as I said, you know, it's also good for the supply chain to be able to monitor, to be able to predict, etc. So I can see, and, you know, this uh, whole AI in our sector is predicted to grow at a CAGR of about 28%. So we are very committed to it and are perhaps the first movers in this area in our sector. Right, right. absolutely. Um, well, Nena, I want to come to you with the, the people angle that we just touched upon with Suparna uh, and the fact that, you know, industries like textile or industries that are extremely labor intensive will see large scale displacement in the next couple of years as more and more factories get automated and become smarter, so to speak. Um, What's the solution? Like, you know, uh, we are not skilling our people at the pace at which technology is going to overthrow them. Um, at least certain kinds of jobs, the mundane repetitive work that humans do and which can be easily automated is going to get automated because it makes business sense. Um, what then is the solution to find that balance of having people still employed and not going into a situation of large scale unemployment in a country like India? Well, I guess we'll have to rely on the service sector, right? Because it, no matter which industry uh, I look at, and you know, through my career, I've engaged with pretty much every industry, the manufacturing sectors have only just begun to employ less and less people. And I'm now finding that even in packaging lines, we are going to robotics because of quality control or you know, umpteen other reasons, just uh, ease of managing maybe, which is sad but true. And so you could have, you know, 50,000 crores of investment and employ 200 people to run that plant. And it's pretty much there across the process sector. So is manufacturing going to be our next employment haven? Probably not. Does it provide some employment down the line in terms of suppliers and all? Yes. But in the sheer quantum of job creation, it is the service sector. And therefore, maybe, and if it's true, as Satya Nadella said, that in the AI world, 25% of AI is happening in India. While AI itself and technology may displace people, including women from jobs, if we become the AI supplier to the world, maybe we do benefit. But it is going to be about just transitions. The people who go are going to be lower skilled or skilled differently to the skills we need. So we are going to have to help the nation move along that path. And Sarita, I love everything that you guys do. And of course, what we do in Thank India you. in terms of uh, uh, the labor uh, and artisan work that comes through. And I think, I hope that the rest of the world still pays a premium. We never did in our country, but pays a premium for handwork. So if we can just position it in a way that, where machines can't replace it even better, but even where they can, that that premium remains, I hope that we can keep this amazing trades of ours alive. And I promise that we're working towards it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, it's election year. Uh, the full budget is around the corner. So as women stakeholders of Industry 4.0, you know, I want to hear a wish list, one wish from each of you uh, on the upcoming budget. What sort of a policy intervention can we have uh, to ensure that more and more women join the manufacturing workforce. Any quick thoughts on that? Uh, why don't we start with you, Vaishali? 
Well, I think um, it'll be, I don't, I don't like to say make things mandatory, but I think to have a certain percentage of women, especially in our sector, in the workforce is critical. So if we can, um, yeah, perhaps have a mandatory requirement of uh, more women as we transition, um, that'll be good. Expectations from the full budget? Nena. Well, budgets don't give too much on this front, uh, and they shouldn't. But I would just say that if we were to do or encourage more gender budgeting, both as a nation and at a company level, uh, we would achieve a lot because at least reporting bad data would make some of us hang uh, our heads in shame. Right. What about you, Seema? Yeah, I, uh, I would like to see, like you, if you have heard about our Boeing Sukanya program, right? So it is uh, uh, supporting a lot of women pilots trainings and, uh, uh, and uh, even at every phase of the girl stage uh, career phase, uh, either the early education where we have opened uh, uh, the STEM labs uh, for uh, the tier two and tier three towns where you have around 75,000 students who can, uh, you know, participate and mainly focused on the 60% uh, on the women. And uh, our Honorable Prime Minister uh, has re uh, asked our uh, CEO, Mr. Dave Kalun, that, you know, if he can assist uh, the women pilots' growth. And uh, I would like to see more women. And uh, that's where the Boeing Sukanya program comes and making sure that we have uh, the work, like, you know, the digital products for them to train or the flight simulators for them and also focused on their, not only that they're getting into this and but the focus on the retention as well. Right. Yeah. Right. So lots more women flying higher and higher for sure. Uh, Kavita. Yeah. So I think uh, what is my expectation is when you when we really look at the latest World Economic Forum report, India is very, very poorly behind. We are placed 121st in almost like 150 um, uh, countries, yeah. which they benchmark in terms of the equity and uh, 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 gender equity. So long, long way to go. And if you have to reduce distances, it's said that almost more than 150 years plus or maybe even 200 years it will take if you have to go somewhere at the f equity level or a 50-50 equity. Then in that case, things have to get mandated. Okay, and if there is a mandate in the budget at various whatever in the industries, where do you stand in terms of women representation? A mandate first need to come in. Okay, and with that mandate, I'm sure that then every, it becomes a priority mm -hmm. for everyone. And then everyone tries to make that mandate successful. Mm -hmm. And that... And to make that mandate successful, it's not only about numbers, because the business needs to get succeed. And that's how, uh, you know, they will ensure that women are equally skilled, women have, everything will happen as a complete, uh, you know, e eco structure in that way. So I think my expectation is somewhere there should be some kind of a mandate. Some kind of a mandate? Yeah. Absolutely. Suparna? So it's interesting, both Vishali and Kavita have spoken about the mandate. Uh, I would say that there is Skill India, but Skill India with a focus towards women. Mm. And I think there is a lot that can be done in that space. And organizations are doing it, but I think more towards that would definitely help. Absolutely. Ladies, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Clearly, a lot more needs to be done for women in the manufacturing space and women in the workforce in general. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your incredible ideas and insights and uh, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Now, that was a power-packed session. I'd request you all to please stay back for a quick photo op. Well, thank you once again, and that certainly, like I said, was a great session, and as we absorb all that insightful wisdom, it's time for us to grab a quick bite. It's time for us uh, to have lunch. See you all shortly. Thank you.
host, Swati Shahi, with a hearty round of applause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024. Well, for our next session, let me bring in some data points that sets context for this session. Um, India's thriving mobile phone manufacturing sector is set to generate 1.5 to 2.5 lakhs of jobs in the next 12 to 16 months, which is driven by government initiatives and a global surge in mobile users. India is also projected to produce 1,250 million handsets by 2025, fueling a $230 billion industry. And well, to discuss this and more, we have our next session on India on the Rise, dominating mobile and IT hardware manufacturing. And to moderate this session, may I please invite on stage Ashmit Kumar, Deputy Editor, CNBC TV 18, and his panel of industry experts. Let's have them on stage with a round of applause. Josh Fulger, he's the President, Zetwork. Arendra Saxena, CPO, Ather Energy. Ishtiaq Ahmed, Senior Advisor, Industry and Foreign Investment, ETIO. Vinod Sharma, MD, Deki Electronics, and Sembian V, Chief Supply Chain Officer at Tejas Networks. Can we please have all of them on stage? afternoon uh, to everyone. I think we have with us uh, uh, a formidable panel. I think a lot of industry participants uh, who can throw more light on a completely new dynamic that uh, the electronic space is now dealing with. We are looking at uh, completely changed timelines, completely changed perceptions, completely changed aspirations. Uh, and in no small part because of, of course, how the government has enabled this push uh, a lot of aspects that are up for consideration. We'll try to address all of them. We'll try to speak to all of our participants on that. Uh, let's first begin with uh, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you so much for this. I, I, <laughs> I just wanted to build on some of the conversations we were having backstage where we, you were talking about how the PLI has become the buzzword. I think everyone is talking about it. Uh, there's so much energy as far as the PLI momentum is concerned. Uh, let me come to you on what went in into coming about with this new scheme, what was the thought process, and also importantly, from a forward-looking perspective, what will this transform into, what will it do for the Indian electronics manufacturing space? Thank you very much. So as far as PLI is concerned, uh, I try to explain it in perspective. So we had the MEIS scheme, and that scheme had to be discontinued. So there was availability of funds. Yeah. So there was availability of funds, and the uh, idea was how to use it. So whether we should uh, utilize the resources very thinly across the tariff line, or we should have the concentrated approach. So idea which came into fruition was like this. You go into the areas of core competency and cutting and technology, bet for size and scale, and also penetrate into the global value chains. So underlying purpose was that achieve the manufacturing efficiency so that you can penetrate into the global market, which can happen only if you have size and scale. Now I can briefly tell sector after sector how it was conceptualized, how it achieved the larger purpose of penetrating into the global value chains. For instance, uh, you look at the electronic sector mobile manufacturing. Only limited number of players were selected and incentive is given if the phone is above uh, 15,000 rupees so that we are incentivizing the right kind of product and also it goes into the export markets. Look at uh, the textile. It was only for the technical textiles and the MML. In pharmaceutical sectors, we had dependency on bulk drugs APIs and also dependency on the medical devices. And now the next PLIs is also not for the genetic medicine, but for the 
those medicines where we can have the higher revenue by exporting the product. So sector after sector, the idea was to build size and scale, get into the manufacturing efficiencies, so that by being efficient in the manufacturing, we can export the overseas market. Otherwise, you will not be able to protect even our domestic market. So, so far, if we see more than $10 billion, uh, 10 billion of uh, investment has already been achieved, and over 100 billion of production has already taken place in the country. That is what the success of this PLI scheme has been. And if you look at the electronic sector, we have been exporting mobile phones, which were largely imported. Thank you. I think that's a big, big push that the government gave, and you mentioned that uh, I think the imports have dropped for mobiles, and simultaneously we have industry aspirations looking at exports, uh, and that is expected to be the next leg of growth uh, for the Indian industry. Mr. Folger, uh, let me come to you. Uh, from the government to the private sector, uh, you're an accomplished player in this space, uh, and uh, curtsy this morning's announcement, you're also the man of the hour. Uh, let me get your perspective in on this. As far as the electronics manufacturing space is concerned, uh, tell us about this pivot that we've seen in the last couple of years, and where is it taking us as we move ahead in this journey? So uh, before I start, uh, thanks again for the introduction. Um, I want to say that, you know, the, en the ed edges of this, uh, this beautiful panel here is Indian IP, manufacturing and, and uh, hardcore component manufacturing. So all of these things are ingredients of a pivot. And the key man is sitting to your right who has made all of this happen. You know, Mr. Ahmed, you know, government policy the last 10 years has been so instrumental in, in, in getting, giving us this, this opportunity. So I want to say that this pivot, which we are talking about in this industry, uh, I'm borrowing this from somebody else. I don't want to quote him on stage here. But I think this is, we are, we are reaching a Y2K moment for Indian electronics hardware manufacturing, the ESDM space. And so clearly, uh, this pivot, what I hope, and maybe I'm, 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 I'm uh, uh, saying something out of context here, but in the electronic supply chain, me, Symbian, uh, Harendra, we, we actually plan around the lunar new year. So one week, nothing happens, and you've got to plan ahead. Inventory spikes up. You know, his blood pressure spikes up along with that. So I'm hoping that with this pivot, very soon we'll have Diwali as a planning factor. So you plan, so the global supply chains have to plan for Diwali. And uh, so that's the pivot. See, I think uh, to answer your question, um, see, India is, uh, is, a, is a full full stack player. Mm -hmm. we, we start IP, which is being creating, created in, in very advanced and, and, and safety security areas. Uh, we have manufacturing today, which is, uh, I'll say, not yet in, in, in terms of numbers, but, but I think we are starting to see scale mm -hmm. with some mega clusters emerging in the southern part of the country and in NCR here. We have uh, components, you know, LMEC components, uh, you know, which Zetwork uh, itself uh, specializes, and uh, you know, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, actives and passives, uh, you know, which which we know this in. So I think we have a full play, and I think by the end of the decade, I really anticipate. Uh, with the progressive policies coming from the government in areas like semiconductor and beyond, we will definitely be able to enable this as a pivot. I think you've touched upon a very interesting subject. I was referring to the semiconductor. Uh, even as we speak, I think shortly from now, uh, our railway telecom IT minister, Mr. Vaishnav, will be addressing uh, a press conference where he will is expected to, at least that's the story that we put out in CNBC, he's expected to uh, make an, a stellar announcement as far as semiconductors is concerned. We'll come to that in just a bit. But uh, Mr. Folger, like you mentioned, on the far end uh, of this panel, we have uh, Indian IP. Uh, let's go across to them, Mr. Semyon. Let me begin with you. Uh, just prior to this discussion, we were talking about how uh, there are a lot of interesting policy levers that the government seems to have used. 
uh, PLI being, of course, clearly one of them, Mr. Ahmed, the architect of PLI here in India. Uh, Mr. Semyon, just to give sense as to how these policy levers and these policy messages that are being sent out is being sought to be leveraged to ensure more innovation, more production, more manufacturing. Yeah. Um, see, PLA is a scheme, as Mr. Hamad was saying also, right? It's a, it has brought in a lot of momentum into the industry in the last few years, what we have seen. I myself used that in my earlier industry and the organization, got benefit for the organization also. So that uh, said, is five-year PLA enough? Those questions keep coming. But that's one of the things even government has been very clear saying, this is a kickstart that's being given to the industry. And whatever the cost disabilities are to be managed with this have to be brought down with appropriate right steps. So on capitalizing on these things, we need to take the right steps in kind of creating the ecosystem. But are we there? Where are we on those elements? That have to be detailed out more, and there could be more uh, support needed also. Uh, because uh, on, the, on the ecosystem development in each of the industry, starting from automotive to mobile to other electronic industry, will be very different. So we need to understand the fundamentals of those and start working towards that. Is five years enough or not is something we'll have to see, but at least we'll have to start now and see where we end up at the fifth year and work on that. Correct. It's clearly an evolving conversation. But uh, from one leg of this manufacturing in India to the other, we've talked about uh, policy levers being used by the government. Uh, but on the other end uh, of this panel uh, to Indian IP, uh, Mr. Saxena, let me come to you. The other leg clearly has been Atman Nirbharta making in India. Uh, tell us about your journey in terms of localization and how that strategy is working for you in terms of global competitiveness. Sure. Thanks. Thanks to Zitwork and also the all panelists. Um, to specific, I come from Aether Energy. It's a wonderful organization. We make electric mobility, electric scooters, first in India, in some sense, first in the world. Uh, to answer specific, like uh, we are proudly uh, announced to various government officials as well as international forums, uh, we are 92% localized. Uh, if you exclude the sales, that's a huge localization effort in the last four or five years. Um, of course, this is 92, a little bit up and down, mainly because of the commodity fluctuations. Um, but if you go a little bit one step ahead, a little bit deeper localization, we are not there. We are around 65, 62. Of course, we are much ahead of many others. Many others are following us. So that's to answer you. So we have, we have a gap between the tier one localization and of course, a deeper step, tier two, tier three localization, which is around 65, 62%. Interesting. Uh, this journey, as far as localization is concerned, just a follow-up question on that, in terms of uh, what it will take. You mentioned that the value addition is north of 90%. Uh, what it will take to assimilate into the global value chains using this strategy of localization? Absolutely. It's a very, very good answer. A very good question. Sorry. I don't know whether I can justify with a good answer. Um, actually, the, um, the, in the context of how deep you do localization, uh, it always helps to innovative companies, innovative ideas. You know, uh, I'll take example of, let's say, uh, between in Semicon, if you are choosing whether I should do a fab or I should do a back end. Obviously, I, I will prefer to have a fab in India more than back end. Uh, if I have to integrate technology, the innovations, what we do uh, on uh, whether uh, body controls, battery controls, navigations, you know, OTAs, everything, it has to be integrated to the real electronics at the design level, at the manufacturing level, to like we have uh, almost 1,000 engineers working. Many of them have done many things first time in the world. So uh, that needs a very deeper and key process integration and localization. That's my take. I, I also take examples in front of steel makers. Uh, do you want to make steel for construction or you want to make steel for high application, like silicon steel or something, which is a very high value? The same thing applies to many other areas. You know, That's, uh, Even uh, there was a discussion just before that we have almost all automobiles are on display now, you know? So do we have to make a choice whether we do the chemical etching process of the glass, which is the key content of that, 
as compared to somebody who's just assembling that. So just, I'm sorry, I, it doesn't make sense, I don't know. Uh, let me, in fact, uh, take that question across to Mr. Sharma as well. Mr. Sharma, uh, you come from a space that has seen stellar growth uh, the last uh, 36 months. Uh, we're talking about the IT mobile space. Give us a sense, same question, in terms of ensuring localization and then using this strategy uh, for greater assimilation with the global value chains. Uh, thank you, Ashmit. First of all, uh, CNBC and Zetwork for having me here. Uh, Yes, yeah, so we've been in electronics manufacturing in India for 40, this is our 40th year. Uh, and what I see playing out is uh, absolutely phenomenal. So let me take a minute or two to sort of uh, lay that, uh, that ground as I understand it. Electronics uh, hardware as well, it's the largest manufacturing industry in the world. At the moment, if you put a figure to it, it's about 2.8 trillion. You divide that by the population of the world, 7 billion you're looking at a $400 per capita consumption of electronics. And what we mean by electronics is changing as we speak. Sure. Uh, our friend here from Aether, who I'm a proud supplier of, uh, of chargers to you. Thank you. I, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't be discussing electronics in two-wheelers uh, four or five years ago, right? So you made it happen, and uh, you know, fantastic company, of course. Uh, so we are, uh, electronics is everywhere now. The choice that India had, and, and that $400 per capita in India today, is $100 per capita only. In the last five years, we've come from $50 to $100. I don't think anything should stop us from aspiring to be at least the world average of $400. And that means that our own consumption of electronics is bound to go up by four times in four years. Uh, that's the figure, that's the vision of our own ministry, uh, that's the vision of Neeti. So that's talking from $100 billion, $120 billion going up to $400 billion together. And then this is a globally integrated value chain, this whole business. No one country can say that we own the entire electronics supply chain anywhere in the world. When that happens, it means that some out of that $400 billion will automatically get exported. Now, it depends on our policy, it depends on our aspiration, what percentage would that share be? But having said that, uh, I think this race has just begun for India. Uh, our rightful place with 1.4 billion people is exactly the same numbers that China has today. We should be having the same. There is no reason why we should be any short, and that's $1 trillion. So before we get there, however, I look, the, look at this as a, a 4 into 400 meter relay. Uh, what Ishtiaq Ahmed Saab and the government of India has triggered is that in that first leg of 400 meters, we suddenly are now getting noticed. Mm -hmm. We want to be having this conversation, but for some of that government push that came. Mm -hmm. So we are saying, hey, you know what? Suddenly we were an importer of uh, phones. Now we are a world-class assembler of phones and to some extent an exporter of phones. The second leg deals with but you won't win this race till you're not a grounds-up manufacturer, designer, a brand owner of this. The second leg is something that we have to play a, a bigger role today, which is the components part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the PLI can get you assembly into India, in, at least in the electronic sector. Uh, at the sunset of PLI, whenever that comes, and obviously all of us will try to push it as far away as possible, but, uh, but whenever that comes, we will be asking ourselves questions, are we here to assemble something because we get four, five, six percent from the government? Or are we here because we have the markets here and we have the suppliers here? And that will be a good question to ask. So the second leg of what we hope, as soon as the new government comes in, we will start discussing in greater detail, is how do we begin to make the components? The beauty of that, all of you uh, who are similar in age to me or older, will remember that 30, 35 years ago, we were making all these components in India. Uh, all the televisions, the black and whites, the audios, were made here with our own picture tubes, our own flyback transformers, our own PCBs. But then several policies, including the ITA-1 policy, rendered a very uh, a sort of a fatal blow to that industry. Manufacturers turned into traders. Fortunately, so what we are trying to do, make no mistake, is for the first time we are trying to be a globally competitive manufacturer in a zero-duty regime. There is no protection. At the moment, mobile phones has a duty, but several components that I'm talking about no duty. The third leg will be the design, the IP, which is we have to run like in a relay race. You start warming up parallelly and the baton will get shifted. The focus will shift a little bit to the design. And the fourth leg, in my opinion, will be when Indian brands, the Zetworks of the world, will become global champions. And like today we recognize a Sony, a Samsung, or Panasonic, we will begin to recognize Indian brands that are sold to households all over the world. And not just households, it will be automobile industry, etc. And not to forget this just last one point, which is also to me uh, very, very important to our discussion, is that uh, the way technology is changing. So today, electronics, as I started by saying, if you take just one example of energy, uh, loosely we are going to build up generating capacity equivalent to what we built in the last 75 years. 
We need to do that in the next five, six years, just to meet our own demands. Now, will we do it the fossil fuel way? No, obviously not. There is a climate issue. So we will do it in a new way, which is uh, generative, uh, you know, uh, uh, solar, wind, hydrogen. All of that will need a lot of electronics because there will be no generation without it. So people sitting on this panel today are going to play a role in generation of electricity, in its storage, in its uh, transmission, uh, distribution, and finally the application of electricity in many other things, much beyond what we know today. Uh, so I always tell people, don't look at electronics as a vertical. It's not. It's a horizontal. It will cut across everything. In the last one week, I've been invited to Construction Equipment Association because they use a lot of electronics today. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop with that, but I think, like I said, the race is just beginning to warm up. Uh, uh, there is one regret that I, at least I was born two decades too early, uh, but, but Josh, is, uh, Josh is young, so he's got to go longer than I do. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me then ask you a follow-up question. You've given a multiple legs uh, to the journey that we're likely to see in the next few years. Uh, one aspect of this journey, of course, uh, in terms of localization, value addition, the push that the government is clearly giving is towards having more foundries here for semiconductors. Uh, that's clearly a distinct push. Uh, just the news trigger from today where the government is likely to approve uh, various foundries here in India, ATMPs, OSATs as well. Uh, just give us uh, some color as to what contribution and what role this will play in terms of furthering this manufacturing drive forward. Yeah, so uh, just again, if I have a couple of minutes. So, you know, I was reading the other day, uh, and I always just wonder where did the word manufacturing come from? Mm -hmm. And it comes from manus, Latin, which means hands. Uh, and we are the only species that has a thumb that makes us actually use our hands in very different ways from any other living being, you know, any other species. And that's how we are able to manufacture something. And then you are talking about spot manufacturing, digital manufacturing. And the word digital, again, comes from digits, which is fingers in Latin, mm -hmm. because uh, fingers were used for counting. So the moment you added this whole layer of uh, algorithm software, our friends in the IT, uh, we started coming up with this whole smart manufacturing thing. Now, if you look at it from this digital manufacturing perspective, uh, or this smart manufacturing perspective, uh, where are we headed, right? I mean, uh, uh, what, what can we, uh, uh, what, what can we uh, aim at in the next, uh, next uh, few years? Is, uh, I'm sorry, I think I lost, in my chain of thought, I lost the question. Uh, so what is that if you uh, We just wanted, I just wanted some color as to what uh, role local foundry semiconductor okay. inputs yeah, yeah. So, yeah. will play in the electronics sure, yeah. industry. So I think, uh, while I was talking of the hands and, and the fingers, what is very, very important is this animal spirit that goes after this manufacturing. And when the PLI came, a lot of us and a lot of our people who were in the bureaucracy, who were in the government, who had given up on IT hardware, they told people like us, don't waste your time, you're not good at, you can't globally manufacture, focus on software, hardware we'll import from somewhere else. Now, those people were told that, no, 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 we can, we have a way of being, so the belief system got, got changed. The mindset's got changed saying we can't do it. When you have a foundry being announced this evening, I hope, I think what it does is it appeals to your heart. And you say, look, this was the piece that was missing. There are several missing pieces, but this is the biggest one. Everybody in the world told us you can't do it. So I think just to get that belief system going, the government is putting $10 billion behind it. But I don't think it's just the money. It's the fact that uh, technology companies, uh, you know, we are doing a lot of design in this country for others. Fabulous design is here. We are doing chip designing for others. We are doing product designing for others. It's a fantastic time for us to come together. And to me, that one or two or three fabs, uh, eight or 10 OSATs, uh, 20, 30 ATMPs, and several other components, not to, not to only be carried away by semiconductor piece, what that will mean in the next three, four years is that we have truly arrived on the scene of smart manufacturing for the world. Uh, since we are talking about supply chains, Mr. Forger, let me also get you in on this, uh, that when we look at... Uh, this push that is coming into the Indian manufacturing space. Uh, give us some sense uh, as to what it will take from the private sector perspective, from a government perspective, when we talk about building scalable, uh, quality-driven, cost-competitive value chains in India. Now, I think uh, <clears throat> kind of building on what Vinod said at this uh, four-legged relay, mm -hmm. um, over the last 10 years, I've seen a very consistent government push and it's been very consultative and that's very encouraging you know for us so the second leg the manufacturers have come and today you know i can tell you maybe 50 percent of the global value chains and a starting point of domestic value chains are feeling confident 
about sourcing from India. Harendra talked about 92%. And that's a new category, EV product. Mm -hmm. I don't know Sembian's number. He will later say that. It, it's it's equally, equally getting there, right? So manufacturing and, and even the third, like the supply chain we are starting, uh, you know, to get there. Uh, now, I think the crowning glory will, will, will really be when we have an Indian brand, you know, which comes, comes there. And all of these things start to sync up together. All these four legs, uh, you know, sort of sync up together and we start to hit some, you know, world-class times, right? The challenge we have is that in Olympics, there is a, or when, when in athletics, um, there is Asian Games level and then there is Olympics level. Um, Asian Games, India won an incredible 123 medals. I may be wrong, a little slightly off there, but Olympics, we will see this year in a couple of months. We will see. The challenge in electronics is that Asian Games are a little tougher than Olympics because most of the, the competitors are Asian players. So it's not easy, and they're all moving. They're all moving fast. Uh, and so, but India, I think, has a unique proposition of being a, a full-spectrum talent pool. And I think that's going to be the difference. India is 1.4 billion strong, and I mean it. And, but we have to believe in it together to make it happen. So we have top talent who are able to manage it. We have top engineers who can design, control the process. We have technicians and supervisors who are able to program, maintain, monitor, excel. And then we have the associates who are going to be really, you know, the, the hands which, you know, all the cobots, depending on the process. So I think this, the differentiator in this, you know, this relay race, which Vinod talks about, I think is going to be our ability to bring all of this together. This 1.4 billion strong. And I'm so happy that the government has, has understood that manufacturing cannot be 14%. It has to be 25%. And it's going to be a journey, but, but I think we are, we are very, very strongly poised to go on that journey. Well, we certainly have a short-footed start. Uh, Mr. Sembian, uh, let me come to you. We've had, uh, through this conversation, uh, a very uh, a layered approach being given as to what the road ahead looks like. Uh, but that, of course, is in the longer term. In the near term, in the short term, in the next, with the horizon of, let's say, the next two to three years, Mr. Sembian, what are the low-hanging fruits uh, which will yield the kind of benefits and the results that we should be aspiring towards, that the industry should be aspiring towards? Yeah. <clears throat> Some of the points were touched upon by my co-panel friends. Um, see, one straight away, right, as our title says, India on the rise. And that's the right moment to, be, to capitalize on. And uh, we need to have the... Uh, right steps, as I said earlier, each of the uh, industry uh, players should take and move forward with their investments and stuff. So, like for example, um, we take, for automotive as an industry is like well deep rooted, like decades ago what started in India. And I was part of automotive also then. When uh, the component supplies were developed, the component ecosystem was developed, the, way, the point where we start with them is saying that you start now and soon become a global supplier for that same organization doing all these things, certain compliance requirements, KPI requirements, everything. So to get that, every uh, component supplier was vying for it and they developed for it and that's how the automotive industry over a decade and two, they developed and they are deep rooted today. We're exporting across the globe today from here. Similarly on the electronics, the component ecosystem as I said earlier, need scale. The scalability requirement in the electronics component ecosystem is huge. And for that to happen, all the brands, all the OEMs have to have an outward looking strategy of exports also as what Josh was saying, right? Um, but to do that, we need to have the right uh, foundations sure. where we need to have one of the key things for that is, of course, you have the capability to scale. 
one that is side and as a very important factor is the quality mm -hmm. which as indian manufacturers we have to take cognizant of and that doesn't start anywhere in the supply chain it starts in the design room that realization is very very important mm -hmm. today most of the people understand quality as a end thing okay on the production line we take care of it but starts in the design room and the kind of investment, then it calls for investments in the R&D, mm -hmm. the design areas, what Mr. Sharma was saying. Those are all very, very important. We have to do there, get the capabilities of all the testing uh, requirements, uh, accelerated life testing, so that you get your product to the fullest quality. That's very, very important. And then it follows through the supply chain. Of course, we have to sustain that through the supply chain and give the right product quality to the industry, to the world. Obviously, that will be taken too. That's a very important step which uh, each of the organization have to understand to your earlier question also. On the PLI things, these are the benefits which, uh, these benefits have to be put back into that, invest, and then move forward. Fair enough. Uh, looking at the near term, uh, let me come across to you as well, Mr. Sixena, uh, that when we talk of changes that we're likely to see in the near term, with the near term horizon, uh, very recently we heard of how Apple may not be continuing with its electric vehicle. Uh, you think that is an outlier and that on the way forward, this boundary that exists between the world of auto and electronics is likely to, again, phase out where there's likely to be maybe greater synergies between the two spaces? Uh, well, I cannot speak for Apple. Somebody else can. <laughs> but um, the uh, synergy with electrification of automotive is very, very high with electronics. Um, I think uh, if I take the bomb of any electric vehicle, whether it's car or two-wheeler or even three-wheeler, the, the number one comes as a cells, probably uh, energy sourcing, what you call it, whether cells or some other alternate fuel, um, and then comes electronics. And electronics, uh, both electronics and cells, you need to educate if you're a pioneer. Like if you're doing it first time, you need to teach science and art and fine art of manufacturing or subtle changes in production. In fact, we can give some examples when we developed cell suppliers all over the world. Um, the same suppliers were followed, everybody else followed in India, whether it's a four-wheeler or two-wheeler, others, they all followed. And then some who don't, didn't follow, they had problems, actually. So whether we want to think about developing these two, three domains, which are key for EV, like if I take a bomb of like uh, whatever, like X, and if you're 40, 50% of the bomb is these two, three areas, electronics or something, why not, to, why not to do it in India? The key processes, as rightly said by Vinod, then I come back to that point, you have a choice, like you want to make a $10 wafer, 24 nano, or a five and sub five dollar wafer with 100, 100 US dollars per wafer. And uh, you, you have to decide, like, you know, and, and what will happen if you're making $100 wafer, you have the pioneer technologies, whether EV or probably AI or certain upcoming industries, they're gonna, they're gonna learn together, actually. You know, not, not the middlemen will not come in between. So that's my two, two cents for that. Great, uh, let's now shift our focus towards uh, what a forward looking uh, policy framework may look like. And Mr. Ahmed, uh, I will have to come to you on that. Uh, today we're here discussing smart manufacturing. Uh, we've seen, I think, consensus within the panelists that uh, the start has been very sure footed courtesy policy in initiatives such as the PLI. Uh, from a policy perspective, uh, what is perhaps the next lever that the government is looking at when we talk of introducing smart manufacturing and ensuring a smooth migration and adoption of new strategies, Industry 4.0? Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, he, Vinod mentioned about the PLI and how long it will continue. Just to clarify that PLI does have a sunset class, and largely it has been kept for a period of five years because uh, the government decided that it will not be desirable to perennially support uh, manufacturing because ultimately benefit is to be given for a limited period of time. After that, they have to be competitive. But he also mentioned about uh, how to go deep into deep manufacturing. That's the area I would like to touch a bit. So if you look at India, what is attracting investors to India? So I have certain uh, points to mention that uh, we are the fastest uh, growing large economy, 6.7% on an average, while the rest, is, uh, rest of the world is below 4%. 
the young demography, median age of around 29 years, so unprecedented in investment in uh, uh, infrastructure, logistics cost is uh, improving. Then we have probably the most uh, liberal FDI policy regime in the country. Lots of FDI is coming in the country. And there has been the tax reform, the, the GST which has been introduced, and India is now a single common economic market. So these are the, these are the features which provide India so much of resilience, and investors get attracted to India. But when it comes to the manufacturing, our manufacturing is around $450 billion. When you look at China, they are around 28% of the global manufacturing, around $5 trillion, and they, they are they are everywhere. So we have a lots of space to grow. And why we are so less? Because we are not participating in the global value chain. Look at the countries which are there in the manufacturing space. Whether it is the China, even USA, Germany, Korea, Japan, they all participate in the value chains. So if you look at the uh, electronics uh, sector, it's a $4 trillion sector and 75% of the products are the GVC items. And as you mentioned rightly, so far the PLI has been only in the space of assembly, but we need to get into the deeper manufacturing, and that would be possible if we participate into the global value chains. That's the area we have identified two areas we are working on that. One is the electronic sector, because 75% of the items are at the GVC items. That is where we have to look at. And because of the sheer character of the GVC item, it involves right from the conceptions to development to actual production. It is spread across geographies, across farms. No single country or farm can say that they can produce entire chain of the value. So they have to be distributed across the geographies, across the companies, and India has to measure its strength where they can concentrate. Concentrate, and that is the area they have to focus. That is the area where they have to build size and scale. Similarly, if you look at the automobile sector, also it's a two trillion dollar of uh, uh, component uh, uh, global market, and 700 billion of them is the GVC item. And when we uh, look at our performance, we have been exporting 20 billion dollars and importing of that amount. So that is where a lot of space is there. So unless and until we try to do more into the global value chains, that is where we can attain more and more value, and we have prioritized a couple of sectors. We are working on that. Action would be, a uh, lot of action has been taken, whether it comes to the PLI policy or the XPX uh, scheme or the cluster development in the uh, uh, automobile sector, there has been the PLI scheme, whether it is ACC battery or the EV scheme or the FAME scheme. There have been a number of schemes which have been undertaken. And whatever is required, the government will uh, like to undertake those very initiatives. State governments have also taken their own initiative. So this is work in progress. We will continue to work on GVCs so that more and more value can be attained when it comes to the manufacturing output. Right, Mr. Oh, Ahmed, thank you so much for that. Uh, so we'll, uh, I'm being told that we've completely run out of time. Uh, but we'll begin and end, of course, with these prophetic words uh, from Mr. Ahmed. We began with it, the acronym PLI, and Mr. Ahmed is hoping to close this conversation with a newer acronym, GVC, that that is the push forward, that is where uh, the government's push is likely to come. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. It's been a riveting discussion. Uh, there's so much excitement in this space, and we hope to continue this conversation and learn more uh, from industry leaders. Thank you once again for being a part of this conversation. request you all to please stay back for a photo op. panelists for those invaluable insights. 
Well, next up, we have a fireside chat on building for the future policy insights for next-gen manufacturing, where we discuss how policy interventions can push the manufacturing growth engine in the country. And to moderate this session, may I please invite back on stage CNBC TV 18's Parikshit Lutra in conversation with Dr. Arunish Chavla, Secretary, Department of Pharmaceuticals, Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. A huge round of applause for both of them, please. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a day of intense conversations and brainstorming about industry, how to grow our manufacturing footprint, sustainability, and uh, with innovation as well. We're now going to be talking about the Indian pharmaceutical industry, which is indeed a bright spot in the Indian economy, and we have been the pharmacy of the world. And this became very, very clear, uh, and everyone got to know about India's prowess in the medical sector, in the pharmaceutical sector, especially during COVID-19, when we were a big supplier of vaccines across the world. But the activity is just starting. If the turnover of the pharmaceutical sector was around $40 billion in uh, 2021, sir, we're looking at a roadmap where we would want to increase it to $130 billion by 2030 and maybe $450 billion by 2047. That is a larger target, and uh, why shouldn't we reach there as soon as possible? But uh, let me straight away go across to Mr. Chavla, our pharmaceutical secretary. And, sir, we believe there has been a lot of activity in the last few days in the pharmaceutical space, especially as a result of the PLI. Are you expecting some announcements in the next few days on new greenfield projects? Yes. Uh, announcement and a big one. Uh, we are going to, uh, the Honorable Minister is going to inaugurate 40 greenfield plants uh, manufacturing bulk drugs and medical devices. Uh, a lot of hard work has gone into it. Uh, the initial skepticism is being proved wrong. The PLI is changing the Indian landscape in a big way. And you will see it on Saturday when the Honorable Minister inaugurates 40 big greenfield plants manufacturing bulk drugs and medical devices that were hitherto four entirely imported in the country. So that's a big announcement, ladies and gentlemen. A big round of applause for the Pharma Secretary. <laughs> Sir, that is indeed an achievement for the government. Uh, I'd also like to ask you, what are some of the companies uh, who will be involved in this exercise? Could you give us some of the big names? Uh, what is the total investment that you're expecting to draw as a result of this exercise? Uh, <clears throat> all the big companies that you think of, the good news is that both Indian and multinational companies are part of this scheme, part of this program. And Indian companies include all the big ones uh, which manufacture drugs and formulations, they are now deepening the value chain. They are now entering into a bulk drug production, something, you know, we had, uh, we had lost to some other countries and were importing for a long time, and we realized it uh, soon enough, uh, and five years' hard work has brought us here. Similarly, medical device, as you know, is a complex industry where all sciences converge, and where technical innovation is very fast. The product cycle is three years, five years, as compared to drugs, which is 20 to 30 years. And all these big devices, the one that you see in every hospital, CT scans, MRI machines, C-arms, X-rays, cath labs, dialyzers, critical care equipment, anesthesia stations, all that you see in the hospitals which uh, were earlier imported are now going to be manufactured in India. And as many as 150 commonly used hospital medical devices, which each one of us has been to once uh, at more times in life, they, they will now be manufactured in India. And some of them you will see on Saturday being inaugurated. All right, uh, that is indeed heartening to know. Uh, we'd, add, we'd also like to ask you about FDI inflows, sir. Uh, if we look at FY23, the FDI inflows into pharma sector were over $2 billion. What are the kind of numbers you expect in FY24? 
the reason why I ask you this is because overall we've seen a decline in FDI into India in, uh, in the last fiscal, over the last eight to 10 months. This is not just true of India, but it's been true of this region as well. Uh, what is the kind of uptick or trend that you expect in the FDI, in the pharma sector especially? See, uh, one stylized fact about investment is that it tends to be lumpy. And uh, it is driven by certain factors. Sometimes it is driven by big merger and acquisitions. And therefore, by its very nature, the series tends to be a bit more volatile. But I would see the long-term trend. And the good news is that in the pharma and the meditech sector, the FTI is rising. Mm. And it is rising with confidence in our industry, with confidence and reforms in our regulatory framework, and with active participation in the PLI scheme. So we expect that $2 billion that happened last year will be sustained in the pharma and meditech sector this year as well. All right. So you expect a, a sustained uptick in growth yeah. over the next few years. Yeah. Now, when it comes to promoting manufacturing in the pharma sector, in the medical devices sector, any key focus areas for the government in future? You, you told us about 40 new green fleet plants that will be announced this Saturday. But future focus areas of manufacturing, could you list that out for our viewers? Yes. So to develop, you know, medi med medical devices is a sunrise industry. And uh, we have identified certain verticals which were import dependent. And this includes uh, imaging devices, the x-rays, the CT scans, the MRIs that we talked about. Uh, it includes cancer therapy equipment, you know, which is a rising non-communicable uh, disease problem in India. And uh, given the patient load, a lot of these uh, machines like rotational uh, cobalt machines, linear accelerators, they were all uh, earlier imported. And uh, you will see that on Saturday, some of these manufacturing plants, manufacturing this sophisticated equipment will also be inaugurated and they will start making in India. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, uh, there are critical care equipment which are part of every ICU. There are anesthesia equipment which are part of every operation theater. There are cardiorespiratory equipment. Mm -hmm. There is a huge number of uh, kidney patients needing dialysis machines and their you know, solvents, their consumables, their disposables. Uh, we, and then, of course, the body implants. A mm -hmm. uh, few years ago, we never manufactured these implants. They were entirely imported from abroad. But the good news is that now the commonly used implants are made in India. And the multinational companies also are beginning to gradually uh, make set up investments here and start making these uh, body implants in India. Mm -hmm. The area of diagnostics, which is a very fast growing sector, is also a very important part of our Make in India push. Right. So we'd like to ask you about uh, the opportunity for the manufacturing industry for the future. What is the kind of growth you're expecting just in about five years? There are a lot of startups here in, the, in our audience who would like to know what are some of the areas that the government would encourage their participation in? Thanks. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, in, you know, our pharmaceutical industry was about uh, 50 to 60 billion last year. Our medical device sector was about 10 to 11 billion the last time, you know, the year ago that we uh, kind of uh, gathered the data. Going forward into 2030, we expect double digit growth in both the sectors, which means the pharma industry would be somewhere around 130 to 150 billion. And the medical device industry would be somewhere around 50 billion. Going forward, sky is the limit. 500 billion is the number you mentioned uh, in Amritkal, which is 2047. We are on track. We are making the policy reforms, the policy nudge that is needed, consisting of a, a package which will have uh, preferential market access, which will have uh, uh, phase manufacturing program, which will have simplification of procedures, which will have convergence of uh, uh, regulatory approval processes, and so on and so forth. Our emphasis would be on quality and innovation. 
And for both, we are making a dedicated push. As you know, in December, at the end of December, uh, a revised Schedule M was uh, promulgated in the country by the regulator. And that is almost the same, uh, very, very close as to the WHO Good Manufacturing uh, Practices Standards. And uh, in the next six months to one year, uh, most of the plants in India, all plants in India, will have to upgrade quality. Uh, about 50% of plants already have GMP uh, certifications. The remaining will have to do the same. And we will also be uh, hand-holding them and assisting them through one of our schemes so that uh, they can come up to speed. And uh, <clears throat> a new scheme was announced two, three months ago, which was uh, called the PRIP, that is Pharma Research and Innovation Program. Uh, that is in the works. And under that, we, will, we are looking for industry champions. And if I might use the expression, uh, not a shark tank, but a dolphin tank, where uh, we play together, we swim together, and uh, we are looking at, for setting up uh, a premier consultancy unit uh, to aid and assist that scheme. And uh, we will invite offers from the entire industry, smart startups, including multinationals who are now setting up their R&D centers in India. And I must specifically mention that I am Ahmedabad, in collaboration with Pfizer, has recently launched an innovation initiative for the startups where the CSR money can now be directed to assisting startups to innovate and become big. Uh, wonderful to hear that, sir. I would also like to ask you about quality. You laid a lot of emphasis on quality and innovation for the future. Uh, we had the DPIT secretary a few hours back right here on this uh, stage, and he said that we will move very aggressively with QCOs in future. We want to focus on quality. Same for the pharma sector, we, uh, we expect? Absolutely. Even better. Uh, we already have 600 plus manufacturing plants, which are US FDA certified. India has the largest number of US FDA certified plants anywhere on the planet Earth. We have 2,500 plants certified with WHO GMP standards. They are our champions. They are export competitive, and without them, people on the planet would not get medicines. And that is why India is called the pharmacy of the world. Right. Uh, last year, we had seen some unfortunate incidents uh, ladies and gentlemen, with regard to Indian cough syrup, certain Indian medicines, which had been questioned by uh, authorities abroad, especially in Uzbekistan. Just this morning, sir, we've heard that 23 people were sentenced by a court in Tashkent for various offenses related to the death of 68 children because of consuming uh, substandard cough syrup made by an Indian company. One person convicted is an Indian national who was a uh, distributor in Uzbekistan. What has been the lesson from uh, these episodes that we saw last year in Uzbekistan, in Gambia? Uh, we have investigated this, and a lot of this is based on misinformation. Uh, our plants were not responsible for uh, any incident. And uh, <clears throat> the incident that you talked about, uh, whatever happened today, uh, I would not be a prejudge. And our colleagues in the, uh, in the, in the external sector uh, would be doing the needful uh, that is necessary to assist our citizens. But in terms of the lessons related to quality, sir, and to ensure that uh, we meet global standards and nobody can question us in future, as you're saying, there is some issue related to misinformation, but how do we make sure that we protect ourselves for the future? Yeah. So <clears throat> the right way to do it is uh, be conscious of quality, and as our Honorable Prime Minister said, zero defect, full effect. So we have taken a proactive step forward. We have uh, brought in top quality international standards. We have revised the Schedule M, which guides the drug and pharmaceutical industry. 
we have raised the bar and we have raised it high enough so that any plant which now acquires or upgrades quality to the revised schedule M standard would automatically be eligible for the WHO GMP standards. I think as the, the, the right thing to do is to improve quality standards in our country for every manufacturing field and raise them, raise the bar, raise it to the level of international quality standards so that Indians who are world beaters are seen as world beaters. Right. Uh, when it comes to the competition from China, we've been doing a lot to reduce our dependence on China across sectors. When it comes to the pharma sector, to what extent have you been able to reduce uh, reliance on Chinese imports, emerge as an alternative to China? And is there a target that you're working with to probably achieve a certain amount of uh, capacity, certain amount of expertise, so that we can uh, reduce uh, reliance on China even further? Uh, yes, that is a guiding principle. Uh, we are looking to both diversify and deepen our value chains. So diversification means, say, in the pharma sector, not just traditional pharma or traditional generics, but moving into high value areas, biologicals, biosimilars, diagnostics, fermentation based products, complex generics, and now the next gen therapies, which are cell therapies, immune therapies, and so on and so forth. Uh, as you know, this sixth Schumpeterian wave is going to be driven by deep tech, green tech, fintech, and meditech. Mm. Meditech is right there. Mm. And secondly, we are also deepening our value chains. For example, we became the formulation champions. We became uh, the generic uh, manufacturers. We are now deepening it to active pharmaceutical ingredients, deepening further to drug intermediates, mm -hmm. deepening further to key starting materials. And at the same time, we are now supporting the excipient industry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every medicine that we take, a very small part of it is the active pharmaceutical ingredient, but there are a huge number of excipients used there. Mm -hmm. That industry did not exist in our country a few years ago. And now that is beginning to happen. Mm. So it is both ways. Mm. We diversify our value chains into areas uh, which we were not, which we, you, you know, as, as they say would in Star Trek, where we did not tread before. And we deepen our value chains so that strategically we integrate with the global value chains and we are not vulnerable given any crisis. Right. Uh, the PLI schemes have done a lot in terms of making sure that we can make more in India, indigenize more, and be more uh, competitive export-wise as well. Now, we believe that there is a new PLI scheme to boost production of key chemicals needed for uh, APIs. Uh, what is the status of that scheme, sir? We believe it's being driven by the DPIIT, but how will this impact uh, the pharma sector, uh, and by when do you expect the contours to be clear? Our colleagues uh, in the chemical department and uh, the, the, the DIPIT, uh, the Industrial Policy Department, are working on it. Uh, I would not like to jump the gun, but they are working on it, and it's part of the same uh, framework. Right. Now, in terms of uh, uh, future reform areas, uh, areas that you would like to focus on, uh, we're now heading into election season, but possibly in the next six to eight months, are there certain announcements, some certain policy interventions that the industry can expect? I would not like to take the surprise away. Uh, let's wait for the announcements. But uh, broadly, it is uh, in the same direction that we talked about during the course of the interview. Okay. And finally, sir, sustainability has been a big theme uh, for manufacturing discourse over the few years. And it's going to be even more important considering our goals at COP, what are the kind of sustainable practices that you have been urging the pharma industry to adopt 
in your daily conversations, in your stakeholder consultations. Uh, as I said, uh, quality is one. Innovation is another. Putting money back in R&D where it is necessary. Uh, taking, helping startups grow and become big. And taking more ideas from the valley of death to clinical trials, to commercialization, and nudging the academia, particularly our new institutes and the NIPERS that are coming up to generate more patents, generate more intellectual property, so that any dimension in which we have a gap with the leading economies, we cover up, we leapfrog, and we overtake them. All right, uh, Mr. Chava, thank you so much for joining us, giving your vision for the pharmaceutical industry. Great to new hear about the 40 new greenfield plants in the pharma sector, the medical devices sector, which will be announced this week. And I think our audience loved that announcement. The industry will cheer as well. Great to hear about all the reforms that you're working on for the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I'd request you to please stay back for a photo op. And so we'd also like to present you a small token of appreciation from our side. Can we please have that? I would request you to please stay back on stage. While moving on to our next session, safety and security are paramount for a nation to grow steadily. The Indian aerospace and defense composite market is poised for growth with the government focusing on strengthening the defense ecosystem and encouraging industry participation. And well, with that, we are ready for our next panel titled Guardians of the Nation, Strengthening India's Aerospace and Defense Sectors. And to steer us through this inspiring conversation, we have with us Parikshit Lutra. And may I please also invite on stage our esteemed panelists for this session, Air Chief Marshal R.K.S. Baduria, former Chief of Air Staff. A huge round of applause for him, please. Retired Air Vice Marshal Michael Fernandez, India Country Head, Lockheed Martin. Rajinder Bhatia, President, SITM and Chairman, Kalyani Strategies, Strategic Systems Limited. Dr. K. Raja Lakshmi Menon, DS and Director, Center for Airborne Systems, DRDO. Ashish Saraf, VP and Country Director for India, Hills India and Vishal Chaudhary, Co-Founder, Zetwell. Another huge round of applause for our panelists and for our moderator. Over to you, Parikshu. Please have a seat, uh, ladies and gentlemen. All right, uh, we're waiting for Vishal to join uh, the panel. I'm sure he'll be here in a short while from now. But uh, increasing our manufacturing footprint in aerospace and defense, this is critical for more ways than one. Look at what's been happening in the aerospace sector in the last two years. We've seen supply chain uh, issues. We've seen issues with Pratt & Whitney engines. There have been supply chain disruptions which have uh, it really affected the serviceability of uh, civilian aircraft as well. And then you've got uh, two wars raging on in the world, the Russia-Ukraine war, which has been on for more than two years now, and the war that we see between Israel and Hamas, which has been on for the last uh, six months or so, and there is no clarity as to where it's going. It's escalating in the Middle East. It has become a crisis in the Red Sea as well. All of that is putting pressure on supply chains. Supply chains for food grains, supply chains for fuel, supply chains for electronic goods. And all these countries, if you speak about Russia, if you speak about Israel, they are major supplier of defense components. And this is hurting the world. And we in India are trying to overcome all of that with indigenous manufacturing. And we couldn't have a better panel with us today. Let me kick this off by speaking to Air Chief Marshal RKS Baduria. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Give us a sense 
of the journey you've seen in the Air Force over the last 30 to 40 years when it comes to indigenization? Where are we with that indigenization journey right now? And how critical is the need today? Okay, uh, if I talk about the journey, I think uh, we started off pretty well uh, in terms of uh, the aerospace industry getting set uh, after independence. And in 60s and 70s, when we came up with Marut, if I have to take one example, uh, it was absolute uh, you know, state of the art that time and uh, ahead of its time in, in, in basic design and capability. And somewhere down the line, we lost our way and uh, uh, we, we uh, totally almost became uh, import dependent. And I, I, I've seen a total resurgence in the last about 20 years. And I think that is led by the LCA program, the AWC uh, uh, that we have flying, um, a series of helicopters, ALH, LUH, uh, the trainers, HTT-40. So, so that is the, the, the new generation of uh, equipment that has come in, which has changed this. So indigenization wise, I think from uh, aviation perspective, military aviation, uh, we are in a good space today, uh, starting with the fighter technologies, which are absolutely uh, uh, today current. Uh, I think uh, fly-by-wire, uh, if you take a digital fly-by-wire four channels, it is on the LCA, it is in the holy grail of, uh, you know, uh, doing some uh, these kind of technologies, composites, you take electronics, uh, automated system. Similarly, in uh, radars, in de uh, networks, uh, in systems, in weapons, a lot of work has taken place. So today, uh, from uh, Air Force and military aviation perspective, also uh, looking at Army and Navy requirements, I think we are in a good space. The challenge really is, uh, is the engine domain, uh, is the high-end uh, sensors domain, and of course, we have to start looking at next gen. Right. You're absolutely right, sir. And probably this is the reason why we signed the GEHL deal for uh, fighter jet engine technology to co-develop, not just for India, but for the world as well. Uh, that is a question we will be coming to. But sir, as a veteran of the Air Force, uh, do you also feel that somehow DRDO's role, and we have uh, Dr. Menon with us here. She is the director for the Center for Airborne Systems at DRDO. Uh, I was talking to her a short while back, and, and we really felt that somehow the DRDO's role in our defense and security system is uh, never really explained very well. Do you feel that we don't give DRDO enough recognition? Uh, at times, yes. But I think uh, from aviation side, we must realize that DRDO was at the center of most of this technology development. Uh, the LCA itself you know, came up uh, uh, under DRDO. Uh, most of this technology are, are, you know, very high risk and uh, high capital, uh, very uh, money intensive, and mostly led by DRDO and thereafter uh, into our DPSUs. Some of it, of course, uh, came up in DPSUs, HTT-40, et cetera, entire uh, ALH. So it's a combination, but in critical technologies, DRDO has certainly taken the lead and has certainly done great work. So there is no uh, doubt in that, and I think I've uh, expressed this uh, sentiment uh, all along. Uh, but at the same time, you know, times are changing and the rate at which if we have to become self-reliant, we have to involve the entire industry. So today the need is to increasingly get our private sector, our MSMEs, our startups, and, and that is the new model. To move faster. To, to move faster. Uh, uh, Dr. Menon, that is what we were speaking about, that we need faster turnaround times, and that's something the DRDO is trying to do. But for the layman, could you explain to us when you speak about airborne surveillance systems, like the Netra, uh, tell us how they have supported some of our most sensitive and critical military operations in the last five years. Yeah, so uh, firstly, thank the organizers for having me here. And uh, yes, Netra has been a very successful story, and uh, it has not been uh, developed by DRDO alone. The whole nation was behind. It has been fully with the guidance and support of Air Force who projected the requirement. They had the belief in us that indigenously we can develop and we delivered. So basically uh, coming to how fast we could have done or if you see it is a very complex system of systems. Uh, it has got a multidisciplinary uh, systems to be developed, designed and it is not a, a single domain expertise that is required. So it is a very complex system, and uh, we went ahead using the full system engineering approach, and uh, we used the expertise that is available within the country 
of having academic institutions with us who can actually help us in some of the niche technologies or the new algorithms that is required. We had the full expertise of the industry because we do the design, but manufacturing is done by the industries. But when we started at that particular time, it was the MSMEs who really supported us. And um, I would like to really quote and uh, acknowledge the MSMEs who really supported us. At times, there was no AMCs also placed, but being for the you know, nation, they all really supported us and said that, OK, if there is a problem, we will be there with you. So it has been only under that this thing we could do. And this DRDO, uh, including the Semilac, and it is the first time that such a system was getting you know, certified uh, within the country with all the work centers, uh, the participating labs, the MSMEs, DGAQA, and Air Force have together worked to see that such a system is actually available for the country. How we can fast you know, produce for the next time is you know, trying to see that uh, the, go, uh, the users felt that having multiple MSMEs uh, during the maintenance phase is not a good approach. Mm. So they would like to approach one industry. So we have now taken up for all of the future programs, we will have a DCPP, a development come production partner from the beginning itself with us. And that is the approach we will take. Mm. Second thing what we have now built in in our uh, uh, development uh, process or uh, the acquisition process is we will have the platform also a contract or the DCPP contract even before the CCS sanction, have it after the DAC approval, so that we are not eating in the timelines of the project. Mm. So that way we will be able to actually fasten the uh, no, uh, delivery of the systems. And uh, with that approach only, we have put in more projects. Uh, based on the success of uh, Netra, uh, actually users have again believed in us and uh, uh, interested with more programs. And uh, we are sure that we will be able to deliver to the uh, meeting the operational requirements and this time at a faster rate right so that you know ma'am uh, it's so nice to see you here hear your stories because you will be inspiring so many more uh, women across the country and when it comes to increasing the participation of women in the workforce in manufacturing it's very critical the, the participation of in, indian women in workforce is 37 percent we want to take it to 50 percent air force has been doing a great deal of work we've got women flying fighter jets right now they're training on Rafale jets as well. Uh, it's all very, very good news and very inspiring story. So uh, a big round of applause to the Thank women you. at DRDO Thank you. and our women in the Air Force as well. But speaking about faster turnaround time and collaboration with the private sector, uh, Mr. Bharti, if I could ask you, and if you can wear your SIDM hat, uh, what kind of collaboration do you envisage between DRDO and the private sector to somehow speed up things for our defense needs. <clears throat> Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, so your question is how fast we can make this collaboration go. In fact, there are a number of models which uh, have been now worked upon. Previously, some years ago, the idea used to be more like passing on bits and pieces of a program to the various industry elements. But over the last few years, they started with a new model, which she also mentioned which is called DCPP, which means development come production partner. So here, a industry joins hands with the DRDO right up front, and then is a partner to the development, and then is a natural production partner when the product comes through. One of the, I think the most prominent example of this would be the ATAX, Advanced Stored Artillery Gun System, where DRDO ab initio, right at the start of the program in 2015, joined hands with two large Indian companies, Tata's and uh, Kalyani Group, and the product was realized in less than two years' time. Today, we are on the verge of securing an order for a very large quantity from Indian Army, and hopefully it should happen in a few weeks' time. So I think this is an excellent model which they had really come out with. Also, there was a discussion going on in one time to come out with something like a strategic partnership with the DRTO. So that was another element, which was kind of DCPP, but going a little further, and then picking up Indian industry. But the most important part is that today, DRDO is treating Indian industry at par with everybody else in the, I would say, including the DPSUs, 
In fact, more work is being done by DRDO with private industry than with the DPSUs. Especially the development work, most of it is being done with the private industry. And uh, we are looking forward with great expectation to the announcement of 25% R&D to be given to the private industry. And most probably that also has to be routed through uh, DRDO. We already have a program on technology development fund going on with them. And probably with this additional 25% R&D, I think it will take us to the next level. Right. Uh, Air Vice Marshal Fernandez, let me ask you about uh, Lockheed Martin. You're heading operations for them here at India. This is the biggest manufacturer of defense systems in the world. Now, when it comes to deepening the footprint in India, U.S. and India are working very, very closely. Uh, Indus X was a sign of that. The Prime Minister's trip to the United States last year was a big step in uh, the India-U.S. industrial roadmap. How do you see India as a manufacturing destination for the future? Uh, thanks to uh, Zetwork, CNBC, and Parikshit for having me on this panel. Uh, Parikshit, if I, if I may start off, let you know, just to go back and set the uh, correct picture about uh, how we could move forward. Uh, as you said, Lockheed Martin is the largest defense manufacturer in the world. It's, it's, it's absolutely right on top of its game. Uh, but that doesn't happen uh, easily. Uh, I think Lockheed Martin in 2010, much before Make in India even was thought of or anything, decided to come to India. And they saw India as a very, very promising place to put work into. Uh, FDIs were challenging. They weren't at the 74% that we have today. They were minuscule. Uh, there was not much skill level in India at that time, but still Lockheed Martin threw in the hat. We set up two JVs. Uh, I'm happy to have Ashish here. I learned about him only this just now before coming here. So we have two JVs, uh, Tata Lockheed Martin and uh, Tata Sikorsky in Hyderabad. And from 2010 to now, we have about 1,100 workers, many of them in TLM oil uh, women, women who we've picked up after 10 standard, put them in an Hunar Shala, train them, and they are working today in TLM oil. Uh, so, so we are, we are quite sure India is uh, a good place to be in. It's a lovely place to put in work. I, I see this close cooperation only helping us go forward in a big way. There are things that would have to be legislatively changed because, you know, uh, the U.S. has uh, very strong uh, rules and regulations in place. We have a very uh, big difference in the technological levels that do exist. But I'm sure with this close cooperation and the roadmap that has been worked out, uh, both governments will find uh, ways to get around that. We already have the striker coming in shortly. We are looking in for some more, uh, uh, you know, equipment coming in through a faster route. And so uh, I think, I think uh, Lockheed Martin is quite sure that it has a long runway ahead of it in India. Right. And if I can probably uh, uh, just make an observation, the fact that you've got such a strong presence You've invested so much in training the workforce, it almost makes it an Indian company altogether. You've Indianized yourself in India. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it is still a JV. We've Indianized ourselves. I, I, I think we must have been the first uh, foreign OEM to come into the country. And uh, I, I wish I could invite you all to come to our uh, JV there and see how much uh, it has moved up. Uh, 24,000 square meters of, um, of area. Uh, 1,100 people, all youngsters. Our average age in our JV is 29 years old. Highly skilled, uh, very, very competent, and uh, very proud of uh, uh, being in India, for sure. No, uh, fantastic, sir. Great to hear that. Uh, Ashish, if I can get you in at this stage. As we were hearing from uh, Air Vice Marshal Fernandez a short while back, they've put in a lot in terms of skilling the workforce. Does that become a hindrance sometimes in expanding the footprint in India. We were also speaking to Dr. Menon a short while back that when you look at critical technologies for the future, you need people with very special engineering skills. You need basic engineering skills as well. And somehow those skill sets are not coming by. Do you see that gap?
when you want to be a leader, you want to increase your manufacturing exports, does that something that uh, need immediate attention according to you? So thank you, Parikshit, uh, and, and thank you for inviting Thales to this forum. Um, the short answer is no. Um, you know, we see India as a gold mine of talent. Uh, so a, a few stats, right? Last year, we, f we completed 70 years in India. So, um, and at that time, it was not even Thales when we started India, uh, our operations in India, and Bharat Electronics was formed with the help of Thales. So our legacy goes back that long, uh, right? Um, we, we celebrated our 70th anniversary in India last year. Now our footprint, I mean, obviously it expands across seven cities, two joint ventures, two very large engineering centers that do some incredibly state-of-the-art uh, development here, including cybersecurity, uh, FPGA, we are actually one of the centers of excellence for Thales for the world for FPGA. Um, we do open hardware research in India. Again, one of a few firms, we are actually doing funded research in India, uh, which we pioneer across the world. So Thales is one of the companies that's actually championing the open hardware research uh, for the world. Now, all these require substantial amount of skills. But what we found um, in India was that, number one, access to talent, and number two is the ability to train and deploy the talent. I mean, we, we literally give ourselves uh, 150 days from bringing someone on board to the point where he or she is you know, productive, delivering, delivering research, uh, delivering to, to our expectations in terms of avionics, human machine interface. So we do some really uh, cutting edge work here, uh, but uh, for us, it's always been a gold mine of talent. Um, and uh, we've actually recently opened another center in Bangalore that can house upwards of 700 people. And that's already started to, f uh, to fill in. We are already started to fill it up. So, uh, you know, the 70 years of legacy is also, I mean, obviously taught, taught us a lot, but our roadmap goes for the 70 more years and beyond to make this a center of excellence for technologies that go on the Rafale. So you'll be happy to know that we do the ASA radar for Rafale here. We do the Spectra electronic warfare suite in India. Uh, uh, recently, we have also announced some investments in, 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 uh, in the aerospace domain. So all these just point to the fact that it's not only a market, but also uh, you know, a, a pool of skills that we are tapping for worldwide deployment. Right. Thank you. And great to hear that. Uh, Dr. Menon, but uh, do you agree with uh, uh, Ashish yeah. that the I skills are available? And do you feel that it's easier to attract those kind of skills to the private sector rather than to an institution like DRTO? Uh, yeah. So I would um, like to answer in two parts. So one is, uh, see, uh, the trend, recent trend within the academic institutions, because I'm also on the board of governors of two you know, universities. So what I see is, uh, I mean, institute is also looking at, you uh, know, the students as, uh, you know, they are the customers. So what they need is what the universities are now providing. So they have now increased the number of seats in AIML and data science. Okay, that is required. But is it enough for a, uh, you know, DRDO kind of an environment where we need multidisciplinary experts like RF I mean, the kind of people, uh, number of people that is required in the areas of ECE and experts in the RF is really not available as many as used to be there. So it is just a caution that I would like to, you know, bring out in this forum that um, universities should look at also what is required for the nation as a country, I mean, not be only for uh, government sector, even in private sectors, because if you are saying more and more defense uh, sector should be given to the uh, private industries. We need expertise in all these areas. So just having one section or half a section for ECE and um, nine or ten sections for uh, AIML data science actually is not a good trend. I think I just would like to caution and uh, leave it at that Very because I feel uh, there is a 
we need to take some corrective action at this stage. Right. No, that is important, ma'am. That yeah. is, as we are focusing on a skill development mission, it's yes. important to hear these views as well. Vishal, yeah. to get you And uh, just one more point, yeah, if I can add, because even though the thrust is nowadays on Make in India, the Make in India, what we are now looking at predominantly is on manufacturing in India. Sometimes it is also on license production. But what we also need to take it forward if we want to excel as a nation is also design in India because mm. that is innovate in India for the world. That should be the you know, uh, approach that we should take because today if you have made 100 systems based on licensed production, tomorrow a different variant you have to make, you will not be able to, especially in an aerospace uh, uh, field, unless you have the design uh, details with you. So that is why it is very important to go beyond manufacturing go for design in India, that is innovate in India for the world. Design in India, innovate uh, in India for the world. That yes, could sir. be uh, the mantra for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for those remarks. Uh, Vishal, to get you in right now, give us your aspiration as a startup in terms of manufacturing, in terms of contributing to defense manufacturing, and how easy is it for companies like yours, yours to get your foot in the door as far as government schemes go? It's, it's very exciting time for private industry in the aerospace and defense space right now. Uh, the scale of uh, upgradation and modernization that's happening, or that has, that has sort of, uh, that train has just left the station. That scale is like huge and, uh, and massive scale. And private industries can really help in complementing the established EPSU capacities which are there in the market. Uh, recently, the Raksha Mantri announced a, a, a production target in a short term of about 3 lakh crores. 50,000 crores of which needs to be made for the world, uh, made in India for the world. So private industry are in a very sweet spot today in complementing the existing capacities with the DPSUs and the organizations like DRDU today. Number two is uh, the, the buzzword is also transfer of technology, getting some of these foreign technology to, into India, ruggedize it, con I mean contemporize it to the Indian context, and, uh, and uh, provide service reliably to some of these equipment over the life cycle of these equipment, which can happen if that if that capability resides within the country. So uh, we are very excited at the prospects of this industry right now, and uh, we're very happy to be doing what we are doing. All right, good to hear that, uh, Vishal. Uh, Air Chief Marshal Baduria, if I were to ask you about the changing nature of warfare. Very recently, and we were speaking to some of our co-panelists, the Defense Secretary had told us that we're looking at a scenario right now where low-cost drones costing just as much as $300 could damage a big battleship. Uh, how do we prepare for scenarios like that? What kind of technology do you think that startups like Zetwork, the private sector, need to work on? I think uh, uh, looking at new tech and uh, threats like this and preparing for the future is the key. You know, where we are today, we have to change our entire mindset of how we are going to fight. Uh, low-cost drones, you have loitering munitions, you have UAVs. These are, these are the new methods of uh, you know, warfare which, which we have seen the results. And I think that is an area we really have to start working. And uh, new startups, MSMEs, companies like Zedwork, this is an area that uh, they can do a lot. And it is so critical that uh, we bring in new tech and reduce the cost. And I think we are talking of loitering munitions, but very soon we should be talking of flying munitions. Uh, swarms of not only drones, but swarms of munition and collaborative swarms. That is what, uh, uh, you know, the new warfare is going to uh, look like. Increasingly, I think from where we stand, uh, uh, the young companies, the startups, uh, the MSMEs, uh, also the big companies who should invest into R&D, what uh, Mr. Radhakshmi was saying, that uh, that is the key. That is really, for the new tech, we have to start working now. Uh, be it in UAV, be it in manned unmanned teaming, be it in uh, you know cyber and space, which is absolutely a new domain. It is open. Be it entire networking and you know a communication domain, entire ISR chain, which we need to have 24/7 uh, ability to look anywhere, uh, yeah, ability to do AI ML and uh, control the new sense of munitions. Uh, that we have to really master. Further going on to uh, things like hypersonic weapons, new sensors, uh, you know, new weapons, uh, 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 heavy effect weapons. So there we have to become leaders. We have space to become leaders. And I'm glad a lot of foreign companies are here. They've done well. They've 
uh, you know, uh, invested a lot of uh, FDI here. But tech is what we should develop our own. And, and in, after a decade or two, we have to start uh, using their ecosystems. Currently, we should uh, get the supply chains established. And I think somewhere down the line, we have to balance our books. We have been importing for so long. After a decade or two, we have to start exporting, utilizing their presence here into their supply chains. I think that should be the key. Right. Uh, you know, a member of our audience, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, if I'm, yeah, we were speaking a short while back, and he was giving us a feedback, an important feedback about Make in India. Does that Make in India mean you should go out and make everything? We were speaking about aircraft tires. Is that right, sir? Yeah. yeah. So, Mr. Sir, if you can take this question, when it comes to Make in India in defense, what are some of the things that we need to focus on future? Uh, it cannot mean everything. Make in India does not mean that you need to have an expertise in everything. You need to be making in everything in India. How do we prioritize? Uh, firstly, my take on Make in India, that's not meant to be exclusive. It is meant to be inclusive, mm. which means you are actually not trying to get into a watertight compartment. This is not the time. This is not the world where you can be sitting in a wat watertight compartment. So what does Make in India mean? Make in India means that you could be depending upon sources outside the country. You could be depending upon various other vendors sitting outside your country. You do have the intellectual property or the integration capability to undertake that job. It is not to exclude yourself from the globe. It's to actually include everybody. Only thing is, important thing is to keep that IP which is available so that you have unhindered access to this technology in case of crisis. Right. So this is the most important part. And Make in India is all about that. Nobody can be sitting in India and trying to export products outside uh, can rely purely on Indian market. Mm. You would be sourcing some items from outside always. But as long as integration capabilities and IP lies inside the house, it's perfectly fine. Right. No, thank you. Thank you for uh, those remarks, sir. And we can continue the conversation uh, later as well, Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, Air Vice Marshal Fernandez, let me ask you about Lockheed Martin. How much are you sourcing from India currently? And how much of the sourcing could increase considering the close relations between India and U.S. right now? And how India could emerge a supplier of defense equipment for the U.S.? Uh, so currently... Uh, uh, Still going back to, our, uh, to what all we do in India, uh, today uh, we supply the empennages for the C-130 globally. Uh, we've exported about 212 of them so that you know that almost uh, uh, any C-130J that you fly, see flying in the world has its empennage. That's the entire tail section and, uh, and fin made in Adi Batla at Hyderabad. So we can be very proud about that. Uh, besides that, uh, we used to make the Sikorsky cabin uh, for the S-92, uh, which is the President's uh, uh, helicopter, Marine One. And now, very recently, uh, you know, seeing the, the, the potential that India has, we've put work for fighter wings into India. Now, the fighter wings that we put into India are, are, are high-tech. They are 9G, they are fuel-carrying, they are interchangeable. I'm sure Chief will agree with me when I tell you that getting an interchangeable wing is very difficult. As of now, when a wing, when, let's suppose you fly somewhere and you get battle damage during a war, the aircraft comes back, lands, the wing is taken off for repair, and the same wing has to be put back on that aircraft. Whereas here, with this wing that we are manufacturing for the fighters, you just bring in another wing, fit it on, and that aircraft is ready to fly again. So, so it, it, it's... Uh, it's quite high-tech that we have brought in. Uh, and I want to say that, you know, finally we talk about indigenous content. We talk about, uh, Mr. Bhatia said, about bringing the world into us. So when we brought the empennage into India, there was zero indigenous content. It was in 2010. We brought it in, started. Everything was coming in from abroad. Today, that same empennage has got 94% of indigenous content. That means that in almost that entire thing is being made in India. So that's one part of the story. But what I want to say is that once you've got your supplier chain, once you've established quality control, once you've got all this going, when we brought in the fighter wing for manufacture here in India, 
the fighter wing started itself with a 70% IC. So that's what I'm saying about building an ecosystem here. And an ecosystem does not build by, sorry if I'm, I'm this thing, but again, going back to uh, Mr. Bhatia, make in India. Until you feed into a global supply chain, until you have volumes that can sustain that manufacture, it won't really support you. So the, it's very, very important to understand that volumes is what is required. You say, make in India, you have something way, way back in Hyderabad, and now I'm putting on my Air Force cap, and I'm talking about war fighting. Uh, China has the second ro uh, rocket regiment that can target every corner of the subcontinent. Okay, If you do not have resilience in supply chain, if you do not have things coming from global sources, like we are seeing what is happening in the wars that are going on currently, you're going to be very, very badly hit. Very badly hit. And uh, so, uh, so those are the things that I wanted to bring about. about no, uh, very right, sir, about uh, resilience in supply chains. And this is exactly what the U.S. is saying. When they speak about a U.S.-India industrial roadmap, they speak about manufacturing not just for India, Indo-Pacific and beyond. Absolutely. You know, so it's a very uh, vast and there is a huge opportunity there for the manufacturing sector, but we need to move very fast considering our Chinese counterparts. Uh, let me now take the final set of comments. Uh, Mr. Saraf, if I can begin with you. Give us the kind of investments that you have outlined for India. Uh, MRO is an area where you are showing great interest in. Could you lay out the areas of interest for Thales in India and the kind of investments you're looking at? So um, I would say, let's say, three or four areas uh, besides the one that we have already uh, narrated. Um, the existing ones are two large engineering centers, two joint ventures that are basically making the, you know, the Rafals equipment. Uh, MRO is a very attractive area for us. I mean, uh, some some numbers around that. Air India has just said that they will induct six, uh, one airplane every six days. We expect with the backlog that the, the Indian airlines have combined that India will induct an airplane a week probably for the next 15 years. And we fell right in the sweet spot of that because Thales is an avionics provider for, for a lot, a majority of them uh, flying in India. So. We just recently announced uh, um, an investment in the MRO, avionics MRO uh, center that will come up uh, somewhere in the NCR region. Uh, we will be nearly doubling or even tripling our engineering workforce in the coming five to seven years. Uh, we are bringing more Rafale content here. Uh, so you will see the electronic warfare and the ASA part of Rafale bring, brought in more and more here. Uh, we started with uh, bringing the content for Indian Air Force. That's over. So now we are supplying for the global Rafales that get delivered across the globe to various countries. And a lot of content for that come in, comes into India. We are looking at uh, investments in Optronics. We are looking at investments in Vishorads, which is a very short range air defense systems with our, our partners. We are looking at investments uh, on, on some of the, the guns with, uh, with our esteemed partner who's right here on stage. So, you know, we have a plethora of investments lined up and, uh, and, and you know, one after the other is already started to materialize to just take advantage of the market and the talent that's available here. Thank you so much, uh, Ashish Saraf. Uh, Dr. Menon, one final comment from you. Uh, in terms of uh, one big focus area that DRDO would be working on for the future? One, yeah, so one focus area is a little difficult, but I will concentrate on aerospace and uh, defense. Uh, so uh, basically, yes, uh, uh, what we are now uh, trying to do is uh, give uh, the users what is uh, projected by them with the approach that we have talked about. But what I would also like to say is, as of now, uh, DRDO is working on all kinds of platforms. Maybe it manned platform or unmanned or uninhibited, I would like to say, or uh, aerostat uh, airships. And uh, so these, on these, we have all the surveillance equipment and uh, available. In addition, as a fighter, of course, ADA, DRDO joint combined, we are able to do that. When it comes to manned uh, uh, surveillance systems, one 
uh, area, I think, I mean, not that DRDO is presently looking at, but as country, what we should be looking at is having a indigenous airborne, I mean, indigenous uh, transport aircraft. Because today, wh what we are facing is all kind of surveillance systems, whether we want uh, uh, for uh, maritime surveillance or for air-to-air -air detection or for air-to-ground uh, surveillance. We have now depended on the transport aircraft from abroad and for missionizing it. So we are too much dependent on them. It may take few a few years, but it's the right time to start so that we have, and then as I told you, we know that we have the design details, modification on it, missionizing on right. it, and uh, meeting all the future requirements of any of the services on those platforms will become easier. So all this right. is one thing. I mean, I'm not saying the RDO need to look at it. It is but as the a country, country needs to look at it. Indigenous it. transport and already, aircraft and unmanned technology. Uh, already there is uh, some initiative also taken up. Uh, so that is one thing that I feel will help. Okay. Apart from that, what the RDO is doing is well known. All right. And uh, we our, will be meeting our mandate to empower the nation with uh, indigenous uh, state-of-the-art defense good. technologies and systems. Good night. Thank good, you. Good to know, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Bhatia, now over the last one year, we've been seeing a lot of interest uh, in the stock market when it comes to defense stocks, defense PSUs, uh, private sector defense companies. And this interest is going to grow because of the huge capex push of the government for defense acquisition. Just recently, the DAC uh, cleared contracts worth 80,000 crore rupees, and this, these numbers are only going to grow. 16,000 crores in exports last year. How do you see the manuf defense manufacturing to grow in India over the next five years? What kind of export growth do you expect year on year? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. It's a quite an interesting question. But uh, I think uh, just about two days ago, our Raksha Mantri did lay down the root map for achieving 3 lakh crores of manufacturing by 2728. We are today at 8,000 crores. So you are looking at a, a three times or 300% growth in the next three years. Translated into actually CAGR, this would be at all odds. This would be looking at something like 60% CAGR growth year on year. My own opinion and feeling is that our initial targets were $25 billion of growth which was doubling what we are doing today of 12 billion, and which was meant to be done by 26, 27, which looks eminently achievable. In terms of our exports, we are today approximately about 16,000 crores. There are estimates we might go beyond this this year, in uh, year 23, 24. Exports can grow faster because there is an environment of uncertainty. You yourself mentioned about two ongoing conflicts and third one on the horizon. So exports can take a major impetus. I can see exports growing 20 to 25% year on year growth from here onwards. All right, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. We've completely run our time, but thank you very much for giving us a roadmap on the defense industry. Thank you, thank you so much, Ricky. I'd request you all to please stay back for a quick photo walk. for such an informative session. Well, moving on, in the next session, we have the honor of meeting a titan of the manufacturing industry. He has dedicated more than four decades to a name that has stood for quality and dependability for generations of Indians. A true leader and driving force at India's largest automobile manufacturer, steering it with his vision, expertise, and determination, Please welcome with a huge round of applause R.C. Bhargav Chairman Maruti Suzuki in conversation with Shireen Bhan, Managing Editor, CNBC TV 18.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and what an absolute honor and pleasure it is to welcome uh, here at uh, the CNBC TV 18 Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit, a doyen of Indian manufacturing, the chairman of, uh, of uh, Maruti, Mr. R.C. Bhargav. Mr. Bhargav, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, what a phenomenal story it is, and I don't know how many of you know that uh, Mr. Bhargav has just released his second book. It's called Impossible to Possible, and it basically uh, chronicles the Maruti story, because this was a story that shouldn't have worked, uh, and everyone had pretty much uh, thought that it, it was a story that uh, would not take off, but it not just took off, it has established itself as a case study on what good manufacturing is truly about. Mr. Bhargav, uh, you know, so let's go back in time to 1983, to the end of December, when you were actually starting uh, production at Maruti. And at that point in time, the dream or the ambition or the uh, audacious goal was 100,000 cars is what you were hoping Maruti would be able to do. From there to 4 million, which is what you are currently doing, what a journey it's been, what a story it's turned out to be. Would you ever have imagined this kind of success? Certainly, I could not have imagined what has happened. And... Uh... I would venture to say, Shirin, that nobody in the world would have imagined it. At that time, even 100,000 was looking to a lot of people as an impossible amount of cars to sell in the Indian market. This market had been stagnant at 35 to 40,000 cars for a decade. And to add another 100,000 cars in that, Everybody thought it was impossible. That is what you're told. Don't try and sell 100,000. Just be 30, 40,000 is enough. Well, you know, I, I want to go back to when things started at uh, Maruti. And as you pointed out, the expectation was that this was not going to take off, that you would not be able to create this behemoth that you have ended up creating. Uh, and very few people may actually realize that it is one of the few examples of a public-private partnership that really has flourished. What do you think worked to your advantage? I think uh, when we started the project, what was very helpful was the fact that uh, the Prime Minister had a personal interest in this project, which meant that uh, other politicians kept away <laughs> from... Uh, interfering in various decisions which we had to make, who should become our partner, from where we should get technologies, who should be the contractors, who should be appointed. I think people kept away from that. There was one minister who had tried to do something. He got sacked. <laughs> <laughs> so, so other ministers and other people kept away. And that was one fact which led us to take the correct decisions uh, in the initial period. Of course, Mrs. Gandhi didn't last very long because mm. we started production end of December 83. Yeah. She died December 84. Yeah. So it was just one year, but it was enough to get us started. After that, uh, uh, I think what couple, many factors worked in our favor. One was the financial factor. The advanced booking for car scheme, you remember that, yeah. Shireen, with the that gave us a lot of cash. And we became independent of government for our financial needs. Mm -hmm. So we never had to go back to the government each year for getting more money and things mm -hmm. of that kind. I think that gave us a great deal of flexibility. The second factor was uh, to an extent that since I had come from the IAS, yes. People who were the senior officers, including the secretary in the Ministry of Heavy Industry, which was the administrative ministry, were all known to me. Many of them were personal friends. Yeah. And so we had a different relationship compared to what most ministries have with their public sector chiefs. Mm. And uh, that carried on till uh, the early 90s when this factor changed. And then you know what happened from uh, 1994, 95 onwards. Everything changed. You know, speaking about change, but also speaking about legacy, uh, and I don't know if the Maruti success story would be as big a success story if you had a different collaborator, if you had a different partner, a non-Japanese partner. Do you think the story would have been the same? 
No, I don't think if we had any other partner, even if we had another Japanese partner, I'm not sure if the same story would have unfolded. Because uh, Osamu Suzuki was a very different kind of uh, Japanese uh, president. I don't think any other Japanese president would have taken the decision to partner the government to make a car. I don't think any other Japanese president would have taken as much interest as Mr. Suzuki took in ensuring that Maruti got all that it needed to develop into a good company. The kind of effort he made personally in visiting the company, visiting the factories, going around the factories every time, giving directions and suggestions on how to make improvements. Nobody does that. Mm. So I think uh, it was not only Japanese, it was Suzuki. Suzuki. Yeah. You know, on that, and now you talked about improvement because that is very crucial to the Japanese style of manufacturing, the quest for constant improvement of yeah. daily improvement. I want to understand from you and many people in this room who are in the manufacturing space, you know, the, how do you create a culture of improvement which eventually leads to creating a culture of excellence? You know, I think that was the key, if I may put it that way, to our long-term success. Right from the beginning, one of the things which uh, had intrigued me and some of my colleagues was why did Japanese manufacturing become so competitive after the war? Mm. Immediately after the war, Japanese industries was very much like Indian industry. There were unions, there were strikes, there were cases of arson, there were all kinds of violence, things were happening. And then in the next 10 years, things changed. And we found that in Japan, there were no strikes. The union and the management were working together. There was a partnership between mm. them. It was a very different thing. And workers were actually contributing to the improvement of the company through the quality circles, Kaizen activities, yeah. small scale, small group activities. There was a lot of change happening in factories that way. And uh, that is what intrigued us. And Mr. Suzuki said that, uh, and the Japanese people generally told us that it's all a question of good communication between the management and the workers. If you explain to the workers that in fact their long-term aspirations and interests of improving their own lifestyle, improving the future of their children and the welfare of their families, actually only depends on the growth and prosperity of their employing company. Workers in any company cannot get financial help for any of these things from any other source. Government cannot yep. help workers to improve their lifestyles. It has only to come from the company. So if you explain to the workers, they quickly understand that actually their future lies in the company. What has not been happening in industry is that entrepreneurs and the promoters of companies and who run companies don't think that there's any value to be added by giving any kind of incentive or motivation to workers. And the bulk of the profits of a company are appropriated by the management. Now, if you want the workers to believe that their future is linked to that of the company, then they must see that their future actually improves as the company improves. Mm. And that is the key to the whole thing of uh, creating a management system where you convince the workers through continuous communication as well as your policies and actions mm. that if the workers help in making the company more uh, competitive, improving quality, reducing cost, then the sharing of the benefits of that growth mm. will also come down to the workers. Mm. And that's what, that was the main task I had after Maruti started. Because Mr. Krishnamurti could not talk in Hindi to the workers. <laughs> I was the only guy who could talk in Hindi to them. And so I was given this task of talking to the workers. And I followed exactly this line. I said, look. Uh, you can say it in Hindi, sir, if you in like. In Hindi, of course. <laughs> I said, company band ho jayegi. So aapko to kahi naukri milegi nahi. 
मुझको तो नौकरी मिल जाएगी बाकी जो मैनेजर्स हैं इनको भी नौकरी मिल जाएगी बिकॉज ये कहीं और नौकरी पा लेंगे तो यहाँ से मद्रास भी चले जाएंगे कोई दिक्कत नहीं है आप तो जान ही सकते हो तो ये ख्याल रखो कि इस कंपनी में अगर नुकसान होने लगा और कंपनी बंद हो गई तो आपका फ्यूचर ख़त्म है तो आपका अगर आप फ्यूचर चाहते हो तो यू हैव टू स्टे एंड वर्क फॉर द बेस्ट इंटरेस्ट ऑफ द कंपनी वॉट आई विल गारंटी यू इज दैट यू विल गेट अ फेयर शेयर ऑफ द बेनिफिट्स ऑफ ग्रोथ यू विल नॉट बी डिप्राइव एंड वी इम्प्लीमेंटेड दिस इन द फॉर्म ऑफ वेरियस थिंग्स विच हैपन ओवर द ईयर्स and the workers were absolutely convinced that what i was telling them was actually sincere we meant what we said and we had to do a lot of things to win the confidence of the workers to show that we were committed to the company in the sense that we were talking about that the company was the major thing and not misuse company assets be frugal in the management style mm. follow all the rules of the company which we wanted workers to follow in terms of punctuality and in terms of mm. short breaks for lunch and tea and all those things we followed all of that rigorously attendance levels we were very keen that attendance levels of everybody in the company should be more than 95% mm. and uh, we, we had to make sure that we did that exactly and through over time with education with certain incentives scheme we got the workers today maruti attendance of workers is 97 98% it works i mean it's not that it can't work it can because workers ultimately realize what is in their interest hmm. and their interest is the growth of the company what well, speaking about the growth of the company and you know you you i know that you keep making this point uh, that it is important to ensure that workers are equal custodians of the growth of the company as you just articulated but speaking of growth uh, one of the things that uh, that you've also always talked about is that you were never driven by the chase for market share uh, explain explain while you were chasing for growth but not for market share you know and there is a difference there is a difference there see market share in the beginning we kept going up while i was the managing director yeah. there was because hardly, there was no competition there was hardly any competition yeah and uh, by the time i retired in 97 98 as managing director i think we had a market share of about 83% yeah. it was uh, ridiculous at cnbc we still have 86% shares so so, so i know what you're talking about <laughs> and uh, but after that the market started to grow it opened up lot of people came into the country and competition grew now market share is a function of not only what you can do to get market it's a function of how the market is growing also there are limits to the extent to which you can grow yourself for example today suzuki finds it very difficult to accept the idea that we should put up one new plant every year and one new plant means a capacity of 250000 cars now we need actually more than 250000 cars a year in the coming years if you want to maintain a market share of 50% mm. i don't think it can happen physically we can't do more than that because it's not only the machinery and things it's all the soft part of uh, yeah. setting up a plant and getting workers recruited and trained and then organization mm. built and the infrastructure and housing and education facilities and medical and all it just can't be done so market share is uh, ultimately not something which i pers a lot of people attach a lot of importance, importance to i don't i believe that if you can sell what you can produce fully you should feel quite satisfied with what you are doing if you can't use your capacity your capacity is lying idle I because your products won't sell then that is not a good situation hmm. 
You know, spe speaking of capacity and speaking of utilization, one of the other remarkable things about Maruti, of course, as far as the consumer is concerned, affordability, but even as far as the company is concerned, the cost of production hasn't really seen any big spikes or hasn't seen any great degree of volatility. What's been the secret behind that, of ensuring that there is consistency as far as your cost of production is concerned? Of course, raw material costs and so on and so forth uh, you know, have to be factored in and they go through their own ups and downs. But what has been the, the, uh, the philosophy, the rationale that has kept your cost of production also largely consistent? See, uh, Suzuki Motor Company was a very small company when we started. And uh, Japanese generally are very conservative in their approach to investments and things. They are not... Uh, that kind of sort of uh, cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> and the, Mr. Suzuki did not ever think that, of course, he never thought we'd get to this kind of demand. Yes. There have been so many periods when I kept saying we need more capacity because the market is growing. And uh, he would hum and haw, and, but he wouldn't decide because he wanted to actually see the capacity, market demand increasing adequately mm. before he put in capacity. capacity. Yeah. So as you have seen, Shireen, over these years, there have been always number of models which have been in back orders because we have never been able to produce enough. But one of the things of this philosophy was that very little capital which was invested ever remained idle. idle. Uh, not only idle, it reached 100% utilization of capacity within a few months. I had worked in BHEL for two years before I joined mm. Maruti. It was assumed in the public sector that 100% capacity utilization was not really possible. And if it happened, it would take several years to reach 100% capacity utilization. The way Mr. Suzuki did it, he always built the downstream facility first mm. before he built the upstream facility. So when the upstream facility was built, the user of, the down, of that production yeah. was always available. So in the factory, there was never unutilized capacity, capacity. and it reached 100% very quickly. The same thing happened with cars because he kept capacity constrained so that the market never ran uh, behind our uh, ability to supply. We were always behind the market. Well, you know, constraining capacity is, has turned out to be a good thing as far as uh, your story is concerned. But, you know, you, you're sitting now with a legacy of over four decades. You've been able to achieve many milestones. But as you look forward, and part of, uh, uh, you know, leadership is, is to, of course, take forward the legacy that, uh, that you have created, but it's also about attacking the future. As you look both at the rear view mirror as well as the mirror in front of you, what do you see as, as what you will take with you uh, as you move forward? What are the changes that you believe you will need to make to stay relevant? Shireen, you know, at this stage, one doesn't know how much to look forward to <laughs> because uh, nobody knows. But uh, I think... Uh, Suzuki and the new generation of managers who are coming into the company, both in Japan and here, are now very clear that, uh, A, the Indian market has to be looked at very differently from other markets. Mm. It's taken us a long time to convince the Japanese that we are not like others. But I think they realize that the Indian market and Indian conditions are different. And I think they're recognizing that and they are now beginning to create an organization. We are, we are in the process now, of, as uh, we said during when we took over the Gujarat uh, yeah. facility, that we are in the process of reorganizing our whole working to see how we should go forward to deal with uh, a four million car company because there is no company in the world, and I say in the world, including Toyotas and General Motors mm -hmm. and everybody, yeah. who's producing and selling four million, million. cars in the same one market. Yeah. 
one market, we will be the largest single market in the world for one company. Yeah. And there is no precedent or example to follow on how that should be done. Mm. So that's one of the things which we have to now tackle. And I think one of the things which I need to also spend some time thinking about, if I can, as to how to organize ourselves so that we can deal with a 4 million car situation by 19, uh, 2030, 31. Mm. You know, Mr. Bhargav, uh, speaking about the future, and again, this is one of the, uh, the things that I know has often been asked, uh, why the decision not to get into the EV space? Why is Maruti holding back if the world is moving towards EV and so on and so forth? Uh, do you see things differently or do you feel vindicated today as you see a sort of uh, uh, scaling back of expectations or estimates or even plans as far as some of the global makers are concerned today? Uh, how are you looking at the, uh, at the EV story and your decision not to sort of you know, enter the party when everybody expected you to do so? She and yes, we have been, uh, as most people think, somewhat slow in getting into the EV area. Suzuki did try at one time to develop uh, the Wagon R into an electric car. This was many years ago. Mm. And they did it. They actually made an electric EV. I mean, electric uh, Wagon Wagoner. R. But the price was so high that there's no way of selling it. And they were trying to persuade me that why, don't, why doesn't Maruti subsidize this by three or four lakhs a car? I said, no way. I'm not going to subsidize a car to sell cars. What for? Mm -hmm. So that project was uh, given up. And after that, when this whole uh, thing about electric cars became such a big thing in India, many of us, including me, thought that the Indian customer in the Indian market in the Indian conditions were just not capable of accepting electric cars in a large way. Mm. Now, it was the way I thought, it was the way I understood a lot of issues, including our electric supply grid and the distribution system, how customers used cars, how they kept the cars and all that. And after all that, my judgment was that EVs are not going to be suitable for a large segment of the market. Mm. There is a segment which will uh, mm. happily use EVs, and I think uh, that will happen. But I don't think EVs in India can ever become a 100% choice of the customer, at least mm. not for a long, long time to come. Mm. And that is why we went into the other alternative hybrids. technologies. Hybrids, CNG, we are now pushing for uh, biogas, I think Maru, like Reliance is already getting into biogas. Yeah. We are also getting into biogas in a small way, nothing like Reliance. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we think that the Indian approach to getting to zero carbon footprint does not lie the EV uh, route alone. alone. It lies through a multiple mix of technologies more suited to Indian conditions EVs are not environmentally clean anyway, by the way. I, I, I hope all of you know that, that there's a lot of uh, carbon footprint from yeah. EVs yeah. because of the burning of coal to generate the electricity yeah. which drives the car. So it's a fallacy to think that electric cars in India today are clean. Uh, it may happen after 10, 15 years when yeah. we get more clean energy into it, but not at this present time. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bhargav, one of the other interesting aspects of the Maruti story, and I would imagine that that would be of uh, use and benefit to the audience here, as well as people who are watching, uh, is how you help develop the auto ancillary ecosystem. And it's being held up as an example for other sectors and other industries to replicate, especially as far as mobile manufacturing is concerned, IT hardware is concerned. You know, the hope is that what Maruti did for uh, the auto ancillary business, we will have the same being replicated across these sectors. What did it take to build out that ecosystem? And what is, what is the, the prescription on how to be able to do that at scale again? You know, when we started, we realized that over 70% of the value of the car would be bought out from vendors. So it was easy to see that uh, the quality as well as the cost of the cars we produced would depend on the quality and cost 
of, of what the vendors. the vendors produced. Secondly, if we let vendors and us to deal with each other at arm's length, huh. there was no way that we could ensure that the quality and cost of the vendors kept improving over time. And therefore, we departed from the normal prevailing practice of buyers dealing with suppliers and said that we are interdependent with vendors. Mm. And therefore, we will treat them as our partners. And we will work with vendors to upgrade their technology, to upgrade their management systems, to upgrade their productivity systems, and all that goes with it. We will spend money on that. And we had to go to the board on two or three occasions to convince everybody, because this was not a yeah. done practice. Thing because in a sense, we were violating the government rules because we were spending public sector money to benefit a private company. Mm. Because vendors are private companies, yeah. and this would have become a standard uh, CBI case. But we had to convince the board that actually improving the facilities of the vendors, improving his performance, was in our interest. Mm. And therefore, it was in our interest to spend money there and bring them up. And that policy we have followed all these 40 odd years. We still have a vendor development department. We still work with vendors to keep improving how they perform. They are now all challenging zero defect. Mm. And in terms of also environment and health and safety, what standards we follow, we want them to follow also. And we help them do that. So that's how we've done it. And I don't also quite understand why Indian industry does not understand that their, its own performance will improve if they assisted their vendors in becoming more efficient. Right. And a lot of products which we get in India which are of variable quality or sometimes there's not mm. enough production or something happens is because of supply chain problems. Yeah. So surely it is in the interest of a company to strengthen the supply chain and spend money. Okay, others may benefit from it. So what? So but what? You, you will benefit from it also. Enlightened self-interest is is what it is to actually help your vendors do better. But you know, Mr. Bhargav, we've been having this uh, debate about Indian manufacturing for very long, uh, and yes, there have been many policy changes over the last several years that have happened. But we're still stuck in that band of 15 to 17 percent of manufacturing share to GDP. Uh, given everything that you are seeing around you today, given this whole geopolitical risk that could perhaps benefit India, uh, given the depth and breadth of what we are seeing as far as Indian manufacturing is concerned, do you believe that we're at that inflection point? I mean, are we, are we likely to get closer to that 20 and that eventual 25 percent target which we've been hoping for? You know, this is one of the uh, difficult points which we've been struggling with. So much has happened in the last 10 years to make it easier to manufacture in India. And uh, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in the financial systems and things, so much has changed. But it seems to have had no difference in the share of manufacturing in the GDP. You rightly said the geopolitical situation has opened up a huge opportunity for mm. us. Incidentally, the some industries have taken advantage of yeah. it. The auto component industry export jumped, and we, we are heading that because this industry is different. Yeah. And uh, the situation is that uh, while the government has done a large part of what it needed to do, I think still, something still remains to be done in terms of the attitudes and beliefs of the civil service and their skills in dealing with the development because the training of civil servants, and I, I speak as one who has gone through this, is not conducive to their understanding what economic development, manufacturing, competitiveness and things. But that apart, I think the real area of improvement where we need to go is where our manufacturing is concerned directly, mm. and which means our entrepreneurs, our uh, 
managers or proprietors, I think this, that area, you know, all this corporate governance and all of this is all fine, but it doesn't lead to improvement in manufacturing. Mm. And I think that's where I think we need to look at what we need to do. And that is what, one of the reasons I wrote this book you mentioned was yeah. to put out for everybody's knowledge what we did in Maruti. Now, it's up to anybody and everybody who is in, interested in this to read and understand. I'm, of course, there willing to answer any uh, doubts and questions. But it's for people themselves to decide now if they want to add something which will improve their manufacturing mm. uh, competitiveness. So I think that the, the industry has to do a lot now to make up from 14, 15% to get up to 25%. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone will go out there, get the book and actually read it. But, for, but uh, you know, give us a sneak peek, Mr. Bhargav. Leave, leave this audience with a sneak peek of the five things that you believe are the, are the commandments for Indian manufacturing to follow. See, I believe that uh, the most important thing is to create a better relationship with workers and motivate workers to participate. We don't understand that workers, by virtue of their experience on working on the shop floor, acquire a great deal of knowledge yeah. which no managers have. And if you can motivate them, they can provide a lot of that knowledge in terms of suggestions for improving the manufacturing process. In addition, of course, the workers are motivated. in management mm. because unless you generate larger and larger amounts of internal resources you will not have the money available to invest in research development and even expansion yeah. just expanding by borrowing money is not the best way of mm. doing it mm. frugality third is the leadership has to be fully committed to the idea that the growth of the company is bigger than I am. The company is bigger than I am. Yeah. It's, it's not that the company is me, but I am just part of the company. So I think the, that part is very, very important. And uh, after that, the importance, as I said, of internal resources. Maruti has grown, as Shireen said, completely through internal resources. Yeah from 100,000 to 2.2 million to 4 million, we will grow only through internal resources with no borrowings, no capital raising, no equity increase. And at the moment, we have 50,000 crores of cash despite having come up to 2.2 million. So this is the result of frugal management and uh, not uh, frittering away your resources on all kinds of things. It doesn't help. Who do you, who do you help? You, you yourself get a yeah. lot of uh, uh, kudos for doing, yeah. you're helping this organization, this organization, but you're not doing your main job of growing the company. Yeah. So the job of the manager is to grow the company, not to get popularity elsewhere. <laughs> so that, that is my belief. So these are some of the things which you have to worry about the customer, you have to get his confidence. So if you get the worker on your side, oh, sorry, supply chain, yeah. what we talked about. Yeah. I think a strong supply chain is an absolute must for success. Mm. One of the reasons why I believe foreign companies have always hesitated to come to India is the absence of a decent supply chain in mm. India. Mm. And uh, the uh, small scale industry and things which are part of the supply chain they are a very weak link. Yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to persuade government that for modern manufacturing, please have different rules for small-scale industry. 
this five crore, three crore kind of limit doesn't make sense uh, for the industry anymore if you're in modern manufacturing. Mm. That's well, you, you know, ladies and gentlemen, there are so many I important lessons that Mr. Bhargav has, uh, has shared with us. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the rich experience that he's had at Maruti Suzuki. Uh, frugality is, is key, and that leads to a company having 50,000 crore rupees as cash on books. I, I, I think that that really does deserve a big, big round of applause because I don't, I don't know how Thank many companies, companies can, uh, can speak of that, uh, ensuring that uh, employees are equal custodians of the growth of the company, ensuring that the management is actually mindful of, uh, of building partnerships, ensuring that you have a resilient supply chain. I mean, all of this uh, are, are crucial ingredients. And, and really, if you look at the Maruti story, you will know why these are crucial ingredients for success. But Mr. Barka, before I let you go, uh, what keeps you going? You know, IAS, Maruti, over four decades of, uh, of being a hands-on manager and now, of course, of, uh, of being chairman. What gets you going every morning? What makes you sort of uh, find purpose in all that you do today? Shireen, I find it very difficult to get going in the morning. I'm very lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't work uh, for very many hours in the day now. And uh, I like what... I, I, the advantage, I think, of uh, so many years of experience and learning is that it doesn't take too much time to understand and advise. I'm just an advisor. And so... It's easy to give advice now. <laughs> What's the one piece of advice that you would leave here, leave the, the young, young entrepreneurs who are watching this with? Young entrepreneurs, I can only say that the future uh, for you in India is as bright as it can be in any part of the world, is actually brighter. If I was young today, I would love to be an Indian because the prospects of the future are so much. But that prospect must be based on the understanding that if you grow your organization, if you grow your company, your wealth creation has to come through the company. You cannot grow your company if you place your own wealth creation above, above that the of company. the company. So please remember as an entrepreneur, be frugal, create teamwork, generate as much profit as you can, pay maximum tax out of that, keep the internal resources, don't pressure it away, and keep growing all the time. Don't think of the future, just keep growing. Just keep growing. And uh, Mr. Bhargav, what an absolute pleasure it has been to listen to you. Ladies and gentlemen, living legend here for Indian Manufacturing, R.C. Bhargav. Thank you so much, sir, for joining Thank us you. today. Thank, Thank you. you so much. a token of appreciation to you. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, what an absolute honor. Thank you so much, Shireen and Mr. Bargo for such an insightful and engaging session. Well, our next guest is here and she is truly an inspiration, an example of discipline, resilience and commitment. She has carried the hopes of the country on her game. Her lessons from the court can apply just as well to life because who knows better about the winning mindset than badminton champion P.V. Sindhu. Let's give her a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome her on stage. And may I also invite Gaurav Kalra, Vice President, Current Affairs, Viacom 18, to moderate this special conversation. Over to you, Swati, thank you very much. 
All right, it's full house. Uh, you're used to playing in front of full houses, so. Um, you know, I wanted to start by uh, just referencing there are three kinds of medals, and I think the audience will relate to me, that you can win at an Olympics. You can win a bronze medal, you can win a silver medal, and you can win a gold medal. Uh, from the little research that I think everybody here might have done, PV Sindhu has won a bronze medal, PV Sindhu has won a silver medal. So about time that with an Olympic Games coming in a couple of months, which is the medal that I think is missing from the cabinet? <laughs> yes, of course, gold. <laughs> Abhi, uh, uh, you know, I know, I know as journalists and some of us have this bad habit that we tend to put people under pressure, but this is good pressure. You enjoy this kind of thing. You have that mindset, don't you, that you like the big stage more than anything else. Yeah, well, a very good evening to everyone, firstly, and um, yeah, I mean, it is good pressure because I think a lot of people are rooting for me, supporting me, and showing me that love that, yes, you know, we want another medal, so definitely, it's always a good pressure, <laughs> and uh, yes, hoping for the best, and um, hoping for another medal this uh, Paris. Yeah, I think there'll be a billion people, because uh, I remember being in Rio, watching your final against Carolina Marin, you were very young back then. And I think the whole nation tuned into that match. That was the day when badminton really broke through. Do you still think back to that moment and think, you know, gosh, you know, if nothing else, that uh, thing I achieved in Rio and then onwards in Tokyo is uh, something that's going to stay with me for the rest of my life? Yeah, of course it is going to stay with me for the rest of my life because I would say, yeah, it has changed my life. And uh, playing my first Olympics uh, at Rio, I mean, I never thought that I would get a medal. So it was like, I, it was my first time I went as an underdog and uh, I thought I need to play well, I will give my best. But yeah, things were going right, everything was going fine. And uh, of course, finals, it's, it's anybody's game and only one can win. So I think whatever has happened... I've learned a lot, I've experienced a lot, and uh, I would say yes, uh, that feeling when I was standing on the podium is something different which I can never express. So definitely after that my life has changed a lot. Yeah, I think it's worth telling everyone a little story from that time that uh, when Sindhu uh, started to practice for the Olympics, uh, she had a habit of eating uh, a little unhealthy. She used to like chocolates, she used to like her pizzas, and I think Gopi sir at the time told you, okay, for a few months, not only are you not going to get that, but is it correct, and confirm this, that he actually kept your phone away. So for three months, you didn't, uh, uh, what were you? Uh, in uh, 2016, you were in your early 20s. Yeah, 20, and 21. for a young girl, not to have her phone for three months, how did you manage? Well, I don't know, at that point of time when uh, obviously Sir has uh, told me that, you know, you have to be more strict and, you know, you have to avoid eating junk food and uh, no phone. At that point of time, I was like, okay, yeah, I will be. Then I came back home and I was like, after, after the Olympics was over, I was like, how did I do this? Like, how? <laughs> <laughs> but I think on a serious note, if you want to achieve something and if you have that goal, that aim to do something and get that medal, I think uh, you would sacrifice anything and everything for that. So, yeah. You know what, uh, Sindhu, the theme today is we're going to be talking about that winning mindset and it's something that is really associated with you. You've had a tough time with injuries, etc., but you've come back and you've tasted uh, success immediately having that Badminton Asia Championships win. Can you talk, through, uh, talk, talk us through uh, the tournament coming back? Were there nerves? The, uh, the fact that you were back on court, you were competing again and uh, winning the tournament, how has, uh, uh, how has that helped your progress now with the, with the Olympics looming? Yeah, uh, I was injured last year in uh, October. Well, I was really in good shape and everything was going on well, but unfortunately I had a, a knee injury and then I had to take a break for almost like four months and it was really hard. I'm sure it, it is hard for any athlete to take a break and, you know, you don't know what is happening. You don't know if you can come back. You don't know if you can give your 100% again. So a lot of uh, things going on, uh, you know, inside your mind. So I think it was very important for me to just believe in myself and I just kept focusing on what I had to do because, uh, you know, I know it is sad, you know, uh, I know, you know, it is going to be hard, but I just believed in myself thinking that it's just one day at a time and I will do what I can do. And um, everything went on well. I had a good team. And of course, I, had a, uh, I have a new coach. I have Prakash, sir, and um, I'm training in Bangalore now. So 
I mean, everybody was on the same path, and uh, we all worked really, really hard. And I think uh, my first tournament was the Asian Championships that happened recently. And um, well, I was so excited. Uh, there was no pressure at all that I was coming back from an injury, but I was very, very excited that it is my first tournament after a long time. And uh, I was very happy and uh, excited. I just went for a tournament, and I think uh, the whole team. Played really well, and it is the first time that we uh, won at the team uh, Asian Team Championship. So it's a, such a wonderful feeling, and of course, it gives me a lot of confidence that you know I came back again yeah. after an injury, and uh, I, I wish that I carry the same confidence and uh, move forward. Yes, because that final match, uh, the the tie itself, it's a it's a sequence of I think five matches, and the final match was won by a 17 year old yeah. uh, who uh, managed to beat a player ranked well above her to win that. Was there a bit of a flashback at that moment? This is the kind of mindset I used to have because at 17, you won a world championship medal back in 2013. Yeah. So uh, here's someone who's replicating international success. Were you seeing shades of? 17-year-old PVs, and I'm sorry, it almost makes you sound like a veteran here. <laughs> but uh, here's someone who at 17 came through a pressure situation much like you. I think it's really good to have youngsters coming up firstly. And uh, I mean, uh, initially we had a lot of gap. But I think now if you see, there are a lot of youngsters who are doing really well. And recently at the Asian Championships, as you mentioned, Anmol, I think she's yeah, 17 years old. And we were just rooting for her. And we were like, no matter what, we want her to win. <laughs> So every time it used to come to the fifth match and then she used to give us that point. <laughs> so I think it's really good and of course I used to remember my days when I was 17 year old and when I was playing those international tournaments. So it's always nice uh, to see uh, youngsters coming up and especially at that um, I mean, it's, it's not a small tournament. It's a definitely a prestigious tournament. And, you know, she had no pressure. She's like, it's fine. I'm going to give, give my best. And she gave her best. And, yeah, we are right there as okay. winners. So uh, give us a couple of secrets. What were her conversations with you like? Was she a little intimidated? That's PV Sindhu. I'm in the same team as PV Sindhu. Or was she comfortable coming up every evening and talking to you, saying maybe, Didi, can you give me some tips, that kind of thing? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, I'm meeting her for the first time. So she, I, I've seen her play. I've seen her play at the Nationals, and uh, she's been playing well. So Tanvi and Anmol, there were two young girls. Uh, who were playing the national finals and um, I've seen it on TV so I, I thought that yes she is is doing well and she is coming up so apart from that I should say even Ashmita has, has done really well beating Okuhara um, the Japanese player so I think overall you know when they used to come to me we used to have uh, team meetings and uh, they used to keep asking me that okay you will get us one point and doubles will get us one point and if it comes to me then I'll also get one point for you so it was like those funny conversations always we used to have but um, not specific where she used to not ask me how should I play because we didn't know until the last minute whom are we uh, gonna play against right so it is like the day before in the night we get the draw and then we decide who to play and whom to just put in there so, so. so when the team went out for dinner did you pay <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I want to do a little quiz, and this is with you. Okay. Um, you've won five World Championship medals, okay? I know that's the easy part. Anyone can, can guess that. Do you know, and one of those is a gold medal, and the first one was won at the age of 17. Can you tell me, Sindhu, how many other players in the world have won five World Championship medals. Yeah, there's one Chinese girl who has yes. won five, so... So in the history of badminton, here's the fun fact, ladies and gentlemen, there have been only... There's been only two players who have won five medals at the World Championships. One of those is P.V. Sindhu. Well done. Full points uh, for that quiz. And this is a slightly easier one. There are only two Indians who've won two medals yeah. at the Olympics, individual. One, and uh, one of them is you. <laughs> yeah. I think you even know who the second one is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? He's, he's done really well, of course. So. Yes, so, the, yes, so this, time the, this time you'll be in a club of one because there'll be three, uh, only one Indian with three uh, medals at the Olympics. You know what that tells me? It tells me that you are able to deal with the big stage, the pressure of the big moment, the big tournaments. That's when you really come into your own. 
Can you talk about that mindset, Sindhu? Because that's really important to us. You become an elite sports person when you respond well to these moments. How do you manage to do that? I think I just, firstly, I don't have to do something different that, you know, I perform at the uh, big stage tournaments. And I think, secondly, it is just that I give my 100% in my practice sessions. And it is important to understand that it's not just couple of days or a couple of months of hard work. It takes years and years of hard work to, to come to a level. And I think coming to that level is fine, but you know, maintaining that is even more harder. So every time you go for a tournament, you go into a tournament, you know, everybody is going to look at you, see how you play, strat strategize accordingly. Yes. But it's important to be smarter. At the same time, you need to have game plans where, of course, if, if plan A doesn't work, you need to change to plan B. So that is how I uh, personally think about myself. And at the same time, when it comes to Olympics or World Championships, it's just that I go into a mindset, I, go, I just think and go into, a, go into the court with the mindset thinking that I need to give my best no matter what. So this is, this is what goes. So there are no butterflies in the stomach. There's no nervousness. There's I mean, no tension about a big match. There is going to be pressure. I'm not going yeah. to deny that. But at the same time, you know, if people are expecting a lot. There are a lot of expectations. There are a lot of responsibilities. But I think if I keep thinking about them, I think that would add extra pressure. Rather, I just go into the court thinking that I need to give my 100%. And if I win, then it's, it's good for everyone. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, this is a wonderful attitude because I can tell you, it, you, this nerves thing is not just a sports person thing. I mean, Shireen's sitting here, I ask her on budget day coverage every year, I'm sure she's really, really nervous. Uh, <laughs> but you don't, you don't seem to have uh, uh, that problem at all. And uh, this, is a, this is a fascinating bit about you because I remember meeting you first when you were 17 years old. You had just come back and uh, won that first, uh, first uh, medal at the World Championships. And even in all these years, every time I meet you, you're, you, you, intrinsically you haven't changed. You, you still smile, you're still greeting everyone with a, uh, happily, you seem to be enjoying the moment that you're in. Uh, you seem to really enjoy life much more than badminton. Is that really important to you, the fact that you have a full life and things outside of badminton that you relish? Yeah, I think it's it's very important and, you know, you keep playing badminton 24 into 7 and sometimes you need th that days off where you just come out from that badminton and just, there is life beyond badminton, right? So it's, it's you know, sometimes you want some break, sometimes you just want to, you know, take your mind off, sometimes it might be really good for you, sometimes, you know, it might be really bad. There are ups and downs in life. I mean, in... in for everyone, not only in sport, but also in business, in, ev in every aspect. So I think it's important to uh, understand. And I'm not saying it is bad to lose or it is bad to have those lows. But I think it is also important to understand and come back and bounce back stronger. I think that's very important. At the same time, I think you need to enjoy life, right? I mean, it is okay if you lose. In fact, you learn a lot more and you come back stronger and not make that mistake or not make that error again in, in life. So that's how you learn, yeah. So much wisdom. You're still, uh, and I think all of us have, uh, should, should learn and imbibe all of this in our lives because uh, uh, there is that side to you. And I, I do want you to dwell on this because it is a mindset thing. You really value the relationships in your life. It helps you uh, uh, become the athlete and the person that you are. You have a very strong core team. Your parents still remain extremely important in, uh, in your uh, ecosystem. Your, uh, your friends, I believe, are, are still the same. All of this has helped foster this mindset that there is more to my life than just going out and winning badminton tournaments. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, you need to enjoy life and you need to have those people who support you and encourage you. I think that's always required, that's always needed because when you're at your lows, I think those are the people who support you and tell you that no matter what, we are always there behind you and we will keep supporting you. I think that kind of support is always required. And yeah, my parents have, um, you know, they themselves are sports persons, so they know how, how it is and what it is, you know, sometimes they've experienced that. So, you know, when I lose or when I come back home upset or sad, they're like, it is okay, there's always a next time. You keep working hard and you will bounce back stronger. So this kind of support is, is what is required and I, I am really lucky in, in that way. And I think it's, it's always important to 
see life not only inside sports but also outside badminton because that's also going to be there with you like forever and you know you have to also know from where you've come you know having success winning everything whatever you could is one thing but you need to understand from where you started and from where you've come i think you need to know your values I, that's very important yeah and for anyone in the audience who's uh, not aware possibly uh, sindhu's dad is india's former volleyball captain if i'm not mistaken won the arjuna award so he was uh, a very very uh, extremely strong player himself your mom played volleyball uh, as well so you uh, didn't, you just you were a ready made athlete you were born to compete and succeed <laughs> You made athlete, but different sport. Yes, different sport. But I think you 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 use a lot of uh, you you do have inherent advantages that your parents have passed on. You're uh, tall and everything yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. But I I must ask you, Sindhu, because life changes, doesn't it? When you have success, the 17, 18 year old Sindhu won back to back world championships titles. But then there there comes a phase when, for instance, you will remember this well. There were multiple finals which you ended up losing, and there was all this talk. Oh, Sindhu's a choker. and she tends to reach finals and i'm sure that uh, she tends to reach finals but then she loses these these big finals so is she really you know yeah, yeah. I, and uh, was that something that you thought about you looked at you looked at you know uh, idiot journalists like myself who were writing things like this or talking about things like this on tv and say um, you know maybe there's something to it or you just completely ignore it go along your path because you know you're doing the right things well i of course i used to see social media i used to read the news and everything and uh, of course you know media write a lot of stuff uh, it's what they think and we can't deny that saying that you know they shouldn't say that because we can't say no to them because it's their perspective what they want to say and what they feel and that's how they say it that's how they write it on in the media but i think uh, yeah as you mentioned in 2017 2018 i had like almost seven finals and uh, a lot of people said you know what is happening or you know do you think about the previous matches when you come to the finals a silver sindhu so i just kept quiet i was like you know coming to the finals itself is a really really big thing and uh, it is not easy so i just kept Uh, quiet and of course i spoke to my dad my mom about all this and like i am playing well but why why is this happening and they just told me that you know it's it is fine you know you are coming to the finals is just that one step away so um we have a world tour finals which is like the end of the year and it is obviously one of the biggest tournaments so the top players are going to play so i won that tournament finally and a lot of press people came to me saying that you have finally won so i i just said one word i just told them that i given the answer with my racket that is it that that was my answer <laughs> okay okay get the point point taken <laughs> uh talked actually uh, it's a very important point that you bring up because i think there's an assumption made that every time you're doing well you'll win a lot but can you tell the audience and actually it's something that i would love to listen to you as well because the bad, women's badminton circuit is extremely competitive yeah. there are uh, there could be a, uh, the, the top 20 are all very closely yeah. evenly yeah. matched give us an insight into into what it takes to be successful on that circuit uh week in and week out because of the number of players and the number of different countries that throw up players yeah as you said yes absolutely right that uh, you know in the women circuit i think the top 20 players in the world are of same standard and the, it's very very competitive and it it is not going to be easy from round 1 so i feel that on that day who plays well and give their best is a winner is what i feel and i think to i mean every round thinking that you know it is the finals that's what i think because you know you can't expect easy matches even though they are uh, low rank players or high rank players because each of us know each other strategies we know their games and they know how i play i know how they play so it's very important to keep changing every single time and i think it's also important to stay mentally and physically fit because uh, you know sometimes you might give your 100% sometimes it might not be your day but it is also important that you shouldn't regret it you know looking back later and think that you know i should have played or i could have played that so it's always important to understand that you need to be your 100% whenever you go for a tournament or anything because going into a tournament 
being your 50% doesn't make sense. Rather, you lose your confidence. But at the same time, I think if you give your 100% and stay mentally and physically fit 100%, then that makes sense. And winning and losing is secondary. But the most important thing is, yes, I have given my 100% no matter what. And are you someone uh, who analyzes opponents a lot? I mean, there are some certain players who like doing that. They really look at data, they look at video, they look at things like this. Um, they look at uh, the mindset of an opposition player and uh, how, uh, you know, how that, uh, that player responds to pressure. Are you someone who does that or are you just someone who likes to focus on how you are playing? I think it's very important both ways where you have to look into data and uh, analyze matches and strategize matches. I think it's very important because uh, every player has their analysts, every player has their coaches who tells them to play in a certain way and keep changing. So it's always important to have two, three plans. And of course, now I have a, a new coach, Mr. Argus, since Jan. So we've been analyzing, we've been strategizing matches, whoever it is, whichever opponent it is. Because it's very, very important to work on others at the same time to work on yourself as well. Because it's not just work on others. When you're not strong, then that doesn't work. You should also work on yourself at the same time on others as well. Yes, you mentioned uh, the new coach and uh, of course that's there. But one of the sort of wonderful stories, and I see a lot of uh, sort of uh, people in the audience who are from my generation. So they know the name Prakash Padukone and what it means to all of us because there were so few world-class athletes. We were really, uh, you know, sort of, we had just very few to choose from. And now you're working with the great man and uh, he's part of your entourage. Yeah. Can you, I mean, obviously he's seen you since you were very young, but can you talk to us a little bit about wow, how that's gone and what he's bringing to you and uh, how, uh, how you hope that can translate into success? So, um, so it all started in, um, I think, um, September, August, September, and uh, which is generally talking and, uh, you know, I was in a rough patch at that point and I was not doing that great, so... Uh, we just spoke a couple of times and then um, all of a sudden he was like, okay, why don't you come down to Bangalore or, you know, see how it is, a different change or something. So I was like, yes, of course. He himself is a legend and of course, sir, um, wanting to see me play and tell me or explain me a couple of things, I think uh, um, it's my honor. And I was lucky enough to of course, go to Bangalore, and um, I think since then, since day one, uh, he's been there every day, coming in the morning and uh, looking at how I play, my practice sessions, and he keeps telling me if there are any changes, not major changes, but a couple of things where, of course, he, he's an experienced uh, person, so he knows what it is and how it is, so I think it is always uh, such a pleasure uh, working with him, and I think even now, um, he will be traveling with me for a couple of tournaments. So I think it's, it's uh, really great and so nice of him to actually come forward and um, uh, be in the team as a mentor. And of course, I will always look up to him because uh, he's such a, such a great personality. What's it like on the training court? Is he still quite sharp? Can he, can he take you on on the training court? Because I've seen you guys train. It's uh, absolutely ridiculous what you put your bodies through and what those sessions are like. So is uh, Mr. Parukon at the other end of the court every day trying to keep the rally going with PV Sindhu? Yeah, he, he definitely wants that. And uh, he always tells me that, you know, you have to give you 100%. And I, as I mentioned earlier, he always tells me that whenever you go for a tournament, you have to be at your... 100% and you have to be at your best. Otherwise, there's, there's no point going 50% or 60% and losing and coming back. You go for a tournament, you go, you go to win that tournament. I think that's how the mindset needs to be there. So I think uh, whatever he says, I mean, that definitely makes sense because um, I've seen him play. He, used to play. he plays with me a couple of times and uh, whenever I play, he keeps telling me in between the rallies. So he keeps it going every single day. You know, one of, uh, one of the things that uh, has happened in the period that you've had all this success is that women's sport in India has really taken a leap. And we've seen so much success. You and Saina, of course, led the way in badminton. But we've seen that across multiple sports. In fact, the WPL on right now, we've seen women's cricket uh, become uh, much, much more high profile than it, than it used to be. Um, how do you sense that change? Do you sense a shift in mindset? You interact with athletes from different sports as well, young athletes coming up. You 
you meet them at multidiscipline games, at training, I'm sure, things like that. Can you talk a little bit about what has changed? Why is it that, especially with women's sport in India, um, we are seeing so many, so many wonderful athletes come through and have success internationally? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's great to see women athletes coming forward and doing really well for our country, not only in badminton, but also in different sports. Also, the Women's Cricket League has started and uh, um, also wrestling, they've been doing well and boxing. I think each and every uh, female athlete is, is doing well. Initially, it was more of like, you know, women shouldn't do this or women can't do this. But I think now it has completely changed the scenario, the environment has completely changed where Nari Shakti, you know, <laughs> it's always uh, so good to hear and uh, see women athletes coming forward and getting a lot of success in our country. Yeah, uh, uh, can you uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit, Sindhu? Just from your perspective now, uh, you know, like I said, you're not 17 now, you're 27, you're an icon now. You're someone who's looked up to by young girls who are starting out in sport. Are you seeing from the, uh, if 17-year-old PV Sindhu, if I could ask you that, were to be playing today, would that... Uh, athlete have a completely different mindset? Have things changed to that extent? I think more than the mindset, I think it's the support. Yes. I would say I think now uh, there, there is a lot of support. Let's say sponsors are coming forward and, uh, you know, uh, schemes like Top Scheme or Kalo India, which encourage not only women, but in general, the kids who are coming up um, from the younger generation and uh, supporting them and encouraging them and I think funding them to go abroad and play tournaments. I think that has changed a lot and it is good exposure for the players, for the athletes, where they can prove themselves and uh, show the world that, yes, we can also do much better. I think that exposure is always good for every athlete to go to the next level because that gives the confidence and that gives the courage that, yes, we can also do it. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, Sindhu just quietly mentioned sponsors, etc. there, but the, uh, the uh, let, let's embarrass her a little bit. The financial rewards have been wonderful in the last few years that we've been reading. There are all these lists that come out, you know, the most, the best paid athletes, etc., etc. And PV Sindhu, you always see is right on top of those, of those lists. So um, that's wonderful. Credit to you. But first, do you have access to your bank account? Are you able to spend whatever that you want to spend? And two, what are the indulgences uh, that, uh, that you indulge in now that all this money is there in the bank? Huh? <laughs> well, uh, on a funny note, yes, uh, media rights, uh, whatever they want to. <laughs> 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 but, um, yeah, I think, uh, well, I, my... my um, my ga right now for me is just the game. Of course, my uh, parents, my mom looks after all the finance and everything. But yeah, I, I get to buy whatever I want to. But at the same time, I really love shopping. So whenever I go abroad at times, whenever I have time, I buy whatever it is. <laughs> so are there trips uh, which end by you saying, thoda zada ho gaya is baat. <laughs> No, I don't obviously over buy, <laughs> but uh, whatever is required <laughs> at that point, yeah. <laughs> Let's start winding up, but before I finish, I, I mean, you know, it's been wonderful to have you just talk and explain, talk about your journey. Uh, do you ever think back to the young girl who started playing uh, badminton? And st there is, and I encourage everyone to go and look at this. There is a photograph. Uh, I think your father and P.T. Usha worked together in the railways. And there's a photograph of a very young you. Of course, yeah. you must have seen yeah, this. Yeah. And it's in instant, you can tell that it's you, and you're sitting in her lap, and yeah. she's this legendary athlete at that time who's just come back from the Olympics, I think, and almost won a medal. Um, do you ever look back at that little girl who started playing badminton and think, um, you know, look what, what a journey this has been and how, how much has happened in my life, and did you ever imagine it would come to this point? Yeah, I mean, uh, I do look at it. I mean, uh, I also posted a picture, in fact, um, about... Uh, long time back, I mean last year of uh, me and P.T. Usha ma'am, uh, like 10 years back and now or early. So it was always, uh, of course, um, a wonderful journey, lots of uh, ups and downs and uh, I've come so far. I think, uh, I mean, when I look back, I feel, wow, like, you know, it has been quite a long journey with uh, some amazing uh, experiences and amazing movements. But I think I never thought or expected that I would come so far. It was always when I started playing 
um, at the age of eight and a half, it was more like uh, short-term goals where I have to, I want to win my nationals or, you know, in my age group. So I think 2012 was the breakthrough moment for me back then. And from then on, I've never looked back. I just kept going uh, forward. And I think, um, yeah, I'm very thankful to uh, everyone where, um, you know, they have supported me, encouraged me, starting from the coaches. I've had uh, different coaches. Uh, and I think I've learned a lot from them. And each coach has a different mindset, different style of play. So I think I've, I've yeah, I've had so many experiences. And uh, um, when I look back, I feel really, really proud and happy. And I feel that there's still more way to go. And I just feel this is the starting and there's a lot more ahead. Yeah, I mean, there's reason not just for you to feel proud, but the fact that, uh, you know, uh, when we uh, ever do an assessment of the greatest sportspersons to have ever turned out for India, your name will be right up there for just the sheer number of things you've achieved, and you're only still 27 years old, so there's, there's still so much to look forward to. Does that, do you ever think about that, Sindhu? The, the, this, these words are thrown about role model, icon, and, uh, you know, young girls must be coming up to you and be awestruck and, and want to wanna speak with you. Uh, do you how uh, how um, important do you think that aspect of being PV Sindhu is, the, the aspect of being able to inspire a uh, whole new generation? Well, it feels really nice when people look up to me and uh, take me as a role model and take me as an inspiration. I think when I was young, I used to feel that, you know, uh, when I used to look up to people, I used to feel, you know, one day I, I also need to be there. And now since I'm there, I really enjoy the limelight and I think uh, everyone should you know because uh, when you want to achieve and when you want to aim something and when you're right there you know after few years of uh, experiences wins losses ups and downs I think it's it always feels that yes it is worth it and um, of course when people look up to me I feel very very proud and happy and um, just want to tell them that it's very important to um, know where you've come from and how much of a success you get. It's always important to stay grounded. I think that's what my parents has taught me, have taught me. And this is what I just want to give, the, give a message to the younger generation because I'm sure there are a lot of youngsters who are working really, really hard. But um, just want to say that, you know, winning and losing is part and parcel of life. But the most important thing is just have that belief and hope and just keep going because... Success is not overnight. It takes years and years of hard work. And I think you need to have that patience and that hope that you can do it. And I'm sure everybody can do it. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Those were, those were and I, I must say that the 17-year-old I, uh, I met all these years ago was, was not quite as... So, you know, you have become a lot wiser. But can you, can you please tell me as we, as we wrap up and give us some insight into what is life outside... I know you like shopping and all that is fine. But what, is, what are the things that keep PV Sindhu... Like you were injured, right? So you can play, you can practice, you can go to the gym, I'm assuming, things. So what is it that kept PV Sindhu busy in, in, those, in those times? and what are the things that you like doing outside of the badminton court? Well, um, outside badminton, um, outside tournaments, you must ask me, because there are a lot of tournaments back to back. <laughs> yes. So when I'm back home, I spend time with my family. I have a pet uh, dog, and I spend time with him. And of course, um, I have a nephew who's five years old. So it's like a stress buster for me. I spent Is he playing time badminton? With him. Uh, he was playing badminton, but now he shifted to Australia. So oh, okay. now he's not. But yeah, every time he sees my match, he would want to play. But yeah, this is like my off time. But more than that, I give time for myself. Let's say for self-care, recovery. Because as you know, injuries are part of life in every athlete's life. It's important to take care of yourself and recover and rest well where I say not traveling and shopping, but actually rest well at <laughs> home. <laughs> okay, so you're not getting too many secrets. We are going to finish now. But, you know, I remember being on a stage like this with you, I think, three or four years ago before COVID. And Abhinav was, Bindra was there as well. And we asked the question, Abhinav was very curious as well. Now, there was a movie being done on PV Sindhu's life, and you were very uh, guarded about that question. You said, I asked you, who do you think, who is going to be playing Sindhu? You said you knew... 
but you were not going to tell. <laughs> Have I missed a headline somewhere that because for three years we don't seem to know? Can you actually do give us a little bit of breaking news today and tell us who is going to be playing PV Sindhu on the big screen? Well, on a serious note, actually, there have not been any talks happening. It's oh. not that I'm being blunt or anything. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I feel there's still time. And, um, I mean, I would want someone who obviously knows badminton. And, of course, my preference, my preference would be Deepika because she knows sport and she has played sport. And I've seen her playing. Mm. Um, and we've played together once. So, I mean, I personally feel. But, um, yeah, I, I, but I feel... More than that, uh, for me, there's still a more way to go on and let's see after that. Yeah, I think it would be a really good storyline that the movie ha talks about gold medal in Paris for PV Sindhu. That might be the right story. I'm putting the pressure back <laughs> on now. But that might be a really nice storyline. Good pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it is so lovely to, uh, to talk with you. I think the audience would have really enjoyed hearing from one of India's greatest champions. She might come across as an unassuming young lady with, uh, you know, who smiles a lot and seems to have very little to care about in the world. But she really is, ladies and gentlemen, just look at her record, is one of India's greatest athletes ever. P.V. Sindhu, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just request you to just stay for a photo op uh, as we go. Yeah, please, Well, what an inspiring conversation that was. Thank you so much, Karu, and thank you so much, PV Sindhu. And now, moving on, ladies and gentlemen, to a very interesting segment where we have some quick and slick presentations from innovators of Industry 4.0. In our startup showcase, we will be having 10-minute presentations by startups in the manufacturing space who are acing their game. And the first presentation is going to be showcased by Uday Narang, founder and chairman, Omega Seki Mobility. A huge round of applause for him, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, great to be here. Uh, first of all, uh, a big, big thank you to uh, Zetworks. Uh, you know, smart manufacturing uh, is extremely, extremely important um, in today's world. Um, and then, obviously, CNBC, um, you know, uh, TV for hosting such a great event. Um, India today is really, um, you know, a country uh, on the move. Uh, for me, uh, you know, it couldn't have been a better time uh, to be building companies uh, in this nation. Uh, we are seeing uh, not just being the, um, you know, obviously the largest population, but the youngest population uh, in the world, but also having one of the most um, aggressive, uh, you know, um, stock markets in the world, but having the youngest population. Um, we have today one of the most youngest population in the entire world. And what we do have is um, what PB talked about earlier. Uh, we've got Nari Shakti, uh, which is 48% of this uh, you know, country's population. And what we are seeing today is really uh, a country which has the potential um, really to make, um, I think without a shadow of a doubt, to be the third largest economy um, in the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about Omega Seki Mobility. Um, you know, we've been working on the green energy and sustainability uh, front line for over nine years. Um, you know, really, really, we've started putting vehicles um, since 2018. Uh, we've put about 11,000 vehicles, three-wheelers, um, into the country in cargo, in passenger. Um, we're working on electric trucks. Uh, so a whole lot of 
uh, you know, development is going on in this country in terms of green energy sustainability. Um, if, you, if you really, you know, want to talk about, you know, we, we present a generation, you know, if you look at what the Honorable Prime Minister Modi is talking about, um, this, is a, this is not just about climate change, it is about climate justice. Um, you know, 31 of the most polluted cities in the world is in our country, and we owe it to our future generation to make it greener and cleaner. For me, there isn't a better, um, you know, business to be in than in green energy sustainability. Every one of us, every one of us is going to get touched um, with this, um, you know, with this business, with this change, and we all have to do our part. There's significant impact from India's commercial vehicles. Uh, commercial vehicles are the most pollution. If you look at where pollution comes from, it is from the commercial sector. Forty percent of, uh, you know, the PMI and the PM10 is coming, uh, and the NOx emissions are coming from the commercial sector. Uh, obviously, pollution has severe health impacts, and particularly in urban areas. And I think, you know, diesel engines, specifically the older ones, are very, very notorious um, for their emissions. Um, I think it is time where all of us owe it to our entire future generation, to our kids and our kids' kids, to make a change. Um, if you look at the market, you know, 300 million vehicles uh, to 400 vehicle vehicles by 2030. Uh, this is something that is extremely important to know. 80% of the two-wheelers and three-wheelers of Indian automobile market, electric four-wheelers account for about 30%. EV sales, you know, are touching about 10 lakhs uh, units by 2020, 2022, a growth of over 300 plus percent. High-speed uh, EVs in two-wheelers have gone a 425 percent growth. In the two-wheeler market and the three-wheeler market continues to grow at a very, very hectic pace. If we look at it, India is accelerating towards electric mobility, and I think the revolution is gearing up for a greener future. The government has launched FAME 2, um, and with an outlay of over 10,000 crores and to incentivize EV uh, adoption. Um, you know, you're seeing a whole lot of development. You know, I think in this country, I've never ever seen a, whether it's at the central level or at the state level, the amount of support, the amount of, you know, uh, you know overall movement by the central and the state government to make a greener and a cleaner India. Um, you know, if you talk about manufacturing domestic production of EV and making India, whether it's the powertrain or battery over the last nine years, I have never seen so much happen as it is happening today. Um, and I think, you know, I saw an interview on, Z, on, on one of these, it was yesterday, where a question was asked, um, you know, is, you know, with, with Ford and GM being uh, reduction in um, EV, I think in India, we have not just EVs, but hydrogen and all new technologies that should continually grow. I think the market here continually shows the number of green plates that you see, not only in the big cities now, but in tier two and three and four cities. If we look at it in terms of Omega Seki, we're positioned, you know, in, in the last four years for the government's Green India dream to come true. We have been continuously, uh, you know, coming up in the commercial vehicle ranks in the top three and four. So it's really great to see where even a startup like ours, where we are continually uh, putting more and more vehicles, not just in tier one and two cities, but tier three and four. Um, we've also obviously, Fame 2 has been out there and there's a lot of speculation, but I think every one of us has to build a business without a subsidy. I think anybody building businesses, for at least at OSM, we are now, uh, you know, in year four of actual manufacturing. I think we should be EBITDA positive, and next year I think we'll be PAT positive. I would request everyone not to just depend on the government to do. I think it's, it's time where we all build our businesses without subsidy. It's great to have subsidy, but I think we've got to build our business without that. Um, you know, we've worked on electric trucks, not just here, but globally, from one ton to three and a half ton. We've got up to 20 ton trucks that we've built. And obviously, this is something also that is in the works. Um, I think truck development and going green is extremely important, not just for, uh, you know, the tier one cities, but all across India, from intercity inter and intercity. Um, you know, uh, my, my, my view is Hargar Electric. The revolution at Omega City Mobility, we just don't want to follow trends. We said we have been setting up trends on trucks, 
on, on, on hydrogen. We just launched our hydrogen vehicle in France two weeks ago in, in Le Mans. I, I, I ran a three-wheeler, 750 kilometers nonstop on a, on a tank, and we'll do that on the trucks. Um, again, uh, you know, it's a, we've, we've built four factories. We've built 200 dealerships. We've got fixed, fast-charging uh, swap. Uh, you know, we've got 15-minute fast charging. We continually, we're like Zara, new vehicles, new products, new technology, and continuous development. And, and we have got, you know, our own powertrain backward integration. We are working on battery manufacturing. So to build the ecosystem, OSM has worked all through the country. Obviously, we built the fastest charging electric three-wheeler. We are coming up with something now. I know it's popular today where we're talking about um, is, is bar char so par. We, we're coming up with something new which says har bar char so par, meaning our vehicles are going to be able to do 400 kilometers in a single day. So making commercial vehicles more and more popular. Um, again, we've got backward integration in battery, powertrain, as well as, uh, you know, in all other parts of, our, you know, we've got after say service, we're working with charging infrastructure. And, and again, not just in this part of the country in, 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 in the metro cities, but also I'm working very aggressively in tier two, three, and four cities because that is what's gonna need. We need to lift that 1.4 billion people, which don't only just live in the cities. Um, we have a Trek-driven last month um, you know, fleet operation. We've put one of the largest fleets uh, in EV uh, in this country, and more and more will be done on trucks. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've really, really put a huge amount of work in this space. We've reduced carbon emissions. We've reduced, uh, we've put up, uh, you know, our finance partners with, with all the banks, national banks like PNB, State Bank of India, Indus Bank, and continuously making uh, financing of EVs more and more popular so that we can convert all the ICE vehicles into, into EV. And I think the TCO model works. We've got, as I said, you know, alliance-based industry. We've got partners all across this country with battery players, with, with you, know, um, you know, mobility players, obviously, and continually grow and build the ecosystem. Um, we build, you know, service. The biggest complaints have been service. We build a service network. We put cocoa centers. Um, we've, again, built customer relationship management systems. Uh, we put, as I said, 200 dealers across this country, which will be about 350 by uh, March. Um, and again, uh, you know, we put all sorts of vehicles in terms of this. Um, and again, I think in terms of mobility in commercial vehicles, nobody has got as many vehicles on the ground in the last five years as we have put. Um, and again, the number of vehicles actually on the ground. Uh, we have been a company that is continuously moving in innovation, in working in service and working across all across this country in terms of legacy to build a legacy in the uh, automotive sector. Uh, you know, we've again built products all through these years and continue to build new products. Um, last and not but the least, I want to say, you know, we're building robust quality. We're putting service in the, in the forefront. Um, and again, in tier three, four cities, you'll see me out there building ecosystems. We have never had an opportunity in this country to build, um, you know, electric and green energy business. I urge all of you to be part of this journey. And I wish that we'll see you all in some form or the other to be part of this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ivan, for that impactful presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's now invite on stage Paradi Mantri, AVP, Consumer Insights and Product Innovation, Sooth Healthcare. But before that, can we please play an AV? India, the land blessed with more than 60 crore women, is also the land which struggles with feminine hygiene. Where millions of girls and women never reach their true potential, held back by poor menstrual awareness and hygiene. We wanted to bring a change, and we did. With one powerful idea, one small product, a monumental impact that benefited the menstrual health and hygiene of over 6 million women every month and continues to do so. Soothe Healthcare, raising the bar yet again. 
adding momentum to our growth are feminine hygiene brand Pari, our US FDA registered state of the art manufacturing facility sizes in at 1.5 lakh square feet with the capacity to produce 1 billion pieces per annum along with a large warehouse. R&D focused labs help us constantly innovate and grow. Twenty-five percent of the menstruating women only use menstrual hygiene products. Twenty-three percent of the girls drop out when they get periods. Very disturbing statistics, right? And these very numbers were the reason for our vision and our business. A business where we could give back impactfully to the society where we live in. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and fellow entrepreneurs. I am Paridhi, Paridhi Mantri. Uh, I look after product and innovations at Sooth Healthcare. It's a great honor to be here as we celebrate the success stories of innovation and entrepreneurship. We all know that India's manufacturing story has taken a significant growth thanks to the initiatives like Make in India. This progress highlights our nation's emergence as a global player and has empowered homegrown brands like us to thrive upon. As we celebrate the decade of manufacturing excellence, it's clear that these efforts have led to highlighting India's potential for innovation and success. And I would like to take this opportunity to talk about the journey of our flagship brand, Pari. Pari Sanitary Pads caters to the personal hygiene needs of many avatars of progressive Indian women. The menstrual hygiene sector in India is a very crucial sector as it takes care of the menstrual hygiene needs and thereby the mental health of the women. Earlier when we started this journey, trust me, it had, uh, it had its share of challenges. You know, how do you really bring about a behavior change? A behavior change to make a girl switch from a kapda to a sanitary pad. And that too in a category which is a taboo category where nobody wants to talk about it. Furthermore, the penetration level was only 12% when we started, when we put foot into this sector. Right now also it's only 25% and a long way to go. As I said earlier, 23% of the girls drop out from their school when they get their first period because the parents don't know how to, how to take care of her and her cycle needs. So, you know, these were the numbers that made a couple of high-flying professionals from various sectors and high-paying jobs to quit their job and come together in this vision of creating something which is very disruptive. So, with this disruptive product and price, we created, we joined hands together to create a brand called Pari, a name coined with equal love that parents have for their daughters. Just five, six years ago, we just had this vision and a product which was listed only in two stores. Cut to that today, we are a fully automated and high capacity manufacturing unit in Noida, Uttar Pradesh. We chose this state because this is the heart of India and the most popular state, but still had the lowest penetration in menstrual hygiene products. We manufacture premium quality sanitary pads using cutting edge technology having a speed of manufacturing 1,000 pads in just a minute. Our facility in India is the only facility to have US FDA approval, BIS marks, various ISO certifications. We are available across 3 lakh general trade stores, hypermarts, supermarts, various e-commerce platforms from where you and I, we do our shopping. Janvi Kapoor, a very popular name, joined us in our endeavor to create awareness about this particular sector and therefore helped us make Pari a homegrown brand. And it's not just about manufacturing facility because the true innovation, the true success story lies in creating empowerment and employment. We employ over 1,000 1, employees. 80% of our staff is women. So truly we are a brand which is by the women, of the women, and for the women. We heard how PV Sidhu just spoke about Nari Shakti. It takes immense pride for me to say that, you know, Pari is really a brand that believes in Nari Shakti, not just at the manufacturing, not just at the consumer centricity, but during every stage of our value chain. 
And while we have had a very interesting past, we are also very focused and committed to take this journey forward. And interestingly, we are in a sector which is already seeing double-digit growths. Just to share some numbers, it's a market which is going on from 30,000 crore to 2 lakh crore in just another three years. So, you know, it's, it's good to be part of this vision. And this vision only got strengthened when it reached Red Fort on 15th August, when our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Modi ji spoke about menstrual hygiene and importance of having menstrual hygiene products. And therefore, it's no longer a leap of faith. This is a here and now opportunity. And we have the first mover advantage of being an Indian brand because we understand the various needs and wants of Indian consumer. And which only gets validated because Pari has, in a short span of time, become the prof preferred choice of more than 6 million women. In the end, I would just like to share our inspiration from Mr. Tata's philosophy of good for company, good for community. See, our pads, it, it keeps a girl in school. If she's in school, she gets a job. If she gets a job, then her, she herself and her family is better off. And we gain by having a better productivity and GDP. So we all are better off. And therefore, at Pari, we say that investing in a girl is, has got the highest return on investment on society. And I would like all of you to join our endeavor by spreading this message of menstrual hygiene and ensuring that every woman around us uses a menstrual hygiene product. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those were some very powerful presentations. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, it's time to felicitate the entrepreneurs and business leaders who are at the helm of smart manufacturing in India. And let's recognize these manufacturers who are pioneering solutions for growth and building up the nation with their initiatives and their groundbreaking ideas. The first category is smart manufacturing in technology. And may I please request Team Honeywell to please come up on stage to receive the honor. Gentlemen, uh, we will begin with the event, uh, the award ceremony shortly. We are waiting for Mr. Bhargav to join us on stage. Thank you so much for being patient. We will begin with the felicitation ceremony shortly as we will be joined by Mr. R.C. Bhargav and Shireen Bhan on stage.
ladies and, ladies and gentlemen with a huge round of applause let's please welcome on stage mr rc bargav and shreen khan please keep the applause going the first category is smart manufacturing in technology may i please request team honeywell to come up on stage to receive the honor Our next category for the evening is the smart manufacturing in aerospace and defense and here we are recognizing the achievements of two organizations for their outstanding work on behalf of Hindustan Aeronautics Limited may i please invite mr sunil bhati gm and resident manager hal to join us on stage and the next organization that we are felicitating in this category is bharat electronics i'd like to request mr manoj kumar executive director national marketing bel to please join us on stage Next up we would like to put the spotlight on stellar work that has been done in smart manufacturing by an automotive company may i please request mr jay shankar krupal senior vice president manufacturing cet to come up on stage and now moving ahead to the next category of smart manufacturing by a consumer durables company and with a hearty round of applause please join me in welcoming from Crompton Greaves Mr Praveen Saraf Vice President Manufacturing and Quality Crompton Greaves And finally it's time to recognize the exceptional work in smart manufacturing in heavy engineering I'd like to invite on stage Mr Anil V Parab whole time director and senior executive VP Larson and Tupro
next felicitation, I would like to invite Shireen to please uh, say a few words. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, as, as I started by saying, it is such an absolute honor to have Mr. R.C. Bhargav here with us. We couldn't have asked for a better representative of the Indian manufacturing story than Mr. Bhargav to be with us here. He has seen uh, the evolution, not just of India and its manufacturing sector, but he has seen the growth and the change across so many different sectors and so many different industries. His uh, contribution to Indian manufacturing is undeniable. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me uh, in uh, applauding the contribution of Mr. R.C. Bhargav uh, for his lifetime contribution to Indian manufacturing. If we could all rise and thank Mr. Bhargav for his contribution to the cause of Indian manufacturing. Thank you so much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd request you all to please take your seats as we now move on to a conversation that delves into the space of crafting legacy brands in the country and their vision for the future. And for this session, we can we please have back on stage Mridu Bhandari, editor, Special Projects Network 18. She will be in conversation with Sukleen Aneja, CEO, Good Brands Company, Good Glam Group. A round of applause for both the ladies, please. Hello once again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this final session that we are calling Vision to Legacy, Crafting Iconic Brands from India. As Indian manufacturing envisions global domination, homegrown brands and new age products available at the click of a button will play a pivotal role in driving economic growth within the nation and also putting India on the world map. How then can D2C startups, particularly in areas like FMCG or beauty or personal care, chart out a roadmap to become truly iconic global names? And how will the larger D2C ecosystem shape up? Those are some of the questions we are asking Sukleen Aneja, who's the CEO of Good Brands Company, a part of the Good Glam Group. Um, for those who are not aware, Good Brands Company is purportedly South Asia's largest beauty and personal care conglomerate valued at well over $1.2 billion, backed by the likes of Amazon, Warburg, Pincus, and others. So, Clean, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. First up, you've spent over two decades in multinational companies, the likes of HUL, L'Oreal. Give us a sense of what being a truly iconic global brand really means to you, um, given that you've had so much international exposure as well. What does that truly mean to you? And in the Indian context, what would you say, uh, you know, how would you define the parameters of a truly global brand? I think to build any iconic brand, irrespective of whether that brand is iconic in a geography or across geographies, I think there are a few factors which define iconic brands. Number one is that that brand has to demonstrate consistency over a period of time across geographies so that you know every time you buy this product, whether you buy it in India, Within India, outside of India, you still get that gold standard product quality. That's number one. I think the number two thing which is extremely important is in the way the brand positions itself and the way it presents itself to the consumers. That also needs to be something that consumers expect a lot of consistency in. 
where you don't see a McDonald's looking different in US as you do in India, although the localization of a menu palette may happen, but the brand promise, fundamental brand promise does not change. So I think that's the second very critical aspect of it. And I think the third aspect of creating an iconic brand is a brand that can outlive the legacy of the founder, right? So today, I think many of us who are in startup businesses, the brands are becoming famous for the founders. And sometimes founders are more famous than the brands that they are building. But the iconic brands usually are brands that outlive their founders by a long mile. So today, if you think of a Dove, you think of an iconic brand like L'Oreal Paris, you will not even know who was the person who started those brands because the brands are so much more iconic. When you actually go to sell any of these businesses, these brands are valued, their goodwill is valued, and that value comes from the consumer trust you've earned over a period of time. And I think that for me is the third marker of an iconic brand. Can you outlive the legacy of the person who started it and continue to build the business with the same consistency, excellence, which the business stood for when it began in the first place? Yeah, so, so that's well said. Now, the Good Brands Company, of course, has many brands in its portfolio. Uh, you follow the aggregation model. You've picked up a number of brands. Give us a sense of how you decide which brands you want to pick up and then what goes into actually scaling them up, building them up, and hopefully making them iconic brands in the future. I think as a company, Good Glam is very clear that it wants to be focused in the beauty and personal care space. So you will not see us go pick up businesses which are not in our core domain. So first filter is what's the segment that you've taken that you will own. When you pick up businesses, it's very important that those businesses have unique target audiences and you're not buying businesses that are too close so that they will not add to any incrementality post, buy, post the entire acquisition. And third very important thing is you should know even when you, and it's a journey, it's not like we figured out all the answers, but it's important to realize that all businesses have grown because there, there was something fundamentally unique in them. We're a direct to commerce company, so the kind of stack that we are building is a D2C stack that can be used like a SaaS product across brands. But what we are not trying to harmonize is the culture, we've retained the critical people, the essence of the brand. So if Sirona today was a brand that was born out of a mission of ending period poverty, we are trying to ensure that we never lose the first principles of why that brand started. Or if there is a mom's co, which was actually started by a mom entrepreneur, to create products which are toxin-free, made safe, free of allergens, we stick to the tenets of the brand instead of trying to massify everything to the lowest common denominator, which I think will lead to the death of every business that you acquire if you try and do that. Right, but then what is the common thread tying all of these brands together under the Good Glam name? Because um, as Good Glam, you would also have certain brand ethos or values or culture that you want all the brands in your portfolio to imbibe. So how do you do that balancing between the intrinsic value that the brand came on board with and then to align with the larger vision that you have as a group? So I think one of the things which we did and I think has been an important learning, it may seem a bit painful in the initial phase, but I think with every business that we acquired, we retained the founders for the first 12 to 18 months, in some cases even 24 months. So that in the transition, you never lose the essence of the business. That was number one. I think the second important thing that you've asked is with respect to what's that common thread that binds us, I think for us is our mission of creating a direct-to-commerce company. So if you want to build a direct-to-commerce company that has a big leverage through the media publishing content business that we have, we are also India's largest influencer creator agency that we also manage within with clients which are very, very renowned clients whose businesses we manage. So then how do you really leverage your core strength and help massify the businesses you've acquired. Yet, without trying to change too much, so that you, I mean, that's one thing I always keep belaboring on because, you know, the whole point of an acquisition or to integrate a business is to find common synergies without losing what made that business special. And I think it's a fine balance, but it's important to remember that, that there's a very reason why that business was born. And I think that reason must never be forgotten. Right, and we are here at the Smart Manufacturing Summit for all the manufacturing brands that you pick up, uh, whether it's Sirona or St. Botanica or whichever else, uh, how smart are their factories at this point in time? Any thoughts on what the future or the factories of the future should look like for your brands? And uh, do you have a say in sort of changing that up, building new culture, mm -hmm. and uh, 
what's shifting in the digital era for these brands? No, I think it's a great question. Yeah. I think for a lot of the new and emerging businesses that are coming up, fact of the matter is that many of us are dependent on co-packers. And the choice of co-packer in their manufacturing unit comes from the quality standards, right? Whether a business is born in digital or in is a traditional business. I think what is important to remember is any business that is scaling today fundamentally is scaling on the back of good products. Because if your business doesn't have repeats, there is going to be no scale. Repeats are a direct correlation of your product quality. If people don't like your products, they aren't ever going to come back and buy them, even if you give them for free, right? So in that regard, I think one of the things which I think is a opportunity for the whole industry, and I say this on behalf of all of us, is to establish very clear quality standards. You know, whether we're exporting products from India, we're making them compliant by US FDA standards, but do we follow the same standards when it comes to manufacturing in India? I think how can we be above board? Because consumer is today willing to pay that extra for quality that is impeccable. You know, but if you have products that consumers eventually complain on, it reflects in your reviews and ratings. You will see on Amazon, you will see on Flipkart, consumers are extremely vocal about poor quality products. Yes. So Absolutely. And um, talking about consumer preferences, they change quite rapidly. In the digital world, consumers are also very, very well exposed with increasing disposable incomes. They are well-traveled consumers. They've seen the world. Uh, they want the best possible products in terms of quality, like yeah. you said. Also, maybe they're a lot more conscious today. Today's young consumer knows about eco-friendly products, about sustainable products, about cruelty-free products, about uh, you know socially conscious entrepreneurs who are making a social impact. Um, are any of those things parameters when you're acquiring companies? No, absolutely. I think if you see the spurt of online brands, and I think specifically if I speak for the Good Glam group, we've been extremely mindful of products being cruelty-free, clean. If I look at an acquisition like Momsco, it's one of the only brands which has Australian-made safe certification. Products are toxin-free. They don't have any allergenics, so you have the hypoallergenic claim on every single product. I think one aspect of it is the manufacturing process. So if I look at another brand within our portfolio companies, which is Organic Harvest, where the organic certification actually comes for ingredients as well as during manufacturing, the products have been created and have been given eco-certification from a European body called EcoCert. Now, these accreditations are critical, you know, because young consumers today are, like I said, they are wanting to know why should I trust you, why should I believe you. These accreditations only help that consumer trust move up when you don't have a 100-year legacy behind you. Right. So, you know, while, of course, there's huge emphasis on quality, on compliance, there is also huge pressure on startups to grow at speed, yeah. uh, scale up quickly. There is investor pressure to scale quickly, show results, give big exits. How much of a role does all of that play on the C-suite? Uh, you know, as a C-suite leader, what are the mental pressures that you go through and how do you ensure that Compliance doesn't take a hit because, uh, you know, there have been complaints in the fintech sector recently. We've seen big ticket fallouts happening because of a lack of compliance. Uh, so what are some of the best practices that manufacturers can, uh, you know, imbibe? I think with all the pressures that you mentioned, the one that seems to be looming hard on all of us is profitability. So you're expected to today grow while being profitable or at least inch closer to profitability. I think all these pressures finally lead to a compounding of problems. I think the only thing that I would perhaps say with experience of having spent two decades in large companies which have demonstrated results over, say, a century, yeah, there's no shortcut. There is, like, there is merit in patient capital. There's also merit in patient governance and patient management. You know, so at least as responsible employees of an organization, we have to resist the urge of doing things that we cannot put our name to. You know, and that's extremely critical. Because if it comes back, it comes back to haunt you for the rest of your life, your career, your business. It takes a minute for it to be finished. And I think the more important thing that we all need to be aware of is in today's world of social media, things can blow up extremely fast. So it isn't like, say, a decade ago where things would go unnoticed or the extent of damage could be managed. Today it can't be. So therefore, it becomes even more important that people be extremely, extremely responsible because Finally, you're putting your name to it. So, so during acquisitions, is that uh, uh, you know a, a key area you're looking at the founder mindset when it comes to compliance? Uh, what are the other founder mindset areas that you're looking at when you take a company on board? You know, of the acquisitions we've done and also not done, I think there are a few things I've been able to learn for myself. 
I think most important is founder's passion for the products that he was building, right? Was he passionate about product quality? How deeply concerned was he when the products were not up to mark is the first critical check to see. Second is the kind of customer relations he's built with his suppliers. Is it a relationship of a partnership or is it a relationship of vendor management? Because in a vendor management relationship, you clearly know that this founder is using the business as a trading mindset, right? And eventually traders make money, but they don't make that kind of value because if you have to do long-term value creation, it is about building sustainable partnerships. But like in all partnerships here, at some level you also operate on good faith. So you know, you do look at the products, the certifications, every single empirical data that's in front of you, along with founder's integrity and his passion. But beyond that, I think the best of investors are today operating on good faith, you know? Yeah, yeah, true. But um, now the Goodlam Group has four key pillars, four C's that it operates on, content, commerce, community, the creator economy. Give us a sense of how you leverage these pillars for the brands that you acquire and, uh, you know, for, especially for the manufacturing brands mm -hmm. uh, and at the intersection of the booming creator economy right now, publishing content, where are those big growth, or growth areas, especially for traditional manufacturers to come in and leverage all of these trends? I think the greatest opportunity right now is in the spurt of brands in this country. See, India loves, I mean, all of us as Indians, we love brands. It goes like from every single product category today has a brand name because we fundamentally are people who are seeking to buy brands. Now, in that context, the biggest opportunity for manufacturers is the spurt of new businesses, right? Because there are so many people today who are taking the entrepreneurial drive much more than I saw when I, when I was perhaps entering the job market two decades ago. So, right, that I think is the number one opportunity area. Second opportunity area is as businesses scale. One of the challenges that even manufacturers have is on working capital. So how are you actually able to extend some of those benefits to startups today which may need longer working capital cycles, like they may need a 90-day credit. Now in spaces like these, if you are well-funded, if you have credit lines, and you're able to pass on those benefits, it actually helps startups to scale, right? And I think the other businesses that we have are much more of consumer-facing businesses, whether it's influencers or media publishing houses, they are fantastic for spurting growth for our online brands. Two-third of our business today comes from online business. So there having advocacy being built through an influencer or reading content on a media house further accelerates our growth flywheel. But I think when, it looks, when I look at the manufacturing side of the industry, I really think it boils down to a, recognizing that this wave is real, there will be many more people who will enter new branded businesses and therefore manufacturing will always be critical. Second, it is the 10th year of Make in India. So clearly this government has done a phenomenal job in making manufacturing in India sexy again, which I think is fantastic. And third thing is if you look at the larger economic environment around us, today China has destabilized the world in a way, where dependence on Make in India, local sourcing, lower lead times, faster, turn around, all of these aspects are important for all businesses. I think where it becomes an important unlock is to recognize that there will be funding winters, startups will be cash strapped. How are we able to work, use financial instruments in a manner where we're able to extend that help even to the partner who's selling your brands? Because it is a partnership at the end of the day, right? So there will be cycles which are beyond your locus of control. And in those cycles, how do we actually take that partnership forward. And I think it's all credit to manufacturing, if I may say so, that during COVID, the way these partnerships actually shone through, you know, it really was a testament to how we continue to stay afloat when, because of those, that environment, many businesses were going bust, right? So I think it's the credit to those partnerships that businesses could survive those headwinds. Right. And, you know, we've been envisioning India at 2030. Um, when you think of the D2C ecosystem in India at 2030, what do you think it should look like? What are the big challenges over the next couple of years? And uh, how well poised are Indian D2C brands to really navigate those challenges and help build the ecosystem in a very, very robust manner? You know, personally, I think, uh, I definitely think the future for D2C is extremely bright. For no other reason, because if you look at the cost structures, eventually, you are today building a product that you're able to reach consumers far and wide. Today, if I look at our D2C business, we're able to touch 21,000 pin codes. 10 years ago, if you were today working on a new brand, 
it would take you 10 more years to actually create a distribution network that would allow you to reach consumers. D2C or even marketplaces today are at least enabling you to be able to centralize your warehousing and supply and yet service demand across the nation. So I think into that regard, it is solving a massive problem. Second thing that I do foresee is that you will see a massive spurt of aggregation within D2C as well. Because businesses today are recognizing the value of bringing consumer to an app or a website, but at least offering them a gamut of products that allow the consumer to continue coming back. So in that regard, I think business models will also disrupt themselves. And where consumers see value, quality product, they are willing to go that distance. You know, so I definitely think that future is bright. And also last thing that I may touch upon is also the birth of SMEs. You know, today the sheer number of people who have been able to start their businesses on Instagram, it is giving a massive spurt to SMEs, which we sometimes don't look at in the light of larger, more, vis more visibly well-known companies. But that's another big spurt in economy. Right. Okay, so I'm going to put you in a bit of a spot and ask you, ask you which are your favorite brands from India that you think have the potential to become global and iconic brands, uh, you know, brands that you would bet on, brands that you love? Yeah, within my portfolio itself, I genuinely believe uh, we have many brands within our portfolio. Whether I look at Serona, which is the largest menstrual cup manufacturing brand in this country, we sell over a million menstrual cups, and the, with more sustainable living, people will ditch bu buying pads and plastic and they will start using cups which are biodegradable, they, are, they last up to 10 years. So I think to that extent, this could be a massive opportunity for us. Even a brand like Momsco, if I look at, the, I mean, how many brands are even catering to moms by that logic? Or a MyGlam that can actually cater to brown skin population across the world. So I think in terms of potential within our portfolio itself, I really do dream and wish these businesses are able to fly. And I think if I look at the larger ecosystem as well, I mean, I really all kudos to brands like Mama Earth, the new businesses that have come up, Plum, even Sugar, they're all fundamentally good brands which consumers are looking at and valuing. So I think uh, this is within the BPC space, but across the industry, I think there are quite a few remarkable examples of the businesses that are being built. But do you reckon consolidation in this segment? Because uh, uh, quite a few homegrown brands there now, and uh, how does one really differentiate? Um, do, you, do you reckon there's going to be consolidation in the next couple of years? You know, consolidation doesn't solve any consumer problem, right? It isn't going to, because fundamentally consumers are choosing a brand because either they like their product quality or they like the relationship they've been able to build the, with the consumer. Probably the only reasons why consolidation comes about is an inability to raise further funds or a business that is not profitable over a period of time. That is when you actually see businesses come together to find synergies. But I think in the absence of it, even if we let these businesses grow over the next eight to 10 years, I think the market will see a lot of disruption. And there's enough share in the pie for everybody. I genuinely think so because we still have massively underpenetrated categories. Look, two third of this country is in rural. Yeah. If we look at our beauty penetration in, in this market itself, I mean, across categories, it's even lower than Vietnam. So we have massive headroom for growth. And the biggest advantage that we have is our developed tech ecosystem. The fact that we have access to mobiles, data, internet economy, I think those are giving massive spurts to consumption. Right. Well, so you're already South Asia's largest digital first beauty and personal care conglomerate. What is the next goalpost that you're setting for uh, the company and where do you want to see it in the next couple of years? I think we are the largest in direct to commerce. I think clearly, I would say there are two or three large areas that we would be very interested in. I think sky is the limit as far as global expansion is concerned. We'd be immensely proud if we were able to create a global company coming out of India. I think that would really be our big vision. And aside from that, I think consolidating our play in India and making sure that our brands are, like I said, they can outlive the legacy of the people who began the journey. I think that would itself be remarkable. Right. And um, for all the aspiring or the early stage startups that are present here or watching us on CNBC TV 18, what are your top three or four strategies for building well, building responsibly, building with speed, um, and of course, keeping quality and compliance in mind, uh, lots of things there, <laughs> but uh, top three strategies for building and scaling a business. You've done that with so many companies in the portfolio. Uh, give us your secret sauce. 
I think you've touched upon a few of them already. So I would say number one, and for me, in everything that I've done, I would underscore it, underline it, and say that in caps, there is no shortcut to building a business without a product that is fantastic. You know, so the holy grail is product quality, the product differentiation, bringing to consumers something that they haven't experienced before, right? Whether it's a superior technology, a superior manufacturing capability that allows either speed in delivery, but there has to be a real innovation behind the product that you're building. Creating more Me Too products and expecting a miracle doesn't happen. It actually doesn't happen, right? So more than anything else, I think everything else you will discover with experience, there will be various distribution strategies that will come along. But I think a superior product takes you a very long way. And I think the second thing which I would say is a very important part in today's era of digital commerce is the holistic experience of what you deliver. So I think it's not just the product, but it's the full consumer journey and at every touch point. If your journey breaks at any touch point, the consumer is unforgiving. They're not going to come back and buy your products because the market is fragmented. If I look at our own industry, we have brands that I can't even count. They're, it's massively fragmented. So consumers are unforgiving. You make a mistake, they don't come back. So it's important that we recognize the importance of not letting that consumer journey break, right? And last, not the least, I think patience. I think it's extremely important that, you know, we realize that great brands were never built overnight. So as much as we need patience in building businesses, we also need patient capital. And I think uh, both of those take you a long way. Right. Absolutely. Well, finally, it's election year, a new government around the corner, the full budget around the corner. Any wish list from the startup ecosystem, from the D2C ecosystem for policymakers? I think just letting the business grow and making it easier for businesses to flourish would probably be my only request. And I think the government has been very pro-business. You can see uh, many advancements which have actually helped. I think the more private-public partnership continues, I think not just in business, we can actually even tackle some of the societal issues as well, where public-private partnership actually takes a precedence. So working closely in partnership would take us all a long way. Any examples of that that you can share from uh, the Good Glam Group? I think not from Good Lamb Group, but if I talk about the business at large, and I'll even give you an example from the Good Lamb Group, but if I look at the Swaj Bharat mission and how businesses are partnered with the government back in the day to help with the Swaj Bharat mission was a very good example, right? Now, if I see within the company as well, there's a huge impetus towards skilling in India because we are seeing there's a massive shortfall with respect to skilled labor. So I think with regards to skilling, we recently ran a big activation in partnership with Invest India, Startup India, which was all about encouraging mom entrepreneurs to come forward and set up their businesses. And we gave grants to mom entrepreneurs because one of the biggest challenges in India is that today, if you look at female participation in workforce, that number is a double digit number, a much higher number in rural versus what it is in urban India. And the sheer number of women who drop out post motherhood is massive. So in that regard, we partnered with both these bodies to create mom entrepreneurs and fund them. So I think that it was just a baby step in the right direction, but I think I would love to see that mompreneur partnership to go for years ahead, because at least it's touching on the right cause. Wonderful. So, Clean, thank you so much for joining us here today and sharing those incredible insights into building D2C brands from India for the world. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Thank you very much. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you. Back on stage for a quick photo off, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what a power packed conversation that was, and with that. We bring the Z-Work Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024 to a close. An event where we heard from diverse voices in the manufacturing sector seeking to unleash India's full potential and transform the way we build things.